Audio Renaissance presents Master of Dragons by Margaret Weiss. Read for you by Suzanne Torin. Prologue. Lycera entered the enormous cavern that was the ancient Hall of Parliament for Dragonkind. The entrance was located in the tallest peak of a snow-capped mountain range. Gaping black against the white-shrouded crags, the opening had been carved hundreds of centuries ago by dragon magic. No need to hide it from humans, not this far up the mountainside. The entrance was large enough to accommodate a dragon in flight. Lycera was small for her kind, and she swooped into the entryway with ease, glad to leave behind the glare of the sun glittering on the snow for the restful darkness of the hall. The dragon spiraled downward, drifting on the whispering air currents, listening to the silence that was dark in her mind. The hall was empty. Parliament was not in session. She was not really supposed to be here, but she felt drawn to this place. Disturbed and troubled, she did not know what to do or where to turn for answers, and so she decided to come here. Perhaps if she were in the hall itself, she would be able to glean some of the wisdom of those who came before her, pick up a trace of their colors, learn from their experience. At least, that's what she'd told herself. Gliding downward on still wings toward the floor that was far, far below her, Lycera was bitterly disappointed. She saw only darkness. The cavern was empty. If there were ghosts, they slumbered in the eternal dragon dream that was death. Upset, Lycera was not paying attention to what she was doing, and the floor came up on her before she was ready for it. She landed with an ungraceful thud, nearly going over on her nose. Recovering, she was thankful that no one was here to have witnessed such a fledgling bumble. She was especially glad that one particular dragon was not present, the walker, Draconis. Her scales rippled all over in embarrassment at the thought. In truth, it was because she'd been thinking of him and everything he'd said at the last session of Parliament that she had botched her landing. But she couldn't decide if it was his words that bothered her or if it was the way his colors had so gently touched her. Settling on the floor, tucking her wings in at her flanks, and wrapping her long tail around her feet, Lycera gazed around the dark and empty cavern and sighed. She could at last admit to herself that she'd been hoping, rather unrealistically, that she would find Draconis here. She didn't know why she expected him to be in the empty hall. Perhaps because he wasn't anywhere else. Dragons communicate mentally, mind to mind, using images and vibrant colors to exchange ideas. A dragon may block another from entering his mind, just as a human can stop others from entering his house. But just as the house is still there, so is the mind of the dragon. Though the colors are unreadable and prohibit entry, they shimmer like foxfire in the night. And Draconis's colors were nowhere to be seen. Dragons dislike making hasty decisions. Lycera had been unsettled ever since the last meeting of Parliament, the meeting that had thrown the dragons into turmoil, the meeting in which Draconis had disclosed that the two children born to the human woman Melisande could communicate mind to mind, as could dragons. Not only that, but these humans could actually enter the minds of dragons. This was an awful, dreadful, catastrophic calamity. What's more, Draconis had told Parliament that one of their number was a traitor. One of them was feeding information to the rogue dragon Maristara, and her cohort growled. Because of this, Draconis had hidden away the two children, and he refused to tell anyone even Honora, the wise elder dragon, the minister of the parliament, where they were to be found. 
He'd also claimed that this same traitor had been responsible for the deaths of her father and Braun, Lysira's brother. That meeting had taken place sixteen years ago. A long time by human standards, a mere eye blink by dragon measuring. Lysira had spent those years dithering, wavering back and forth, trying to decide if she would talk to Draconis or not. For a couple of years, she thought she wouldn't. He was the walker, the dragon who took human shape to walk among humans and keep an eye on them. He had, therefore, lots of humans' images in his mind, images Lysira found disturbing and distasteful, and fascinating. It was the fascinating part that bothered her. She'd seen only a few of these images the last time he'd spoken to her, and she had since discovered that they kept cropping up in her dreams, breaking her tranquility. Try as she might, she couldn't banish them. She didn't want to see any more of them, and yet she did. Once she had made up her mind that she would talk to him, a few more years passed before she found the courage to do so. She would start to approach him, and then she would shy away and retreat back to her lair in a flutter of confusion. This made her angry, and for the next year or so, she turned her anger at Draconis and blamed him as the cause of all the trouble. She knew she was being irrational. He wasn't the cause. Maristara had started it all by seizing that human kingdom and then breeding humans with dragons to produce humans with dragon magic. Lysira didn't like to admit that part. At this point, she decided that she didn't need Draconis. She would find out who the traitor dragon was on her own. Lysira's investigations were half-hearted, however, and didn't get her anywhere. The other dragons she questioned were brusque and even rude. They obviously did not want to think about any of this. They were hoping it would all go away. They shut their minds to her and shooed her off. Which brought Lysira right back to Draconis. She would talk to him. She was determined to talk to him. Boldly, trembling, Lysira reached out her colors to him only to find that the colors of his mind were gone, as though they had been wiped away by a wet sponge. Lysira crouched in the empty hall of Parliament, and for the first time she began to be afraid, not only for Draconis, but for herself and all of dragonkind. Honora felt true regret that she had to kill Draconis, of all the walkers who had sacrificed their dragon form to take on the illusion of a human, Draconis had been the best. One of the hazards of being a walker, of living among humans, was that the dragon tended to either become too human, in which case he forgot the reason he'd been sent to walk among humans in the first place, or he remained too dragon in which case he moped and pouted and whined about having to put up with the inconveniences of being human. Draconis had been the first to separate the two halves of his being, maintaining a firm division between the dragon and the human. Even now, though it appeared that he was acting for the humans, siding with the humans, and protecting the humans, Honora knew better. Draconis was doing what he was doing because he firmly believed he was helping his own kind. Admirable. Mistaken, but admirable. She stood, masked by illusion, inside the building where she'd set her trap for Draconis. Watching him from the shadows, she pondered the idea of letting him live. She could try to explain to him that he was wrong, hoping he'd see reason, she discarded that thought with a regretful sigh. Draconis's asset had become his liability. He was working hard to keep humans and dragons at peace, as they had been since the first human had raised himself up off all fours. Draconis would never understand why that peace had to end, and Honora knew he could never be made to understand. He had to die.
Draconis had his back to her. She'd been spying on him from the moment he'd entered the abandoned building. He was here to set a trap for the dragon Grald, the master of Dragon Keep. Grald, disguised in his own stolen human body, was heading this direction. Grald and Honora were in contact, the colors of their minds blending, though not very harmoniously. Honora was thinking of her own lofty goals. Grald was thinking of vengeance. But what could you expect? Grald was a dragon of the baser sort. He did not come from one of the noble families of dragonkind, who had ruled the world for centuries. In human terms, Grald was a peasant. He'd been brought into this conspiracy by Maristara, who had chosen him because he was a peasant, rough and crude and not overly educated. The elder female dragon, Maristara, had formed a theory, a brilliant theory, that if dragons and humans bred, they would produce offspring that would look human but would be capable of using dragon magic. Honora remembered how shocked and appalled she'd been at first hearing Maristara's proposal brought to her in secret. She'd been adamantly opposed to it. Not only did it break all the laws of dragonkind, it could prove dangerous for dragons. Creating humans with magical powers? It was not to be considered. When Maristara had defied her and seized a human kingdom in order to begin her experiments, Honora had vowed that she would do everything in her power to stop her. Time passed. The dragons, with their usual ineptness and inability to make decisions, bungled any chance of halting Maristara. The experiments in breeding proceeded and went far better than even Maristara had hoped. Sadly, as time passed, Honora had come to see things Maristara's way. These humans with the dragon magic in their blood proved to be so powerful that they intimidated lesser humans. Thus, they made perfect rulers. And because these humans had dragon blood in their veins, they were easily manipulated by the dragons. Dragons ruled the half-dragon humans who ruled the humans. Perfect all around. Maristara needed a male dragon to start the breeding program with the human females of Seth. She didn't dare choose one of the males of the noble houses, for fear word would get out. She selected a male from a family of lesser dragons, a young male, aggressive and ambitious and cruel. His name was Grald. She taught Grald the secret of ripping the heart out of a living human body and taking over that body, making it his own, a task far less complicated and time-consuming than casting the supreme illusion spell that changed Draconis into a human. Unlike Maristara, who used the human bodies she took to disguise her true form, Grald usurped the human bodies, giving them his name and taking over their personalities. He was on his sixth human right now, and this was his favorite. He had found something better, however, and he was looking forward eagerly to taking over the next body, that of his own son. Before that could happen, Honora and Grald had to kill Draconis, who had done everything in his power to thwart them. I think you would understand, Honora said silently to Draconis, speaking to his back as he stood across from her in the doorway of the building, sharpening his walking staff into a spear. I think you might even take our side, but I can't be sure. You have formed attachments among the humans. You hid Melisande's children away from us. If Ven had not cried out to us for help, we might never have discovered them. Quit sniveling, Honora. He should have died long ago. Grald's colors intruded rudely into hers, and Honora, haughtily, didn't deign to reply. She saw no need to explain herself to underlings. Maristara let Grald take too many liberties, 
she should keep him in his place. Where are you? Honora asked, her colors chill. I am in sight of the house. My son summoned me, Growled added with smug triumph. He betrayed his brother, as I told you he would, to gain the female. Like father, like son, Growled chuckled. I don't trust him, Honora said. Ven is devious, devious as a dragon, in many ways. I should know. I spent weeks in his company. All the better for me when I take over his body. You'll acquire a brain, at least, Honora thought, but she kept that caustic comment concealed beneath the cold flow of her colors. Dissimulation was not difficult to practice on Grald, who never bothered to look beneath the surface of any conversation. Don't come any closer, Honora warned. I'm about to strike. Take care you don't hurt Ven, Grald said. I need his body whole and strong. The only one hurt will be Draconis, Honora said softly. She began to creep up on him as he stood, unsuspecting, staring out the door. He was in his human form, holding the spear he'd fashioned in his hand. Across the street, Honora could hear the voices of the human males raised in argument, probably squabbling over the human female. Ideal cover, for they were proving a distraction to Draconis, who looked in that direction and frowned. Strike now, Grald ordered suddenly. Strike him from behind before he knows what's hit him. Concentrating on Draconis, Honora had unwittingly left her mental processes open to Grald. She slammed shut the door to her thoughts and refused to answer him. He couldn't understand her strategy anyway. It is difficult to take a dragon by surprise. While a dragon is conscious, he can easily defend himself. Dragons must sleep, however, and when they sleep, they sleep deeply, for years at a time. There was the chance that another dragon, or some enterprising human, might slay the slumbering dragon. Thus, over the centuries, dragons had developed a means of self-protection. The moment Honora launched a weapon at Draconis, magical or otherwise, his dragon being would act to take defensive measures and fight back. Her plan was to reveal herself to him. Let him see that the human he'd known all these years as the Holy Sister was, in truth, the head of Parliament, a venerable dragon he had long respected and trusted. She calculated that the shock of seeing her, of knowing, at the last moment, that she was going to be his doom, would suck all the fight out of him, leave him breathless, winded, amazed, then, dead. She was quite close to Draconis now. He was preoccupied, tense for the kill. He didn't hear a sound, didn't sense her presence. Draconis, said Honora gently in her human voice. He jumped, startled, and looked over his shoulder. Get out of here, sister, Draconis told her roughly. This is none of your concern. Ah, but it is said Honora. In that moment, Draconis knew. She saw the knowledge in his eyes as she saw her own reflection, the shadow of the dragon rising up behind the Holy Sister, extending its wings and its claws. The colors of Draconis's mind came crashing down around him. I don't understand, he gasped. I know, Draconis said Honora softly, and her colors were gray ash. The pity is, you never will. Lightning crackled from her jaws. One. Marcus extended his hand, pointed behind himself to the buildings that stood at the entrance to the alley. The magic rolled out of him, rumbled through the earth, 
stone walls shook and trembled, and with a roar like an avalanche, the two buildings collapsed. Marcus heard screams and cries, and guessed that at least some of his pursuers had been caught in the cascade of rock and debris. He dashed out into the alley, with Evelina at his side, and it was then he felt the weakness. It came over him suddenly, unexpectedly, a sensation of being exhausted, drained of energy. He could not catch his breath. His legs and arms and hands tingled. He stumbled and nearly fell. Evelina caught hold of him. What's the matter? Are you hurt? He couldn't answer. He had to use his breath for breathing. Talking required more strength than he had, and he couldn't explain to her what was happening anyway. Nothing is free in this world. Everything has a price, including the magic. Conjuring pixies from dust motes had been a little fatiguing, but the magic had never before sent him to his bed. Bringing down stone buildings and raising ice storms was apparently different. He was so exhausted he could scarcely move. Behind him, he could hear the monks clawing their way through the rubble. He had to run or give up and die. Dearest Marcus, sweet love, we have to keep going, Evelina was saying, her voice trembling with fear. Please, just a little ways and we are there, my heart, my own. She tugged at him, pleaded with him. He nodded and continued on. But he could no longer run. It took all his resolve just to walk. It's not far now she said, sliding her arm around him, supporting him. He wearily raised his head to see that they had come farther than he'd hoped. The wall was directly ahead of them. They had only to cross a street, and they would be standing in front of it, fifty, a hundred steps. And then what? He remembered entering Dragon Keep, remembered looking back at the wall through which he'd just passed and seeing no gate, no entrance, only solid stone. On and on the wall ran, without end, around and around the city. No break, no way out, a dragon eating its own tail. Marcus! Evelina cried sharply, frightened. He jerked his head up, shook his head to clear it, kept moving, kept walking. He concentrated on picking up his feet and putting them down, picking them up, putting them down. The wall came closer, solid stone, fused with fire. Marcus called again, one last time. Draconas! The name echoed in the darkness of his little room, echoed back to him. One by one, the echoes died. The street that ran along the wall was empty. He'd expected to find a river of brown robes. If the monks were coming, they had not yet arrived. Yet, why should they hurry? Marcus asked himself. I'm not going anywhere, and neither is Evelina. He stood in front of the guard wall, staring at it, pouring his whole being into that stare, wishing it, willing it, to give him some hint, some clue of the way out. He risked leaving his little room, risked roaming up and down the length of the wall as far as he could see, risked using his magic to search for a crack, a chink in the endless stone. He stared at the wall so long that the stones began to shift and glide, and he wrenched his gaze away. He did not call to Draconis again. Marcus reached out his hand, touched the wall, touched stone, solid and cold. He moved his hand to another part and then another, all the while telling himself that this was stupid, futile, a last desperate attempt to stave off the inevitable. Marcus, said Evelina urgently, the monks... He saw them, rounding the corner of the building, walking straight for him. Some held fire in their hands. Some held steel. All of it was death, so it didn't much matter. Tell me the truth, Marcus, said Evelina quietly. 
There's no way out, is there? No, he said. There's not. I had hoped. He let hope hang, shook his head. I'm afraid, she said, and put her arms around him. So am I, he said, and held her close. A hand thrust through the stone wall. Marcus stared at it. I'm going mad, he thought, like the wretched monks. He blinked his eyes. The hand vanished, and Ven stood in front of him, inside the little room. This is the gate, said Ven. His blue eyes were the only color in a vast expanse of white. The way out, Evelina cried. I see it. Marcus, look. She clutched at him. There it is, right in front of us. Hurry, make haste. The illusion was broken, and, as always when we see the truth, he wondered that he had been so blind as not to penetrate the lie at once. The gate was crudely built, constructed of wood planks and held together by iron bands. The gate stood open. From the rusted look of the hinges, the gate had not been shut for centuries. Perhaps it had rusted in place. Beyond the gate was the forest, and beyond that, the river. No monks blocked the way. No dragons stood at the entrance. Marcus looked back to the little room. Take care of her, said Ven. He held out his hand. Marcus touched his brother's hand. The gate vanished, dissolved into the wall. The wall vanished, dissolved into illusion. Dragon Keep was gone. And it might have never existed, but for the feel of his brother's hand, firm and warm, in his own. Marcus guided the boat he and Evelina had stolen out into the river. Evelina sat rigid and upright in the stern opposite him, holding on to the gunwales with both hands. Her face was drawn and tense. She stared fearfully into the woods that were slowly, too slowly, sliding away. When the boat dipped slightly, as Marcus wrestled with the oars, Evelina grasped the gunwales tightly. Sorry, said Marcus. I haven't rowed a boat in a long time. I thought I saw something, she gasped. Oh, she relaxed. A deer. Evelina looked at him and managed a smile. I'm glad you're with me. You won't let anything happen to me. Marcus smiled back at her, trying to be reassuring, but he didn't make any promises. The shoreline was receding, though not as rapidly as he would have wished. Marcus expected to see the monks come swarming out of the forest to give chase. They would have a difficult time of it. After Evelina had plundered the boats for anything useful, Marcus had pushed each boat, one by one, out into the river, where the current caught them and carried them downstream. He would have liked to have destroyed the boats, perhaps set them ablaze, but he lacked the strength to use any more magic. He had tried staving in the bottom of one of the boats by kicking it with his foot, but the planks were too strong and wouldn't give way. The current was slow here. The boats bobbed in the water, meandering lazily downstream. Any energetic monk could plunge in and recover them. Marcus waited for that to happen. But no monk, energetic or otherwise, appeared. The boat tent carrying him and Evelina rounded a bend in the river, and he lost sight of the shoreline and the bobbing boats. The river was narrow at this point, the shore lined with trees whose overhanging boughs, thickly intertwined, cut off the bright sun and made it seem as if he were rowing into a green and leafy cavern. Sparse patches of sunlight slid over his knees, the sun was directly overhead. Midday. Only noon. Presumably, noon of the same day. So much had happened. It seemed as if it should be noon of some day next year. I don't like this. Evelina hugged herself. It's like a cave. 
anyone could be hiding in those trees. An alarming thought occurred to her. Speaking of caves, we're not going back there, are we, Your Highness? Back to that horrible cave beneath the water? This is the way. I remember it. I don't want to go back there. We should turn around. Travel downstream. The sunken cave. Marcus remembered gliding through it silently, careful not to make a sound, lest Grald and the monks should hear him and Bellona. He didn't much like the idea of going back through that cave himself. Perhaps that's why the monks didn't follow us to the shore. Perhaps they're waiting for me there. Maybe I should turn around and travel downriver, as Evelina says. Marcus kept rowing upriver, pulling steadily for the sunken cavern. They're not chasing us, are they, Your Highness? Evelina asked, peering over her shoulder. They'd be here by now, don't you think? Yes, Marcus replied. No use frightening her with his dark conjectures. You must call me Marcus, he smiled at her. We've been through too much for formalities. Evelina flushed with pleasure. Marcus, I like that. And you will call me Evelina. She sighed and let go of the gunnel. Wrapping her hands around her knees, she leaned forward and turned her attention to him. You look tired. I'm all right, Marcus said. He was tired, although he'd recovered his strength somewhat after exhaustion had nearly overwhelmed him at the wall. He guessed that the exhaustion had been partly due to despair, a despair that had lifted from him when he'd felt the touch of his brother's hand. Marcus didn't understand anything that had happened. He didn't understand why Ven had helped him escape the dragon after betraying him to the dragon. He didn't understand how Ven even came to be alive. The last he'd seen of his brother, Ven was lying in a pool of blood, a knife wound in his chest. I don't need to understand. Not now. Now I have to concentrate on only one thing. You'd find the rowing to be easier traveling downstream, Evelina pointed out for the third time. Marcus shook his head. Easier, but the wrong way. Where are we going then? Home, said Marcus. His objective, his only objective. Your home? asked Evelina, and she sounded troubled. My home. His home, his kingdom of Idlewild. That was why he was risking the monks in the sunken cavern. He might even find the dragon there, for that was where he had first seen Grald, the hulking human form the dragon had appropriated. Marcus was ready to risk even that, to return to his home. He could not explain this longing, but the memory came to him of another time, a time he had been away from his home for months, trapped in a world of insanity from which Draconis had saved him, when the little boy, Marcus, had seen the towers of his father's castle shining in the sunlight, he had felt the ache of longing in his heart swell so that the towers were drowned in his tears. The man, Marcus, remembered and wanted to see those sunlit towers again. Watch it, Evelina cried. Marcus jerked his head around, saw that he was steering them perilously close to a tangle of grass and dead tree branches. He gave the oars a twitch, and they cleared the hazard, though with only inches to spare. You are so very tired, said Evelina. She reached out her hand to him, bending forward still more. Her chemise slipped a little, revealing an enticing expanse of curves and shadows. You would not even need to row if we went downstream. The river would carry us. I told you back at the landing, Evelina, said Marcus, and his tone, though gentle, left no room for argument. I have to go home. Seated opposite Marcus in the boat, Evelina pouted. She was accustomed to having her own way. At least you have a home she returned, sitting up straight. By leaning forward, she had just provided him with an enticing view of her breasts, and it had all been for nothing. 
he'd barely glanced at her. Therefore, she would punish him. Your brother took my home away from me. This jab, meant to wound him with guilt, missed its mark. At the mention of his brother's name, Marcus's gaze went from Evelina's face to her blood-spattered clothes. His eyes darkened, his lips compressed. He looked out at the trees and continued to row. Evelina's cheeks burned. So, that was it. The blood was Venn's, the prince's monstrous half-brother. And she'd been the one to draw that blood. The last she'd seen of Venn, he was lying on the floor, dying, or so she hoped. She had saved their lives. Marcus had told her that. He'd been grateful. Now he couldn't look at her. What's the matter, Marcus? Evelina demanded. She clutched at the blood-stained bodice and tried ineffectually to rearrange it so that the brownish-red spots did not show. Why did you look at me like that? Marcus flushed. Like what? He tried to sound innocent and thereby clinched his guilt. Like I was something ugly and disgusting that you'd like to squash beneath your boot. You said you understood why I stabbed that beast of a brother, and now you hate me. Evelina burst into tears that were not feigned, at least not much. She buried her head in her arms and sobbed stormily, lifting her head once to cry, Your brother tried to rape me. He admitted it, and he killed my father. Then she gave herself up to the luxury of hysterics. She felt she'd earned it. As she wept, Evelina expected confidently that Marcus would stop rowing the boat, take her in his arms, and comfort her. He didn't. He continued to row. Admittedly, they were fleeing mad monks and a dragon, but still, Evelina felt slighted. Another man, a true man, would have thrown caution to the winds in order to soothe her and pet her and try to steal a kiss or slip his hand down her chemise. Marcus just kept rowing. Evelina was at a loss. Hysterics were wearing, and she couldn't keep this up forever. The prince obviously wasn't going to be of any help to her. She'd have to recover on her own. She let her sobs quiet and risked a furtive glance from under her tear-soaked arms to see how he was taking it. He was rowing steadily, his eyes fixed on her. He looked uncomfortable. Maybe he was just shy, unused to women. I wonder how long it will take to reach this home of his. Days, maybe. Days and night. Nights, alone, together. Evelina's pulse quickened, and her breath came fast at the thought. She would have to be careful with her seduction of her prince, for he believed her to be a maiden pure as well as a maiden fair. He must be made to think that he was the one who had seduced her. Evelina's dream dreamt from the moment she'd first met him this very morning, was to be Her Royal Highness Princess Evelina, wife of His Royal Highness Prince Marcus. She knew that marriage was long odds, however. The Royal Mistress. She would settle for that. Evelina had already discounted the idea of trying to convince Marcus that she was a baron's daughter, kidnapped by Venn, who carried her fainting from her father's castle. She was pragmatic enough to know that she could never pass for noble-born. She could neither read nor write. She could not embroider or play the lute. Her hands were not the smooth, fair hands of one who has never had to dress herself, never had to wash her own hair or scrub out her own chamber pot. Princes married farmers' daughters only in the minstrel's tales. In real life, the princes took the farmers' daughters to be their mistresses. They set them up in fine houses in the city and gave them jewels and clothes and educated their bastard sons and made them abbots. 
Evelina resolved to have the house, the jewels, the bastard son. Maybe not in that order. House and jewels often came as a result of the bastard son. Her primary goal in all this was, therefore, to get herself seduced. That was the reason she'd been urging him to travel downstream, away from his home. The more time she spent with him, the better. He would not go downstream, so she would have to act fast. Her sobs calmed to hiccups, and she timidly raised her head. Her tears made her eyes shimmer, even if the lids were red. The boat slid along the surface of the sun-dappled water. Marcus, Evelina said, her voice quavering. I know I am not like the well-born, accomplished women you are used to being around. My father was a merchant in the city of Fairfield. Dear man, he was respectable, kind and gentle, just not very practical. My mother died when I was little, and father and I were everything to each other. I'm sorry I stabbed your brother. I'm a good person. I really am. Father and I went to church every week. It's just, when I saw Ven, I saw my poor father's body, all crumpled and twisted. Don't cry, Evelina. I understand, said Marcus. You will have a home to go to, my home. You saved my life. My parents will welcome you for that. Again, that cool, polite tone. He looked away, searching the bank for any signs of pursuit. Evelina glowered at him, annoyed. I don't want your parents to welcome me for saving your life, she told him beneath her breath. I want them to welcome me as the mother of their first grandson. And whether they do that with open arms or cold shoulders doesn't really matter. I'll have you, my love, and I'll have your baby, and there won't be a damn thing your parents can do about either. The thought cheered her. She had plenty of time to coax him into loving her. She had never failed yet with any man. Thank you, your highness, Evelina said softly. I mean, Marcus. Sunlight flickered through the overarching boughs, forming ripples of gold that shone in Evelina's hair. She was dabbing her eyes with cold water. She had the loveliest face Marcus had ever seen. His gaze went from her face to the splotches of blood on her bodice and on her skirt and her chemise and the white skin of her neck. The splotches had been fresh not many hours before. They had since smeared and dried to an ugly reddish brown. Blood spots. Ven's blood. Evelina hadn't killed him, though she had meant to. Of that Marcus had no doubt. Despite that, Ven had risked the dragon's ire to free them. He had urged Marcus to take care of her. Maybe he had acted out of guilt. He had admitted to Marcus that he'd tried to rape Evelina. Without Ven, they would be both dead now, or at least back in the clutches of Grald. Marcus wondered how he felt about Evelina. He thought perhaps he loved her. He remembered with aching clarity the sight of her shapely legs when she'd kilted her skirts to flee the monks. As he looked at her now, seated across from him, sometimes he saw his brother's blood, and other times he saw the shadow that fell enticingly between her full breasts. Evelina looked at him as no other woman had ever before looked at him, adoring, loving, admiring. Evelina had seen him work his magic, and she had not been shocked or terrified. And she had seen him work far more powerful magics than changing dust motes into fairies. He imagined his lips touching her soft lips, his hand cupping her soft and heavy breasts. And he was filled with such burning desire that he had to firmly banish such thoughts in order to keep his mind on their peril. 
yet, yet, even as he kissed her lips in his imaginings, he saw those lips twist into a snarl of fury. He saw the hand that caressed him drive the knife into his brother's body. He saw the blood splatter onto her clothes, and he saw her yank the knife free and try to stab then again. Marcus came to a sudden, stark understanding. There was something secret and unspoken between Ven and Evelina, a truth that neither of them had shared with him. He'd heard her side of the story. He wanted very much to hear Ven's. His brother had tried to tell him. Marcus had jumped to conclusions and rebuffed him. And now it was too late. Whatever had happened, Evelina wouldn't tell him, and Ven couldn't, at least not now. Perhaps in time, Marcus would be able to contact his brother, speak mind to mind, touch hand to hand, as they had done when they were little. Now he didn't dare go into the room inside his mind, the room where he could eavesdrop on Dragon's thoughts and dreams, the room where he had first met his brother, Long, long ago. The dragon was waiting for him in that little room. And probably in the cavern as well. I told you, Evelina was saying sharply, I don't want to end up in that horrible cave. Marcus gave a start. She had plucked the thoughts out of his head and spoken them aloud. I saw him there, that man they called Grald. I didn't like the way he looked at me. Please turn around, Marcus. Go the other way. I don't want him to find me. I don't think that Grald will be in the cave. That explosion we heard. You don't know for certain he won't be there, Evelina pointed out, and her lower lip quivered. If we traveled south, we could spend a few days resting at a fine inn. We're not going south. Marcus smiled at her to take the sting out of his refusal, and shook his head and kept rowing, though he was aching and hurting and almost sick with fatigue. And there it was, the argument come around to where it began. Evelina heaved a disappointed sigh, loud enough for him to hear. If he did, he didn't let on and Evelina ground her teeth in frustration. She needed to hide her ire from him, however, and so she bent over the side of the boat and cupped her hand for a drink of water. She caught a glimpse of her reflection. Evelina drew back, horrified. She looked a fright. Her hair was tangled and matted with bits of twigs and leaves. Her face was covered with dirt and streaked with tears. Her nose had swelled, and her eyes were red as a rat's. No wonder he won't have anything to do with me, she said to herself, appalled. Not to mention those accursed red-brown splotches on her bodice and her skirt. She couldn't do anything about her appearance now. When they stopped for the night, she'd take a bath, modestly provocative, and she would scrub those horrid spots out of her chemise and her skirt, which would leave her clothes sopping wet. She couldn't put them back on. She might catch her death of cold. Which meant that she and Marcus couldn't very well continue their journey. Not with her having nothing whatsoever to wear. 2. Standing waist-deep in the water, Watching the boat carrying Bellona's body drift downstream, Ven turned to wade back to shore. Glancing down, he saw a thin trail of blood snaking out into the water and meandering downstream. The stab wound had reopened. Evelina had struck in haste. The knife had glanced off bone, avoiding any organs. He'd lost a lot of blood, however, and he'd lost more blood when he'd slipped out of the city of Dragonkeep to pay his last respects to the woman who had raised him and, in her own strange way, loved him. 
his dragon blood had acted promptly to start the healing process, and the wound had already partially closed. He must have torn it open during his strenuous exertions, carrying Bologna's body to the river, placing it in a boat, and casting the boat adrift, freeing her spirit to join the spirit of her life's love, Melisande, Ven's mother. The chill of the water had kept him from noticing. The dragon magic seemed slower to heal the wound this time. Perhaps the magical power inside him was growing weaker as he grew weaker. He needed to return to Dragon Keep quickly before he collapsed. It would never do for him to be found outside the city walls. Emerging from the water onto the slippery bank, he dug his claws into the mud to keep his footing, and it was then he saw the footprints. Two sets, fresh, one set small, made by slippered feet, the other larger, wearing boots. He couldn't spare the time to investigate. Every moment he was away was a moment his absence might be discovered. Yet he could not help but follow the footprints with his tracker's eye to try to deduce where they had gone. The two he was risking his life to save, his half-brother Marcus and Evelina, the young woman who had stabbed him. Marcus had been back and forth to the water's edge several times, dragging heavy objects along with him. Ven recalled the boats used by the monks stacked on the shore. There were none there now. He could picture Marcus dragging down one boat after another, shoving each out into the river to float away downstream. Marcus would, of course, have kept one of the boats for himself and Evelina. Ven looked back at the river, at the bright noon sun glittering on the water. He could imagine the two of them in the boat, Marcus rowing, fearful of pursuit, Evelina sitting in the stern, gazing at Marcus with adoration. Ven had seen the light of love burst into flame the first moment Evelina had set her blue eyes on Marcus. Well, maybe not love's light. Knowing Evelina, it was most likely the light gleaming off Prince Marcus's golden crown. Ven pressed his hand over the wound to try to stop the bleeding. That's why she stabbed me, he reflected. She was afraid I would tell Marcus the truth about her, that she was not the poor, mistreated victim of my brutal advances, that she deliberately seduced me in order to trap me, that she sold me to a traveling circus to be exhibited to the gaping wonder of the crowd. She believes me to be dead. I made sure of that. Evelina will be sitting pretty now, thinking she's safe and secure, able to snare Marcus in her web, bind him with her silken lies, and sting him with the poison of her lips, paralyzing him into stillness so that she can suck him dry. Maybe, maybe not. Ven wondered if Marcus had told her that he'd communicated with his brother, that Ven was alive. In his brother's place, Ven would not have said anything to Evelina, and he doubted that Marcus would. Both brothers had learned at an early age to keep secrets. The truth was dangerous, might be disastrous bringing peril to themselves and those they loved. Marcus would be slow to trust, reticent about speaking his thoughts aloud, naturally cautious and reserved. He would also be extremely confused. Ven could not help but grin wryly. It served Marcus right. He had been very quick to believe Evelina's accusation that Ven was a vicious, murdering monster. How astonished Marcus must have been when the murdering monster saved their lives. I could tell Marcus my side of the story, Ven considered as he gazed upriver. Marcus might even believe me. Ven mulled it over and decided not to. He wasn't sure exactly why. Guilt was some of it. Evelina had not entirely lied. He had meant to take her that night in the tall grass, and he would have, if she had not managed to fend him off and wriggle out from beneath him. 
and he was responsible for the death of her father. She had not made that up. Ven had not killed Ramon with his own hand. The monks had done that, but they had murdered him because of Ven. Part of his decision not to tell was vindication. Ven felt a certain satisfaction in thinking that the brother who had grown up pampered and happy and loved should fall victim to a mercenary little vixen. Ven expected this feeling to be stronger. Instead, it was uncomfortable. Ven couldn't say that he loved Marcus, but he liked his brother, and that was unexpected. Ven had looked forward to hating Marcus, who'd been given everything in life, while Ven had been given the back of life's hand. Instead, Ven found someone who understood, someone who shared his pain. And, after all, maybe his not telling Marcus came down to the simple fact that Ven disliked interfering. He'd said what he'd needed to say to Marcus and to Evelina, let the two of them sort out their lives. He had his own problems. He was thinking all this as he stood on the bank, staring at the water, when his thoughts were jolted back to earth. Voices, heading this direction. Grald must have finally lifted the illusion that hid the city gates of Dragon Keep from the world outside. The monks were coming, somewhat late, to chase after Marcus. This meant that Grald knew Marcus had escaped. Did the dragon know how? Perhaps the monks aren't after Marcus, Ven said to himself in alarm. Perhaps they are after me. Ven had to retain Grald's trust. The only way to slay the dragon was to take him by surprise, catch him off guard. Grald mustn't suspect that Ven had anything to do with Marcus's escape. Ven had been careless. That's what came of giving way to emotion. Prints of his clawed feet were everywhere, leading in and out of the water. He cursed himself for not having the foresight to cover his tracks. Bellona would have made him stand in the corner for a week in punishment. Hastily, he raked his claws over the telltale signs, rubbing out the traces that he'd been here. He didn't have much time. The voices were growing louder, and he could hear the monks bumbling through the woods. He ran lightly and easily on his clawed feet into the trees, jumping from one grassy hillock to another, making certain that he left no more tracks. Once safely hidden in the wilderness, he paused to consider his next move. His first thought was to race back to the city, but then the idea came to him that he might learn the answers to his questions by spying on the monks. He crouched among the foliage and waited. Blood trickled down his side, tickling him. His wound was still bleeding. He pressed his hand over it and willed it to stop. Three monks in their ankle-length brown robes came blowing out of the forest. They were hot and sweaty and scared, and they peered and poked about. Their eyes, with that strange, half-mad glint, went from ground to water and even sky, as if somewhere in their confused brains they imagined that their prey might have grown wings and taken flight. They're not here, said one, bewildered. What did you expect? another asked. He seemed more sane than the rest. His searching had been more methodical. He'd stared a long time at the footprints. That they'd wait around for you? I don't know. Maybe. The other two continued to search, not with hope of finding anything, but because they didn't know what else to do. The boats are gone, one pointed out. They used the boat to escape, said the lucid monk. But all the boats are gone, the first reiterated. They set the rest adrift. Ah! The monk seemed to consider this an act of genius, for he stared wide-eyed at the sluggishly flowing water. I'll go find them! He plunged into the river, splashing and floundering, his arms flailing. The lucid monk 
shaking his head, waded in to grab hold of his companion and drag him back to land. What do you think you're doing? the monk asked sternly. You can't swim. You'll only end up drowning yourself. The monk shook free. He cast a look back at the water, a look that was bleak and wistful, and then he turned away. Ven shivered in the cool shadows and was sorry he'd stayed. What do we do? asked the sopping wet monk plaintively. We can't go after them. We have no boats. We go back to Dragon Keep. What do we tell Grald? The monk sounded nervous. That we couldn't find them, and that there were no boats. Grald will be angry. Grald is always angry, said the leader, and he shrugged. The three did not leave immediately, however, as Ven had hoped. The leader stared intently up the river, as though he were reaching out, searching with his mind. The other two continued to poke about in a desultory manner. Ben cursed them silently and willed them to depart. The mysterious explosion had thrown the city into confusion and turmoil, but he was afraid that now his absence would be noticed. He was just thinking he would have to risk slipping off into wilderness when the lead monk announced that they should be returning. Growled will be eager for our report. He didn't seem eager, one of the monks muttered. Otherwise, he would have opened the gate when we first reported that the two escaped. Grald has his reasons. The monk who had jumped into the river spoke up. I heard that the dragon did not open the gate because he feared that the man we've been told to find, the one Grald calls Draconus, would be lost to him. Ven's ears pricked. He wanted to hear more. Unfortunately, the monks now began walking back toward the city. Ven cursed them a second time. His dragon blood gave him the ability to hear better than humans, and he stretched his ears to the limit. Grald finally did open the gate, another monk argued, so this Draconus must have been caught. He wasn't, said the leader. We have been told to keep searching for this man, either for him or for his corpse. It seems that it was this Draconus who caused the terrible blast. They still don't know how many are dead. Why would he do that? The monk sounded shocked. Because he is our enemy, sent to destroy us. Who sent him? The other two monks were eager listeners now, avid for news. The human king, who has long been a threat to us. Edward, the king of a nation known as Idlewild. You mark my words, this means war. War against Idlewild. War against Marcus and his father. Ven tried to picture an army of mad monks, and it was so ludicrous that he snorted in derision. He was much more interested in finding out what had happened to Draconis. Ven remembered the horrific blast. It had reduced the house in which he and Marcus and Evelina had been to rubble and allowed Marcus and Evelina to escape. Draconis had caused the blast, and Grald was hunting for him, which meant Draconis must still be alive. Once the monks were well out of earshot, Ven made his way back to the city, hoping to reach it before anyone noticed that he'd been gone. 3. Honora fought through a miasma of black anger and Grald's raging, mixed with her own pain and blank confusion. She was flat on the floor, lying amidst a heap of cracked stones and splintered, smoldering timbers. Clouds of dust and smoke obscured her vision. She coughed and shook her head to clear it of the throbbing and Grald's yammering. What have you done? He was howling furious. His colors reverberated inside her aching skull. You have destroyed half the city and nearly killed me in the process. And my son? What has become of my son? Honora ignored him. She tried to remember. Draconis? What had become of Draconis? She leapt to her feet and glanced swiftly about the wreckage of the building. His body must be here somewhere. He could not have escaped her. 
he should be dead. Human bones and flesh burned beyond recognition. A walker had never yet died while in human form, but the dragons had prepared for that eventuality. The illusion of the human body remained even in death. Otherwise, humans might come to know that dragons were spying on them. The dragons would recover the corpse in secret and then use spells to lift the illusion so that the dead could be laid to rest in the bottom of the sea, the traditional dragon burial site where all life began and to which all life must eventually return. What with Grald yelling at her and shrieking humans swarming about the place and her head throbbing, Honora found it difficult to concentrate. She grit her teeth and shut them all out. Draconis was not here, and he must be here. Her illusory body possessed dragon strength, and the humans watching were amazed to see the pudgy holy sister lifting up enormous boulders and flinging them aside heaving huge timbers out of her way, kicking and clawing at the rubble. They assumed she was searching for survivors, and they regarded her with awe and admiration. Shut up, she finally ordered Grald. Where are you? I need your help. Then you shouldn't have dropped a goddamn building on top of me, returned Grald, who tended to use regrettable human expressions even in his dragon thinking. It's a good thing this human body has a thick skull. Otherwise, he paused, seething, then roared, What the hell happened? You were supposed to kill Draconis, not level my city. Honora was silent, her colors smoldering. What? growled thundered. Isn't he dead? He must be, Honora returned coldly. It's just... I can't seem to find his body. Perhaps it was blown to bits, Grald suggested. If that were the case, there would be blood, bone, hunks of flesh. There is nothing. You must help me search for him. I would like to, Grald stated caustically. But at the moment, I am buried under a half ton of rubble. My magic protected me from harm, but I can't free myself. The monks are digging me out, but it's going to take some time. What about my son? What happened to Ven? The monks can't find him, and neither can I. Ven was always adept at keeping his mind hidden from us. Honora stood in the middle of the debris, angry and frustrated. What about his brother, the human prince, he should be easy enough to locate, and if you have one, you have the other. Not necessarily, said Grald. The human managed to escape. He escaped the explosion? The city. Now it was Grald who was on the defensive. How is that possible? Honora demanded in disbelief. The human is strong in dragon magic, but not strong enough to penetrate the illusion of the wall. Only another dragon could do that. Her voice trailed off. So, Draconis did escape you, said Grald grimly. You destroy half my city for nothing. I did not destroy the city, Honora returned crossly. Looking around the ruin in which she was standing, she was starting to realize what must have happened. Draconis cast a counterspell that caused his magic to clash with mine. It's a wonder any of us survived. You must order your monks to search for the walker, she added, her colors sullen. I believe he is alive after all. Told you so, Grald sneered. The monks were ordered to search for two humans. The walker, who wore the guise of a human male in his thirties, and a human male named Marcus, last seen wearing the robes of a monk. The monks were also told to look for Ven, 
the dragon's son, whom they all knew by sight. Unfortunately, their search for both humans and the dragon disguised as a human was hampered by the fact that the entire population of Dragon Keep had been thrown into a state of panic by the blast. With the maddening perversity of humans, people rushed to the site of the blast instead of fleeing it, which, as Anora told Grald, any creature with common sense would have done. Before the dust had settled, humans clogged the streets and clambered over the ruins, screeching and yelling, wailing and weeping, groaning and bleeding, and none of them staying in one place, but all of them milling about in confusion. Honora continued her search, though without much hope, for she was convinced that it must have been Draconis who had helped Marcus escape. Humans were everywhere underfoot. They scrabbled frantically through the wreckage, calling for those who would never answer. A middle-aged man hurried past, carrying the bloody, broken body of a child. A young woman crouched, moaning over the corpse of a young man, as another woman was trying unsuccessfully to soothe her. The dragon paid scant attention to any of this. There were so many humans in this world, their lives so short and fleeting, that the loss of a few dozen was no great cause for concern especially when the future of both mankind and dragonkind was at stake. Slowly, as the reports of the monks began to come in, Grald and Honora were able to piece together parts of the puzzle. The monks entered the building where Ven and Marcus and the girl Evelina had last been seen. No one was there, although the monks did report finding a large pool of blood on the floor. They did not know whose blood, there was no body. A hole blown out the back of the building gave the monks some idea of how those inside had escaped. Armed with dragon magic, the monks continued their search for Marcus and Ven. Marcus could not have left Dragon Keep, for the wall surrounding the city was designed so that no human, even one possessing the dragon magic, could find his way through the hidden gate. Except that was exactly what happened. Or so his monks reported back to Grald. Marcus had been cornered, trapped like the proverbial rat with his back against the wall. Exhausted and wounded, he could not even put up much of a fight. The human female with him had no magic and was no threat. Suddenly, without warning, Marcus walked straight through the solid rock wall and he took the girl with him. The monks were baffled. Grald was not. This proves it. Draconis is responsible, he said accusingly to Honora. You bungled the job. Disguised in their respective human forms, Grald in the body of a large, hulking human male, and Honora in the body of a holy sister, the two dragons surveyed the midst of the ruins left by the horrific blast that had wiped out an entire city block. Then why haven't we seen his colors? Honora demanded, frustrated and baffled. If his mind is alive and active and reaching out to help Melisande's son, we would know it, for we have been watching for him. He could not hide from us. Someone reached out to aid Melisande's son, Grald muttered, kicking at a chunk of stone and sending it rolling. Someone opened the gate for him. The prince could not do that by himself. What about your son, then? What about him? Grald growled. He was with his brother and that female. He could have opened the gate and helped them escape. Grald snorted. Ven hates his brother, and why not? His brother is handsome, rich, educated, and has two human legs, not two dragon ones. And Ven lusts after the girl who was with Marcus. Ven would not have permitted her to flee, especially in the company of a brother he detests. Besides, the monks theorize that Ven was injured. They think the blood was his. And... His mind remains closed to me. 
He is cagey, that one. Because he has not used the dragon magic, his mind has no colors, like a barren field blanketed in heavy snow. Except the field is not as barren as we suppose. He has learned how to mask his thoughts from us. Where is he now? Do you know? If he's wounded, he couldn't have gone far. My monks continue to search for him. By my wings and tail, we seem to have lost everything this morning. Honora ground her teeth in frustration. If you had struck Draconis from behind, slain him immediately, as I suggested, then we would not be in this mess. You had to treat yourself to your little Philip of victory. Let him know who you were. Do not tell me how to fight my battles. Honora snarled, rounding on growled. You have lived in that stolen body so long, you do not remember what it is like to live in a body such as that inhabited by Draconus, a body created by a supreme illusion. And I say that you have not fought another dragon in so long, that you do not remember what it is to do battle with one, Grald returned, although in subdued tones. He could see the shadow of the elder dragon looming over him. Draconus did with you what he did with me when I fought him. He cast a defensive spell that threw your magic back on itself. And then he turned tail and ran. He had seconds only, argued Honora. He could not have gone far. He apparently went far enough to help the son of Melisande escape through the magical gate, Grald retorted. Enough of this bantering, Honora said, suddenly weary. We go round and round, like a fledgling chasing its tail, and we get nowhere. Here comes one of your mad monks. Perhaps he has something to report. The monk bowed obsequiously. Honored one, the monk began. Yes, yes, Grald interrupted impatiently. Get on with it. What have you to report? Honored one, the monk continued, cringing. Your son has been found. Then? Where? Grald demanded, tense, alert. In the abbey, honored one. He made it that far before he collapsed. Collapsed? Grald repeated. Out with it, you ninny. What is wrong with him? Is he hurt? He was stabbed, honored one replied the monk in grave tones. We found him lying on the floor of his room in a pool of blood. We do not know if he will survive. Grald cast a triumphant glance at Honora. That rules out Ven having anything to do with Marcus's flight. Honora cast him a withering glance. I should think you would be much more concerned about the fact that this precious body of yours is bleeding to death. The dire reminder had the desired effect. Growled hastened off in alarm, leaving Honora alone. Once he was gone, she spoke to the third dragon of their triumvirate, Maristara, the dragon of Seth, who had started it all. I have to face facts, Honora said reluctantly. She hated admitting to her mistakes. Draconus has escaped me. You know what he will do, Maristara returned. He will summon the Parliament, and he will tell them everything. He will tell them about Dragon Keep, about the children. He will tell them about you, Honora, and how you have betrayed them. I'm not betraying them, Honora retorted. I'm trying to save them, if they could only see that. Now is the time for them to see. Pull the viper's fangs. Honora pondered, thoughtful. You're right. Once they know the truth, have seen what we have seen, then Draconus is no longer a concern. And while Parliament is in an uproar, ranting and raving and flapping their wings, we will prepare to strike.
And once the first human kingdom is conquered and held firmly under our claws, our people will come to see that we are right, that our way is the only way. And what of Draconis? Honora still wasn't convinced. It would be a shame if he were to fly into the side of a mountain and break his neck replied Maristara. 4. Honora should have been paying more attention to the despised humans. She would have found Draconis. He was carried out of the ruins right under her nose, and she never noticed. Honora made the mistake of searching for Draconis in the human form he was most fond of adopting, that of a human male of undetermined years, strong and lean, with long black hair and dark eyes. It never occurred to either her or Grald that, as Draconis saw death crackling before him, he would use his last fleeting seconds to do two things. First, as Honora had postulated, Draconis cast a defensive spell that acted as a shield, causing Honora's magic to bounce off him like a thrown spear bounces off steel. Second, as the lightning flared and sizzled around him, Draconis shifted form, choosing an illusion that he had found to be useful to him in the past. He had just managed to take on this form when the power of Honora's magic clashed with Draconis's magic, erupting in a blast that destroyed the building and brought it down on top of both of them. Anton Hammerfall and his wife Rosa were workers in the city of Dragonkeep. As his name implied, Anton was a blacksmith. His wife Rosa worked as a weaver. Despite the fact that they lived in the city that had been founded as a haven for children with dragon magic in them, Anton had nary a drop. His was the third generation to grow up in Dragonkeep, and if the men in his family had ever had the magic, it had long since dwindled out of them. Anton gave secret thanks daily that such was the case. He felt nothing but pity for those wretched monks whose blood burned with the magical fire that drove them insane. Rosa had some dragon magic in her, as did all the women of Dragon Keep, though not enough to make her valuable to the dragon, and thus she was a lowly weaver and not one of the holy sisters. The blood bane, as the magic was known, was not so bad in women as in men. It did not drive them insane. And thus Anton and Rosa had been proud to discover that their only daughter, Magda, was strong in the dragon magic. She had been summoned by the dragon to live in his palace, and though they missed her, they were pleased for her. Anton and Rosa resided in a small, one-room house in the city of Dragonkeep, not far from the site of the terrifying blast that had shaken the ground and knocked all the crockery off the shelves. The time was early morning. Anton had just fired up the forge when the blast hit. He had joined his neighbors in running to the scene, and he had proven to be invaluable in the search for survivors, for his strong smith's arms were needed to lift the fallen stones and move heavy wooden beams. Rosa had gone with her husband, bringing with her bolts of new-made woolen cloth to be used as bandages for the living and shrouds for the dead. Both Rosa and Anton worked throughout the morning and into the late afternoon, doing what they could to help. There had been a great deal of confusion at first, as the people of Dragonkeep flocked to the site, either to help or to gawk or to conduct frantic searches for friends and relatives. Anton gave the Blessed credit for swiftly restoring order. The Blessed, as the monks were known, served as the dragon's eyes and ears and enforcers of the law. This, and the fact that some of the blessed were quite mad, caused the ordinary unblessed citizens of Dragonkeep to go in healthy fear of the monks and to be quick to obey their commands. 
The blessed ordered the majority of the citizens home, keeping only those who had proven to be useful. Anton and Rosa were among these, comforting, bandaging, lifting and hauling, rejoicing when survivors were discovered, grieving when they came upon bodies of the dead. By sundown, both were exhausted. The blessed concluded that there was not much more to be done, especially now that night was falling. Rosa went home to have a good cry, as she said, and to give thanks to the dragon that their dear daughter was safe from harm inside the palace beneath the mountain. One of the dead Rosa had so gently covered with a blanket had been a young woman near her daughter's age. Anton was also weary. His arms and his back and his heart ached. He could not bring himself to leave, however, not when there was the chance of finding someone still alive. He continued to search through the rubble, and the last gleam of failing sunlight gave him a reward. He saw a child's dusty hand protruding from beneath a pile of stones. At first, Anton feared he'd found another corpse. He knelt down and touched the child's hand, and, to his astonishment, found it warm, with a weak but steady pulse. Hope and elation burned away his weariness. Experience cautioned him not to immediately try to free the victim, much as he longed to pull her out from under the mound of rock. He first took a careful look at the debris pile. Shifting the wrong stone might cause the rocks to slide and bury the child deeper. Damn, this is odd, he muttered to himself, eyeing the strange way the stones and beams had settled. But then he'd noted a lot about this disaster that was very odd. He thought at first of calling for help. He thought then that he wouldn't. He could manage by himself. Considering the oddity of the situation, that might be best. And it would save precious time. He dug the child out of the debris using his bare hands, and within moments had freed her. She was unconscious. She had a head wound. Blood gummed her hair and covered her face and her clothes, so that it was hard for him to tell where else she might be hurt. Her breathing was easy, not labored or shallow. He felt her limbs to see if they were broken. Arms and legs appeared to be intact. He could not see the wound on her head for all the blood and did not want to start probing, fearing his clumsy touch might make her injuries worse. The girl was about twelve years old. She was dressed in a woolen shift, and that was all. No stockings, no shoes. The building was empty. No furniture, no sign that people lived here. The girl was alone in an abandoned dwelling. Odder and odder still. Anton took no more time to speculate. Questions would be answered if and when the girl survived. He lifted her gently in his arms and carried her from the building. On his way out, he spotted Grald, the man who ruled Dragon Keep in the name of the dragon, talking with one of the Holy Sisters. Anton ducked his head so as to escape their notice and hurried past them as swiftly as possible. He was glad now he had not called for help. He considered what to do with the child. He could take her to the healers in the abbey, but the abbey was a long way off, and he was too tired to walk such a distance. Besides, the houses of the healers would be filled to overflowing. His own home was nearby. He would take the child there first, make her comfortable, and let his wife examine her injuries. Then, together, he and Rosa could decide what to do with her. Anton's home was larger than the single-room dwellings generally found in Dragon Keep. This was not because he was wealthier than the rest of the people. There were no such distinctions in the City of the Dragon. Dwelling places were doled out by the Blessed based on certain considerations. Number of inhabitants in the home, the type of work done by the inhabitants, etc.,
Rosa had her loom at home, and Anton's smithy shop was attached to the dwelling, so the dwelling had to be large enough to accommodate tools and equipment for both of them. Anton opened the door, which was never locked, with his shoulder and backed inside the house, taking care not to hit the girl's head on the doorframe. Rosa was slumped over the dinner table, having her cry. Give me a hand here, wife, he said, closing the door with his foot as he indicated the child in his arms. She's hurt bad, I think, but she's alive. Rosa lifted her tear-stained face. She was in her mid-fifties, with the deft, calloused hands of one who has been sitting at the loom most of her life. Slender and small-boned, she barely came to her husband's chest. Anton was not very tall, but he was big-shouldered and massive, with powerful arms and legs. Rosa had a way of tilting her head to one side whenever she was considering anything, and Anton had a lumbering good nature about him, so that their friends nicknamed them affectionately Bird and Bear. Her amazed stare gave way to motherly compassion. Lay her on our Magda's bed, Rosa told her husband. Then go fetch more water. She had questions. Anton could see that. But she would not ask them until the child was warm and made comfortable. When he returned from the well, he found the girl tucked in bed, her face washed clean of blood and dirt, and a wet cloth on her forehead. How is she? he asked anxiously, pouring the water into the kettle and then stirring up the fire beneath it. She'll do for the time being, Rosa answered cautiously. Once I cleaned the wound, I found that it wasn't as bad as I'd feared. She's lost a lot of blood, though. Will she come around? One never knows with a head wound, but I think she should be fine. Her sleep seems to be a healing one, not the bad sort from which you never wake. Anton went to look at the girl. He regarded her thoughtfully, as Rosa waited for the water to heat so she could continue cleaning and dressing the wound. The girl had long black hair that straggled unkempt and uncombed over her shoulders. She lay quite still, did not groan or toss or twitch. She did indeed appear to be slumbering peacefully. Anton shook his head, and his frown deepened. Where did you find her husband? Where are her parents? Not dead? Rosa asked, suddenly fearful. She was alone in an abandoned building, said Anton, seating himself with a sigh at the table. He rubbed his shoulders and stretched his aching back muscles. No sign that anyone else lived there. The building was close to what must have been the heart of the blast. Truly? Rosa was amazed. She glanced back at the child. She is lucky to have escaped with such minor wounds. Lucky, Anton repeated with meaningful emphasis. I think it was more than luck. What do you mean? She lay in the middle of a heap of debris. Heavy beams fell around her. None fell on top of her. You think she is one of the blessed, then? Rosa asked gravely. That would explain it. She used her magic to shield herself. She must be quite powerful. One of the blessed. Rosa reached down to caress the child's hand. In an abandoned house, all by herself. She sighed deeply. A runaway. I think so. So, what do we do? By law, we're supposed to turn her over to the monks. Not until she is well, said Rosa firmly, and not until we've had a chance to hear her story and talk to her. We'll tell her about our Magda, how happy she is. We'll show her some of Magda's letters from the palace. But do you think you can talk her into going back to the sisterhood? Of course, Rosa said briskly. The child's just confused, that's all. Girls at that age don't know their own minds. Our Magda wanted to be a blacksmith like you when she was twelve, remember? What a time we had convincing her that such was not her calling. 
Anton smiled at the memory. Ten years had passed since his dearly loved daughter had left home at age twenty. She was one of the blessed, unusually strong in the dragon magic, and chosen by the dragon to live in the palace beneath the mountain. They had not seen Magda in all that time, but they still heard from her. Twice a year, she sent them a letter, telling them that she was well and happy in her service to the dragon, and describing the riches and wonders of palace life. Being a servant of the dragon was a great honor, to be sure, but Anton often envied the men his age who had ordinary daughters, who bore ordinary grandchildren. If we can convince this girl to go back on her own, the Holy Sisters won't be hard on her, Rosa was saying, not like the monks. Keep your voice down. Anton rose stiffly to his feet and went over to peer out the window. Although night had fallen, a few of their neighbors were still standing in the street discussing the explosion in animated tones. No one else was around. Satisfied that they had not been overheard speaking in disparaging terms about the blessed, Anton returned to the table. Rosa poured hot water from the kettle to a bowl and carried it over to the child. She cleaned out the wound and then combed the long, dark hair and plaited it in two tight, neat braids. The child continued to sleep. Anton cut up bread and meat for their supper and washed it down with ale. You look worn out, he said to his wife. Why don't you go to your bed? I'll sit up with the girl. I was tired, but I've got my second wind, Rosa smiled at him. You're the one who looks dead on his feet. Anton glanced at the open window, lowered his voice. What have you heard about how it happened? Magic gone awry, the blessed are saying. If so, that's not all that went awry, Rosa said softly. Dimitri the butcher was helping me with the wounded. She paled. Some of them, some of the limbs, were crushed and could not be saved. He brought his big knife. She swallowed and put her hand to her mouth. Anton fetched her a mug of ale, and after a gulp she was able to go on. Dimitri has a shop on Gate Street, and before he left he saw a battle between the monks and one of their own. This monk was crazed, seemingly. He used his magic to topple a building near the wall. This all happened right after the explosion, what is even stranger is that this monk had a young woman with him, apparently helping him. The blessed are not talking about that, mind you. Do they think this lunatic caused the explosion that brought down the other buildings? That's what everyone is saying, and the blessed are not denying it. I trust they caught him. That is the truly strange part. Rosa dropped her voice to a little more than a whisper. The crazed monk was not so crazed but that he found the hidden gate and escaped. And the girl with him. Dimitri saw it with his own two eyes. Anton frowned and shook his head. That's impossible. The dragon would never permit it. I thought so too, but then something else happened. While Dimitri was talking to me, the monks came for him. Anton glanced at her sharply. Rosa gave a nod and emphasized the nod with a jab of her finger. I saw that with my own two eyes, husband. The blessed told Dimitri they had work for him to do. But what work could have been more important than what we were already doing, helping the injured? I think they took him away because they didn't like what he was saying. Where am I? came a voice. Rosa and Anton both jumped. Rising from the table, they hastened to the back part of the house. The girl was sitting up in the bed. You are in our home, child, said Rosa, her voice softening. I am Rosa, and this is Anton. She sat down on the edge of the bed and rested her hand on the girl's forehead. How do you feel? My head hurts the girl replied. 
She had a grave and solemn face, large, dark eyes that were clear and bright and bold. She was not shy around strangers, seemingly. What is your name, child? Dracon... The girl began, then stopped. Drake? Rosa questioned, not certain she'd heard right. Draca, the girl corrected. With an A. I was named for my father. His name was Drake. My parents were devoted to the dragon, she added, seeming to feel the need for explanation. Anton and Rosa exchanged glances. Where are your parents, Draca? Rosa asked. They must be worried about you. Anton will run fetch them and bring them here. My parents are both dead, Draca said in matter-of-fact tones. They died when I was little. The Abbey Orphanage, then, the Holy Sisters. At this, the girl threw off the blanket and started to climb out of bed. You've been very kind. I don't want to be any trouble. I'll be going. She went very pale, and her eyelids fluttered. Swaying on her feet, she put her hand to her head. I feel sick. Lie down, Draca, Rosa insisted, alarmed. She rested her hands on the girl's shoulders and eased her, unresisting, back onto the bed. I know you're afraid, but we won't tell anyone you are here. We promise. Don't we, Anton? He nodded to assure her. We understand, you see, Rosa added, smoothing back the hair from the girl's face. The girl regarded them both with a suspicious, wary expression, her eyes darting from one to the other. What do you understand? We know, or guess, what you are. You do? Draco was astonished. That you are a runaway, said Rosa gently. We won't make you go back. Not until you're ready. Runaway, Draco repeated. She sighed and sank down into the pillow. My head hurts. Can you tell me what happened? I don't remember. Memory loss is not unusual with a head wound, Rosa said softly to her husband. Tell her what you found. There was an explosion. You were lying in the wreckage of an abandoned house, Anton explained. The whole building had collapsed, the roof, the walls, everything. You should have been killed, but you weren't. You just got a bump on the head. When the beams fell down, they fell around you, not on top of you. Draca stared at him, unblinking. That was lucky. More than luck, Anton smiled. You used your magic to shield yourself from death. The blood bane. We know about the blood bane, Rosa added. Our daughter was one of the blessed. She was quite strong in it. Her voice softened. And we know that sometimes it can be hard for young girls to deal with such power. We know that sometimes they run away. Draca lowered her gaze in confusion. Her hands plucked nervously at the blanket. Please, don't tell the monks. We won't, dear, we won't. Now lie back and rest. Draca nestled down among the blankets. She closed her eyes and was soon breathing deeply and evenly. The two stood gazing down on her. It's good to have a young one to care for again, said Rosa with a tremulous smile. She reached out to take hold of her husband's hand. We can't keep her indefinitely, Anton said, drawing his wife near. Someone will be sure to find out, and then the monks will be coming for us. I know, Rosa said with a sigh. Just a day or two, that's all. No one will miss her in the confusion. Now you should go to bed, said her husband. Not yet. Rosa pulled the stool on which she sat when she was weaving over to the side of the bed. I'll stay up with her a bit. She might wake again and be frightened. Her husband kissed her on the top of her head. You're a good woman, wife. 
Rosa smiled, pleased. She drew the blanket around the girl's thin shoulders and tucked it in. Taking up some mending, she rested her back against the wall and began to hum a lullaby she had sung for their daughter. La, 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 lullaby, my sweet little baby, what meanest thou to cry? Lying in their bed, Anton realized he had not heard his wife sing in a long, long time. His eyes filled with tears. Five. When Grald arrived at the Abbey, Venn was conscious and alert, though he pretended not to be. He lay in bed with his eyes closed, stirring only when he heard his father's rough voice. How are you feeling, dragon's son? Grald asked. Venn did not answer immediately. Opening his eyes, he stared around the room, as though disoriented and confused. At last, he shifted his gaze to Grald, to the dragon, his father. Well enough, Venn made an effort to pull himself to a sitting position. Do not move, dragon's son, one of the monks warned, and laid a restraining hand on Venn's shoulder. Venn flashed the monk a look, and the man hastily drew back his hand. The monk is right. You should not be moving, Grald said solicitously. We must take care of that body of yours. A strange way to put it, Venn thought, but he let it go. He had more urgent matters to consider than his dragon father's odd choice of words. He could hear the dragon growled sniffing around outside the cavern of his son's mind, trying, as always, to find a way inside. Venn stood in the center, wrapped in the blazing whiteness that had no color. Thwarted in his efforts to pry apart Venn's mind, Grald was forced to ask for information. What happened to you, dragon's son? Who stabbed you? Was it your brother? Venn's lip curled slightly. As if Marcus had the guts. The girl, Evelina, she stabbed me. When I went to meet with my brother, she followed me. If you had not slain the monk who was given to you as guardian, that would not have happened, Grald interrupted. His heavy head lurched near, the hulking body crowded close, trying to use his bulk to intimidate. Venn did not flinch away. He looked the dragon in its human eyes. Guardian? He started to laugh, then grimaced in pain. He shifted slightly. The monks had wrapped cloth bandages around his ribs, and they constricted his breathing. The monk was a spy. Your spy on me. If he was, what did you have to hide that you needed to kill him? Venn was silent a moment, then said quietly, He was an annoyance, a nuisance, mad as a rabid skunk. I didn't like him. That was why I killed him. Far from being put out, Grald seemed to find this amusing. He gave a low chuckle, and dragging up a chair, settled himself at Venn's bedside. I don't like any of them, Venn continued, casting a venomous glance at the monk hovering near him. If they want to live, they'll stay away from me. Grald jerked his thumb, and the monk left gratefully, hastening from the room. Grald looked back at Venn, and his amusement evaporated. You sneaked off to meet your brother alone. That was stupid, as you found out. You should have been patient. I would have arranged a meeting between the two of you. Venn stared out the window. The sun was setting, pale yellow against pale blue, its colors muted, as though it were trying to slip away without anyone noticing. Marcus is my twin brother, a twin brother I never knew I had. I wanted to meet him alone. I had things to say to him in private. You wanted to warn him, you mean, said Grald. Warn him that I was going to slay him. Help him flee. I told you where to find him, Venn retorted. You could have come to claim him. It's not my fault you didn't. I was dealing with other matters, Grald muttered. 
such as Draconis? Ven asked. What do you know of Draconis? Grawl demanded, his eyes narrowing so that they almost disappeared in the shadow of the heavy brow. I know that he was here in the city. I know that he saved Marcus from your assassins. I know that he was using Marcus as bait to catch you, then remarked coolly. All very interesting, considering that you were using Marcus as bait to catch Draconis. What happened, Grald? Did you all end up catching each other? Is that why you blew up the city? The human growled regarded Ven in grim silence. The dragon growled, lurking outside the cave of Ven's mind, struck at him in anger and frustration. Ven stood in the white center of his mind, safe, unassailable. So why did you blow up the city, growled? Ven asked. And where is my brother? Where is Evelina? I wouldn't mind seeing her again. He pressed his hand over his wound. I owe her for this. You can contact your brother mind to mind, Growled said suddenly. You have that power, the same as dragons. Ask him yourself where he is. I don't think my dear brother will be eager to open his mind to me, Ven said dryly, not after what happened between us. What's wrong, Growled? Have you lost the prince? I'm asking the questions. Grald returned, somewhat belatedly. And this time I want answers. What happened when you met with your brother? What did he do? What did he say? Ven shrugged and lay back on the pillow. I met with Marcus. He was repulsed by the very sight of me. He loathed me from the start. A feeling that is mutual, by the way. He is what you might expect, a spoiled, pampered royal darling. I could tell that he wanted to be rid of me, but he had to keep me around, of course, so that you could walk into the trap he and Draconis had set for you. Then, Evelina showed up. She hid outside the door, eavesdropping on us, until she heard me refer to Marcus as a prince. Then, the mercenary little bitch nearly knocked the door down to throw herself into his arms. She told him what a beast I was how I killed her father and tried to rape her. My brother believed her, of course. To give him credit, he didn't intend for her to stab me. Marcus is soft and weak. He doesn't have the balls for that sort of thing. Killing me was all Evelina's idea. She flung herself on me like a wild cat. The last thing I remember was her driving her knife into my chest. The knife you gave her. Grald observed. That was my mistake, and I paid for it. And what happened then, dragon son? You tell me, dragon father. I heard an explosion. The next thing I knew, I woke up to find myself lying in a pool of my own blood underneath a house. Marcus and Evelina were gone. Outside, Everything was in chaos, with people yelling and screaming and digging bodies out of the rubble. No one was interested in me, so I crawled out of the wreckage and came back here. I must have passed out again, because the next I know, one of your lunatic monks is bending over me, babbling at me. I've answered your questions, Father. Now you can answer mine. Where is my brother? Where is Evelina? Were they killed in the explosion? And where is Draconis? I think I have a right to know, considering that all three want me dead. Grald was silent. Ven guessed the dragon was trying to decide how much to reveal, how much to keep to himself. You have nothing to fear from any of them, dragon's son, Grald said at last. You are right about your brother. The king's son is soft and weak and gullible. He is running back to the arms of his papa, and I will let him run. He has the girl with him. Soon, Grald's lips twisted in what passed with him for a smile, you will have your revenge on both of them. Good, Ven said, though he wondered what that meant. He waited, hoping Grald would fill in the details. 
As for any harm that might come to you, Grald continued, the monks will protect you, if you let them. Ven scowled and shook his head. Meanwhile, you must rest, return to health. When you are stronger, I will tell you everything you need to know. The dragon departed. He sent the monk back in. Ven ordered the monk back out, telling him to shut the door and leave him alone. The monk did as the dragon's son commanded. He didn't go far, however. Ven heard shuffling feet outside his door, two monks taking up their positions. At least two. Ven lay back down, exhausted by the mental struggle, as drained as if he and the dragon had battled physically, an unpleasant thought that gave him pause. Some day, if he was to fulfill his oath and avenge his mother, he would have to battle the dragon, a fight that would be both physical and mental. Ven had no idea how this was to be accomplished. He was not ready for such a battle. He knew enough about the dragon magic to defend himself against Grald, but that was all. Ven thought back to the time when Draconis had offered to teach him about the magic. The child, Ven, had refused. He didn't want the dragon magic that was part of him, as he didn't want the dragon legs the dragon claws, the dragon blood. He still didn't want it, any of it. The monks regarded him with supposed reverence, but he could see the fear and loathing in their eyes. The same fear and loathing that he'd seen briefly in Marcus's eyes. The same that he saw always in Evelina's eyes. Much as they loathed him, they could not loathe him as much as he loathed the dragon part of himself. He had to overcome that. The man, then, felt differently than the child. He had to learn how to use the magic. He would need it to destroy Grald. One thing Ven had learned, or at least guessed, from his mental battle with Grald, the dragon had no idea what had become of Draconis. Six. This was only the second session of the Parliament of Dragons the young female, Lycera, had ever attended. Honora's urgent summons to convene Parliament had come unexpectedly. Given the current crisis, the unexpected was only to be expected, or so Lycera concluded. She was pleased at the prospect of the meeting, not so much because of the meeting itself, although she found those fascinating. She was pleased because this meant she would have another chance to see the walker, Draconis. If Lycera had been a human female, her heart would have fluttered at the thought. Being dragon, Lycera's heart thudded calmly. Her dreams trembled. Dragons prefer to live their lives in isolation, free to dream their dreams alone and undisturbed. They come together to mate and raise their young, and that only grudgingly, for neither much enjoys the physical process of mating, and both are glad to have it done and over with as swiftly as possible. For dragons, love is the mating of two minds, not two bodies, the blending of two wondrous dreams, the merging of fantastic colors and delightful images. The true mating ritual takes place in the minds of the pair and may go on for years as they work together to build the nest that will house their young and create the elaborate labyrinthine illusions that baffle intruders and keep the young safe from harm until they are old enough to dream their own dreams. Lycera had been enchanted by the images she saw in Draconis's mind so different from those of other dragons. His view of the world was different, for he saw it at ground level. He saw the world walking. He walked with those strange creatures, humans. He spoke to them, touched them, had even learned to think like them. The minds of other dragons were like her own, filled with colors that were lovely, tranquil, serene, Draconis's colors, his human colors, were garish, 
jagged, jarring, ugly and beautiful, achingly beautiful. She'd had a glimpse into his mind during the last session of Parliament, and she had been shocked and disturbed and intrigued, so much so that she conjured up the images again and again as she lay dreaming in her cave. Lycera was the first dragon to arrive in the immense cavern in which the Parliament of Dragons was held. Honora arrived shortly thereafter. Embarrassed by her eagerness and abashed at being alone in the presence of this august and revered elder, Lycera kept her thoughts carefully neutral in tone. She paid her respects to the minister, dipping her head and raising her wings, then wondered uneasily what she was supposed to do now. Was she expected to make conversation until the others arrived? Lycera could think of a great many things she wanted to discuss, but all of them involved Draconis, and she was shy about bringing him up. Lycera made one or two half-hearted attempts to speak to the elder dragon. Lycera's colors were all pastel and muted, however, and Honora, preoccupied by her own raging thoughts, never noticed the wisps of spring green and rose pink that trailed from Lycera's mind. Honora settled herself at the front of the cavern. She glanced only once in the direction of the young female, and that glance was filled with sorrow, as though she foresaw some terrible fate about to befall the young dragon. The strange look from Honora made Lycera even more uncomfortable and she was thankful when the elder dragon wrapped her tail around her feet and shut her eyes, a sign that she was not to be disturbed. Lycera retreated into the darkest part of the cavern and tried to blend in with the stalagmites. Finally, the other dragons began arriving, and Lycera was forced to leave her shadows and greet them. The dragons were ill at ease and nervous, their colors shifting and blurring, of late they had come to dread these meetings of Parliament, for the news they were given just got progressively worse. All of them looked to Honora as they spiraled down through the fathomless darkness on barely moving wings. The sight of her, clenched tightly around herself, did nothing to reassure them. Alarm flew between the assembled dragons with such rapidity that Lycera swore she could almost hear the thoughts whir through the darkness like bat wings. Lycera dipped her head and raised her wings to each dragon in turn. She did not join in their mental conversations, however. Young dragons are, for the most part, to be seen and not heard, unless specifically invited to share their colors. Lycera might possibly have received an invitation from some of the young males. She had an impression of thoughts drifting her direction. She was distracted, however, listening for the arrival of one dragon, listening for the sound of human footfalls. Once the last dragon had arrived, Honora came out of her dark musings and called the Parliament to order. And still, Draconis did not come. Lycera took her place among the assembled heads of the houses of dragonkind and opened her mind to Honora's thoughts. I am sorry to have brought you here on such short notice, said Honora, her colors vibrant and trembling as from some long-suppressed emotion. But I have urgent news to impart to you, as well as a warning and a confession. We cannot proceed. We are missing a member. Where is Draconus? snapped Malfiesto. Malfiesto was old and crotchety and bad-tempered, and Lycera usually found him intensely annoying. Now her heart warmed toward him. She cast the elder male a glance of gratitude that brought beautiful memories of youth to the old dragon's mind, momentarily causing him to forget what he'd been talking about. He recalled soon enough, however. He is late again! Malfiesto continued. I say we issue a formal reprimand. I am not sure where Draconus is, said Honora, and this was true enough. I did not inform him of the meeting. I do not want him here. 
The assembled dragons went silent, their colors quivering. Lysira felt her own colors go bounding off the walls of the cavern, and she had to seize them and keep fast hold of them, not to betray her feelings of fear and disappointment to the others. He hasn't got himself killed, has he? asked Litard, a male dragon, in casual tones. No, Honora answered. I do not believe he is dead. Lysira's relief was heartfelt, if short-lived. I believe that he has gone rogue. Silence! Honora blared, her colors red and blazing. Silence, all of you, and listen to me. We don't have much time, and there is a great deal that needs to be decided. Not since the Dragon Wars have we faced such a crisis. Our lives, and what is more important, the lives of our young. Here she looked again at Lysira with that inexplicable sadness, are in the most dire peril. She had their attention now, their complete attention. Litard, for once, ceased grooming his flashy green scales and exclaimed loudly in astonishment. Mantis, his colors murky as always, was silent, unmoving, waiting for events to unfold. Jinnat, who always seemed to bear some unknown sorrow, nodded gloomily as though he'd foreseen this all along. Arat grinned. He disliked humans, and he disliked Draconis. Malfiesto's eyes narrowed. Draconis came from the noble house ruled by Malfiesto, though you could not have told it, given that the elder dragon was never pleased by anything Draconis did. Lysira saw that Malfiesto was more concerned by this news than he let on. He didn't roar or rage, as she might have expected. He had gone extremely still and quiet. The seven other rulers of the noble houses were females. Dykstra the Silver was near the age of Honora and Maristara. Dykstra had known both dragons in their youth, and according to her, had not been shocked by Maristara's actions in seizing and enslaving a nation of humans. Dykstra had never seen the need for a walker, and always refused to take part in the spell-casting that created the supreme illusion. She snorted, as though this was only to be expected. Rael was a middle-aged dragon, who, far different from most dragons, thought very highly of her powers of creativity and conversation, and was always inflicting her dreams on others. She did not like humans either, having once caught a human intruder in her cave— once when her children were still in the egg, as the saying went. The human had never come near the baby dragons, but Rael had been outraged, and to this day would go on and on about it, if encouraged. Alicia was also middle-aged, but far different from Rael, being serious, grave, introspective. Alicia never spoke during a session, never demanded the speaker's rod, never asked a question. She listened intently and took in everything, giving no indication of her thoughts. Neonan liked humans. She had wanted to be a walker in her youth, but had not been chosen, and it was rumored, though no one knew for certain, that she used her illusions to lure humans to her cave for the pleasure of observing them. She was, like Malfiesto, regarding Honora with grim suspicion. The last of the rulers, Shryreth, looked half asleep. But then she always looked that way. She was said to have a violent temper, though Lysira found that hard to credit. All of you know that the rogue dragon, Maristara, seized the human kingdom of Seth many hundred years ago, Honora was saying. She has been ruling the humans secretly, in the guise of a human, and she and her male consort, a lesser dragon known as Grald, experimented with the breeding of humans, mingling their blood with the blood of dragons. 
You all know that they produced humans who have dragon magic in their blood. You know, for Draconus informed you at the last meeting, that he had discovered a city known as Dragon Keep, where Grald and Maristara were holding these humans, a city kept hidden from both humans and dragons by supreme illusions. And you know, for again, Draconus told you, that Grald and Maristara have a spy in Parliament who is feeding them information. Thus, they were prepared to repulse the dragons when they attacked Seth to try to free the humans. Thus, Grald knew our secret plans for the human female Melisande. The information the spy gave him provided Grald with the opportunity to breed with this human, a union that produced a son. The dragons did not stir. Not a tail twitched, not a wing rustled. The rocks in the cavern were not so still as the assembled members of Parliament. I am going to reveal the identity of the betrayer, Honora began. Draconus! The name hissed in the minds of the assembled dragons. Honora shook her head. You! said Malfiesto, and he spoke aloud, something dragons rarely do. Lysira didn't believe him, any more than she had believed the others about Draconus. The idea was ludicrous, and she almost laughed, until she saw Honora's eyes, saw the shadow of conscious guilt pierced by glinting defiance. You are right, Honora replied. I betrayed our plans to Maristara and Grald. I reluctantly sanctioned the killing of Brayard and his son Braun. You condemn me now, I know that. But hear my reasons, and then you will thank me. Never! Lysira let go her rage in an explosion of anger and grief. Braun had been her brother, Brayard her father. You admit to murder! Silence, young one! ordered Honora sternly. Be silent and listen! Lysira wasn't going to be silent. She was going to bellow her rage until the walls of the cavern split asunder. She was going to fly at Honora and attack her with claw and tooth and thunderous magic. She was... Calm came colors, blue and soothing as the cold waters of a plunge into a lake. Keep calm and do as the minister says. Listen. Draconis! Lysira trembled inside, trembled with the force of her emotions, grief and fury vying with pleasure and confusion at reading his thoughts. But she killed Braun. Hush, Draconis warned. Give no sign that I am with you. Let my mind merge with yours. Keep your colors gray. I need to hear what Honora tells the Parliament, and she must not know I am listening. Lysira obeyed, her mind in such turmoil that while not exactly gray, her colors were so muddied that even she could not tell quite what she was thinking. I know this is a shock for you, Lysira, Honora was saying, and I was truly, truly grieved that I had to do what I did. Please, Listen to what I have to say in my defense. Lysira gave an abrupt nod of her head. The other dragons would think she was barely able to control herself for her fury, and that was almost true, for anger bubbled inside her. But the ugly acid was mixed with a sweet warmth, knowing Draconis was so close to her, and that he trusted her and was depending on her. Lysira dug her claws into the rock floor of the cave and waited to hear Honora. 
For thousands upon thousands of years, the minister began, we have watched humans evolve, grow, and develop. We have not interfered with their progress. Indeed, we passed strict laws to prevent such interference. To help enforce those laws and to keep a watchful eye upon this fragile species, we asked one of our own to sacrifice himself, to take on human form and live and walk among them. We watched over the humans, protected them, nurtured them, all without their knowledge. Occasionally there would be interaction between us. A young hot blood would forget himself and carry off a few cattle or set fire to a barn, but such incidents were few and, I must admit, tended to benefit us more than harm us. For centuries, humans have feared us, held us in awe. Humans have long told stories of how their heroes attacked and even killed dragons. But those tales are just that. Tales, myths, legends. No human was capable of slaying one of us. Honora's colors grew dark and grieving. But that? is about to change. What are you saying? Malfiesto demanded, scoffing. That humans now have the power to kill dragons? Preposterous! Once it was preposterous, said Honora gravely. Not anymore. When a human first picked up a stick, we envisioned the spear. When a human flung a rock, we foresaw the catapult. When a human dug iron out of the ground, we saw the sword in his hand. Such puny weapons could never be a threat to us, and so we did not concern ourselves with them. We slept in our caves and wove our dreams of tranquility and peace— but these dreams have been shattered by the cannon's blast. Bah! Malfiesto scoffed. That puffed-up piece of iron mongery. Humans do more damage to themselves than to any of us. That is true now, Honora agreed, and maybe it will be true a hundred years from now, but inevitably such weapons will be a threat. As we saw the spear from the stick, so I foresee a terrible human weapon that will have the capability of blowing apart a mountain, of slaughtering us while we sleep, of destroying the nests of our young, no matter how well they are hidden. Images of fiery death flared in Honora's mind, images of caves that required hundreds of years of patient carving, blown apart in an instant. Images of labyrinthine passages sliding down crumbling mountainsides. Images of eggs smashed and the young dragons crushed beneath tons of rock. For the first time in our long history, said Honora, I see the possibility of our extinction. And it will be at the hands of humans. Is this true, Draconis? Lysira cried in silent dismay. Do humans have such power? His colors were dark for long moments, and fear gripped Lysira's heart, for she knew the answer before she saw it in his mind. They do not have such power now, but soon. 7. The dragons were either shocked and outraged at Honora's words, or shocked and disbelieving. Their thoughts flew about the cavern, spattering the walls and each other with the colors of fire and blood, almost as if one of the explosive devices had landed in their midst. Honora did not try to call for order. No one would have seen her colors in the storm of emotion roaring about the cavern. But what can we do to stop the humans? Lysira asked Draconis. Humans are not ours to stop, 
he returned. Lysira bristled at his tone. I don't know how you can be so flippant. Careful, Draconis warned. She is watching you. The tumult was dying down. Lysira saw Honora's gaze fixed upon the young female. Small tendrils of thought coiled toward her. Lysira made her own mind a flutter of confusion. Not difficult, with so many conflicting emotions flapping about like birds tangled in a net. Lysira had the impression that Honora was asking for her forgiveness and her understanding. Lysira could not grant that. Not yet. She hunkered down and avoided the elder dragon's thoughts. Honora brought the meeting back to order. I made plans, she began. Without consulting us, Malfiesto thundered. I couldn't, Honora returned, blazing up, because of Draconus. The walker? It seems to me he would be central to any plans you made regarding humans. The walkers were sent to live among humans in order to provide us with information about them, their habits, their way of life, and so forth. Walkers proved quite useful in this regard. I have noticed, however, that the longer they live among humans, the more human the walkers become. They begin to empathize with the humans. They lose their detachment, become emotionally involved. Usually we are able to catch walkers before they do harm to us. We remove the walker from his or her position and assign another. It is what I should have done with Draconus. Honora sighed deeply. But he was the best walker we've ever created. He maintained his detachment. Or so I thought. I wonder now if he was lying all this time. Lying to me? Lying to himself? She waved it away with a claw. That is all past. What's done is done, as the humans say. So, you foresee that humans are going to cannonade us into extinction, Malfiesto said caustically. Forgive me if I fail to understand how breeding humans with dragons and thereby giving them even more power is supposed to save us. I will explain. It all began with Brayard. As she spoke, Honora deliberately kept her gaze away from Lysira, who steeled herself to listen and be silent. Through Grawl's bungling, Brayard learned about the smuggling of male babies out of Seth. He suspected the existence of a city such as Dragon Keep, although I do not think he ever found it. He told me what he knew and insisted that I bring up the matter before the Parliament. If I would not, he said that he would. That could not be allowed to happen. The revelation that we had been breeding humans to use dragon magic would have caused an uproar among all dragon kind. The dragons muttered, their colors black and tinged with fire. Hear me out, Honora demanded and she waited until they settled down. He would have brought our plans to ruin. For the sake of the many, he had to be sacrificed. And so he was. No one was ever supposed to find out. Grawled killed Brayard and made the murder look like an accident, as if the dragon had lost his way in a storm and crashed into a mountain. All would have been well, but that Brayard's son, Brawn, was the inquisitive sort. He did not believe that his father could have been so reckless. Prior to his death, Brayard assured me that he had not spoken to anyone regarding his suspicions. I now know that he must have mentioned at least some of what he suspected to his son. How much, I'm not sure but at least enough to cause Braun to fly to Seth 
with some scheme of trying to warn the humans about what was happening. The women of Seth, skilled in the use of dragon magic, very nearly killed Braun. He managed to escape, and he returned and told his tale to anyone who would listen. He wanted to stir up trouble, believing that the truth about the murder of his father would then float to the surface. You know what happened. Draconis was sent to try to deal with Maristara. He was to take a human male, a king of his people, to Seth to meet the mistress of dragons and persuade her to leave Seth. From that point on, nothing went right. Grald lost his nerve and sent out his magic-wielding monks to destroy Draconis. These lunatics did far more harm to us than they did to Draconis, for they alerted him to the fact that humans had been given dragon magic. Maristara did not abandon the worn-out human body as swiftly as she should have, with the lamentable result that two humans, as well as Draconis, stumbled upon Maristara's secret of body-switching. We had to act fast to repair the damage that had been done. Fortunately, Draconis provided us with the means. He came up with the idea of the human king mating with the human female, a high priestess of Seth, producing a son that would be strong in the dragon magic, a son who would then be sent in to deal with Maristara. Draconis later abandoned that plan, but Grald and I saw how it could be useful to us. I persuaded Draconis to go through with it. The humans mated, and the female was impregnated. Then Grald also planted his seed in the human female, impregnating her with a child that would be half human, half dragon. Even that went awry. Grald's orders were to abduct the human female and carry her safely to Dragon Keep before impregnating her. But he could not control the lust of the human body in which he is housed. Still, all would have been well if Draconis had obeyed my orders. He was supposed to bring the two babies to me. He took it upon himself to defy me, however. He had developed a bond with these humans, and he felt guilty about being the cause of the death of the mother. And he now knew that there was someone in Parliament in collusion with the dragons. He felt he could trust no one among us. He was right, Malfiesto growled. Honora ignored him. Grald feared that Braun had discovered the location of Dragon Keep. Whether that was true or not, we'll never know. We couldn't chance it. He argued that Braun had to die, and reluctantly, I agreed. I was afraid that Braun's death would only increase Draconis's suspicions, which it did. He tried to keep the children hidden from us. An impossible task, for they had the dragon magic in their blood, and that meant that sooner or later they must open their minds to us. Grald and I found the half-dragon child, but Draconis intervened before we could capture him and spirit him away. Draconis warned the child against using the magic, and, wonder of wonder, the child obeyed him at least until he reached manhood and found himself in trouble. Then he turned to his father. Grald discovered his half-dragon son and rescued him from humans, who thought he was devil-spawn or some such superstitious nonsense. The other child, the king's son, went insane, as do so many human males with the dragon magic and we hoped he would die and we would not have to worry about him. But Draconis meddled in this and saved the boy. Not only that, Draconis taught him how to use the magic. The boy grew to manhood and is one of the strongest in dragon magic we have produced. And 
one of the most dangerous, Honora added grimly, for the prince has the ability to enter the minds of dragons, something no human has ever been capable of doing before. Worse yet, the king of this human nation, reacting out of ignorance and fear, began to develop the first human weapon built specifically to slay dragons. The weapon is not a threat to us, of course. One blast of fire will melt it where it stands. For the first time in our history, however, humans are actually daring to take a stand against us. Again, due to Draconus's conniving, the prince Marcus found the location of Dragonkeep. The king will undoubtedly lead his human armies against this city. Our plans are endangered. The lives of all dragonkind are threatened. We must act. You keep speaking of plans, Honora. Malfiesto interrupted, using the dragon's name, not her august title of prime minister. What plans are these? I think we have a right to know. And were you party to the two dragons' criminal behavior all along? To answer your last question first, no. I was not party to what Grald and Maristara were planning. I was as furious as you when I heard that they had seized a human kingdom. That was before I knew the danger humans posed to us, however. When I became aware of that threat, it seemed to me that Maristara and Grald had the right idea. Use the dragon magic in their blood to control the humans, rule over them, prevent them from creating these terrible weapons. Not only will this benefit us, Honora argued, such a prohibition will also benefit the humans. Let us face facts. Humans first invented these horrible weapons to kill large numbers of their own kind. We will stop them from harming each other, as well as ourselves. In the future, when humans come to view our intervention rationally, they will thank us. Thank us for enslaving them, Draconis muttered in Lysira's mind. Some of the dragons were nodding sagely, evidently favoring Honora's position. Others glowered, not pleased with what they were hearing. Among them, Malfiesto, which surprised Lysira, for his dislike of humans was well known. Lysira did not know what to feel. She was terrified of the destructive force of the humans' weapons, yet she was troubled by the idea of dragons making humans a slave race, as Draconis was saying. She grieved over the loss of her brother and was furious at how casually Honora spoke of slaying him. Yet, Braun had always been a troublemaker, a meddler. If only he'd let well enough alone. Now she was the last of their noble house, and if what Honora said was true, her children might be among the last dragons ever born. She momentarily lost track of what Honora was saying and caught hold of the thread in the middle. For two hundred years, I have been working with Grald and Maristara, developing our plans in secret. We hoped, at least I hoped, that we would never be forced to use such drastic measures. I hoped that the human inventions would fail and that they would grow weary of pursuing them. I underestimated the human desire for conquest and power. As for the nature of our plans, I cannot reveal them to you. The dragons muttered at this. Tails snapped in irritation, wings rustled, claws scraped. By law, Prime Minister, said Malfiesto, you are required to tell us. I have broken so many laws, old friend, that one more will not matter, Honora replied. And I am no longer your prime minister. I resign from that post. Who will side with me? 
Dragons spit and snarled, snapped and roared. Heads swooped down in fighting stance, wings lifted, tails thrashed. Malfiesto bellowed, actually using his voice, something unheard of, to try to make the other dragons see reason. Three of the young males, incensed, flew off. Two of the females left with them. Others remained behind to argue and debate. There's nothing more you can do here, said Draconis, and Lysira, thankfully, left. Once outside, she lifted her wings and soared into a night spattered with stars. She breathed deeply of the fresh air and felt better. Where are you, Draconis? she asked, free at last to speak openly with him. I am here, he said, in your mind. Whenever you want me, this is where you will find me. I mean, physically, where are you? Lysira persisted. It is better that you do not know, Draconis replied. Not that I do not trust you, Lysira, but two members of your family have already died by violence. I do not want to risk a third death, especially of someone I care about. Lysira's colors shimmered, dazzling her with their brilliance. I can use your help, however, Draconis continued. I need eyes to see and ears to hear, but only if you are willing. You mean only if I agree with your side of things, said Lysira slowly. I'm not sure I do agree, Draconis. What Honora said frightens me. Honora has been blinded by fear, Lysira. She is able to see only one path, a path that leads to doom. Many paths exist, and some are bright with sunlight. Lysira did not immediately reply. She watched the ground skim beneath her. Humans were small as ants in her sight, and they could not see her at all. She realized suddenly that she'd never seen a human except from this vast distance. I will be your eyes, Draconis, Lysira agreed. It is time that I looked at the world. But I want you to know beforehand that I will never do anything to betray our people, even if that means going against someone I care about. What do you need me to do? I need to know what has happened to the king's son, Marcus. I do not dare try to contact him, for Honora and the others are searching for him, and if they find him, they will kill him. This is what he looks like. An image of a human came to Lysira's mind. Youthful, comely, with fair hair and hazel eyes. He did not, she was forced to admit, look like a monster. And... What do I do when I find this human? Lysira asked. Warn him, said Draconis. Warn him that he and his people are in danger. And he will use his cannons to try to slay us, said Lysira sadly. She shook her head. I do not think, Lysira, said Draconis gently, persuasively. Growled does not mean to make these humans slaves. He means to slaughter them. Lysira kept her colors to herself. Please, Lysira, you said yourself, our people have gone mad with fear. We have a chance to stop the madness. Dragons are always loath to take action. I will think about it, Draconis, Lysira said. Eight. Night stretched dark across the river. The water slipped out from underneath him. The river flowed ever onward, uncaring about the vagaries of time. Marcus steered the boat nearer the sunken cavern, and his fears grew, compounded by the fact that he had no idea how far he was from the cavern. The first and last time Marcus had traveled the river had been during the night. He had not been paying attention to his surroundings during that first journey. His attention had been divided between keeping an eye on the boats of the monks ahead and watching for snags and other dangers in the river. He had very little reckoning of the passage of time, 
how long it had taken him and Bellona to travel from the sunken cavern to the site of Dragon Keep. Had it been minutes or hours? He looked back on that night, and he couldn't be certain. His rowing slowed. He thought he detected a change in the air, a different smell, one that was not of green and growing things, but the smell that he remembered from the cave, a smell of wet rock and slime. He felt a change in the temperature as well, a chill, musty breath flowing from a gaping mouth. Evelina felt it too, for she began to rummage about for one of the blankets she'd scrounged. Wrapping it around her shoulders, she huddled into it. What a horrible stench, she complained. It smells of death. Marcus shifted direction, rode toward the shoreline. Catch hold of that branch, he told Evelina. Are we stopping? she asked eagerly, unwinding herself from the blanket long enough to do as he said. She grabbed hold of the branch, and the boat swiveled around to nose gently in among a shadowy tangle of reeds and rushes and willow trees. Just for a little while, he answered. I want to wait until long after midnight to enter the cave. Evelina gave a little screech. As if it won't be terrifying enough. You're going to make it easy for the monks to catch us. Hush, keep quiet, Marcus warned. I don't want anyone to see us or hear us. I'm not going to make finding us easy for anyone. He planned to use his magic to conceal the boat from view, cast an illusion over it, so that anyone looking at the boat would see only dark, flowing water. Such illusions never work, Draconis had once warned him. Someone always sneezes. But Marcus could think of no other way to avoid the monks if they were in the cave. He shipped the oars and tied the boat up securely. The boat bobbed gently in the water. He picked up one of the blankets, toyed with it a moment as he thought over what he had to do. I hate to ask this of you, he began. Ask me, said Evelina. Please, I will do anything. He regarded her steadily. I am going to use my magic to hide us and the boat. He paused, waiting for her reaction. She continued to gaze at him. Yes, she said. Go on. You're not afraid of the magic? He asked hesitantly. No, of course not, she told him. Why should I be afraid of you? His heart warmed to her. No flinching, no shrinking away, no talk of devil's work, just calm acceptance. I am very tired, and I must be strong and well-rested to use the magic. You need to sleep. Of course, said Evelina briskly. Go ahead. You sleep, and I'll keep watch. You don't mind? She shook her head. I only wish I could do more. Marcus drew near Evelina and kissed her on the cheek. Thank you, he said. Evelina blushed and lowered her eyes. Marcus lay down as best he could in the bottom of the boat. Evelina fussed over him, making a pillow of another blanket for his head and helping him to find the most comfortable of uncomfortable positions. Closing his eyes, Marcus gave himself to the rocking motion of the boat. The confusion one feels as the mind sinks slowly into sleep stole over him, so that he was rowing again. And then he had no oars, but he was still rowing, and the boat slid into darkness. Evelina put her hand to her cheek. She could still feel Marcus's kiss as though it had burned her like the hot irons they used to brand the mark of shame on prostitutes. Evelina was pleased with herself. She had recovered, in a few moments, all the ground she'd lost with Marcus during the trip. She sat with her chin in her hands, thinking back to their conversation. He'd been pleased when she'd told him she wasn't afraid of the magic. Well, she thought, why should she be afraid of it? She didn't believe it any of it. Seeing is believing, the old saw went, except that it wasn't. 
Evelina had known the truth of that from the time she was a very small girl and she'd watch her father swindle the gullible with a bean under a walnut shell. See the bean? I'll put the shell over it. Three shells. The bean's under one of them. See it? Yes, there it is. Now I'll just switch the shells around. Are you following the one with the bean under it? Yes, sir, I can see that you are. You are a man of perception, sir. Now I'll bet you money, sir, that you can't tell me which shell the bean is under. Of course, I'll lose you being so very perceptive, sir, but it's an honor playing with someone so keen-sighted. That shell, sir, are you sure, sir? Well, 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 I guess you weren't watching so closely after all, sir. You owe me. Of course, the secret was that the bean wasn't under any of the shells. Ramon had palmed the bean before the game started and slipped it back before it ended, sliding it under one of the walnut shells as he lifted it to shift it about. A trick to fool the gullible. Nothing wrong with it. All men and women were tricksters and liars. One had to be to survive. Even Marcus, a prince, the man Evelina loved as she'd never loved anyone else in her short life, with the exception of Evelina. She had no illusions about him. Evelina had seen all manner of fantastic things in Dragon Keep. A monk with hands made of blazing fire, snow falling on a warm day in the morning sunshine, Marcus bringing down a building by pointing at it. She'd seen herself walk through a solid stone wall, Wonderful tricks, all of them. She could make a fortune with such fakery by taking it on the road, like that poor sod Glimmershanks. She didn't know how the tricks were done, but that didn't matter. Before Ramon had taught her the secret of the shell game, she'd thought the bean had really vanished. Evelina didn't know or care how Marcus's tricks worked. She was determined to win this game of love. And if this meant that she had to pretend to believe the bean disappeared, it was a small price to pay for the jewels and the castle and her son being an abbot. He can lie to me about magic all he wants, murmured Evelina, gazing at Marcus fondly as he lay sleeping at her feet. Just as long as he lies with me. Her little joke amused her for all of several seconds, and then she yawned and slapped irritably at a mosquito and looked around at the river, which held nothing new for her, and at the trees, and there was nothing interesting about them either. She heaved an audible sigh and glanced at Marcus, half hoping he'd hear her and wake up. He didn't stir, and she realized he was deep in slumber. After all... He needs his rest, she reflected, if he's going to get us safely through that horrible cave. Why do we have to go that way anyhow? There are lots of other routes we can take to his home. His home, his castle. I wonder how many rooms it has. Dozens, probably. And food that goes on forever. Peacock tongues and suckling pig and wine from golden goblets and servants to wait on me and sweetmeats and sugared almonds and why, why, why did I have to think about food? Her stomach grumbled. Evelina tried to recall when she'd last eaten. She remembered Ven bringing food to her and she remembered flinging it to the floor in a fit of temper. Henceforth, she resolved, she would make certain she ate first before she flew into a rage. And then all she could think about was being hungry. Evelina had been hungry before in her life, very hungry. Sometimes, when one of her father's schemes had failed to produce any income, she looked again at Marcus, bending over him, greatly daring, because the boat rocked alarmingly whenever she moved, she kissed him on the mouth. She let her tongue slide over his lips and was gratified to feel his lips move ever so slightly in response. Evelina sighed and sat back, her blood tingling. Wrapping herself in her blanket, she gave herself up to tantalizing daydreams of their lovemaking. When even that grew boring, she yawned and yawned again, and again after that. Her eyelids drooped. 
she slid into sleep and then sat up with a start. I said I'd keep watch, she reminded herself. But I'm so tired. No one is coming for us. We're safe enough. It's not fair that he gets to sleep and I don't. I'll just shut my eyes a moment. Having absolved herself from blame, Evelina closed her eyes and drifted into sweet slumber. Thus it was that the dragon found them. Fortunately for them, the dragon was Lycera. Draconis had provided Lycera with directions to the hidden city of Dragonkeep. She couldn't see it, though she looked hard for it. She did see the boats of the monks drifting down the river, however, evidence of human habitation. He'd warned her against flying too low, a warning she ignored, for she had to fly low in order to investigate. The humans weren't in any of the boats heading downstream. Draconis thought they would be traveling the other direction, and he proved to be right. Lycera spotted the two between a gap in the trees. Their warm human bodies glowed softly in the night. Your humans are not very intelligent, she reported to Draconis. Surrounded by their foes, they are both sound asleep. Are they surrounded? Draconis asked, alarmed. No, Lycera returned, but according to what you said, they could be. Have you seen any sign of other dragons? None. Grald could still be hiding in the cave, waiting for them, Draconis said more to himself than to her. Are you keeping your distance? Yes, Draconis, returned Lycera, her colors sharp-edged with annoyance. I am not a fledgling. The truth was, Lycera had decided to satisfy her curiosity about the humans. Draping herself in a simple illusion to make herself invisible, she descended from her lofty vantage point in slow, lazy circles. She kept watch as she drifted downward on her strong wings, but saw nothing to give her concern. Animals prowled the forest. Birds flitted about the skies. They could not see her. And so the fox continued his rabbit hunt and the nightjar her bug catching without raising the alarm. Lycera hovered above the tops of the trees and gazed down curiously on the two creatures in the boat. Sleeping, all humans look as innocent and harmless as nestlings. And they were so fragile and vulnerable, their bodies soft and unprotected, their soft mouths with tiny teeth and talons with weak little claws, no wings to carry them out of harm's way. No fire rumbling in their bellies to scorch their enemies. It was a wonder they had survived thus far. She could understand why they had to rely on terrible machines. So weak. So pitiably weak. What if Grald is waiting for them in the cave, Draconis? Lycera asked. What am I to do? Nothing. You cannot fight Grald. It would be madness to try. He very nearly bested me in battle. Draconis admonished sharply. You would have no chance against him. And your humans? What chance do they have? Lycera demanded. More than you might think. No matter what happens, you must stay out of it. Not just for your own sake, but for the sake of our people. You are my only link with the other dragons now, Lycera. We must keep your involvement secret. Promise me you will not interfere if there is trouble. Promise. I don't see what right you have asking me for promises, Lycera retorted, bristling. I have no right, Draconis conceded, except as someone who cares about you. Cares very much. Lycera's colors blurred in confusion. She didn't know what to say, and so she said nothing. And by the time she thought of something, he was gone. Lycera soared triumphantly into the evening sky. She could have fought Grald or a hundred like him in that moment of happiness. She did not forget her charges, and from her vantage point she cast an eye on the humans, ant-like, in the boat on the river that wound snake-like among the trees 
and she thought how deceptively serene and peaceful the chaotic world of men looked from this vast distance up among the stars. Nine. Marcus woke with a start to pitch darkness, noisy with the songs of frogs and crickets, to find Evelina lying across his feet. He tried to recall what had awakened him, but he'd been so deeply asleep that he couldn't distinguish dream from reality. He had either heard the swishing sound of something creeping along the shoreline, or he'd dreamed it. He froze, not moving, barely breathing, thinking that if he was quiet, whatever was out there might try to sneak up on him, and he'd have the advantage of surprise. He heard nothing except Evelina, who muttered something and rolled over, causing the boat to rock. He waited a few more moments. He couldn't wait long, however, for he was afraid that Evelina might wake and inadvertently say or do something that would reveal their hiding place. Marcus rose up slowly and stealthily. He slid one arm beneath Evelina's head, and he placed his hand very gently over her mouth. Evelina, he said softly. He expected her to jump and gasp or scream, which was why he had his hand over her mouth. What he did not expect, was for her to nibble at his fingers, murmur something unintelligible, and nestle more deeply into his embrace. Evelina, wake up, he said again. She snuggled closer. Her breath was warm and moist on his hand. Kiss me, she whispered. Evelina, he said, please. Her eyelids fluttered. She stretched languorously, arching her back and flexing her arms behind her head. Soft, full parts of her brushed against him. Her lips licked his fingers, and the touch of her lips and her body sent desire aching through his body. I'm awake, she said, and her eyes opened. She gazed at Marcus. Then she pushed him back and sat up with a suddenness that set the boat rocking wildly. Oh, she gasped, clutching at her chemise. I'm sorry, he gasped in turn. Drawing back, he felt guilt-ridden and confused. I didn't mean... I was only trying... I was afraid you might cry out. Evelina hung her head. No, I'm sorry she said, her voice soft as the night. What must you think of me? I was dreaming. She blushed so deeply that he could see her flush even in the lambent starlight. Please forgive me, your highness. Not knowing what else to do, he patted her hand soothingly, all the while keeping watch in the woods. Is there something out there? she asked, noticing his preoccupation and clutching his hand tightly in alarm. I thought I heard a noise, but it may have been an animal. I haven't heard it again. He gently disengaged his hand. We should be going. I didn't mean to sleep so long. I didn't mean to sleep at all, said Evelina remorsefully. It's just I was so tired. He soothed and petted her again and thought about the spell he was going to cast on the boat. How do your hands feel after all that rowing? Evelina asked suddenly. Like raw meat, he said ruefully. I'm so sorry, said Evelina, and her eyes shimmered in the starlight. When we stop to rest, I will make a poultice to put on them. You will have to leave it on for several days and not do any more rowing. But it will heal them, and when they are healed, we can continue our journey. A kind thought, but we don't have time, said Marcus. He was busy constructing the magic in his mind. I was thinking, Marcus, this may be unseemly of me to offer, but if I 
tore off some strips of the hem of my chemise. You could use them to bandage your hands. It might help a little. That's a good idea. He knew what he had to do, and he turned his attention to her. If you don't mind... I don't mind. Evelina lifted her skirt and folded it back over her knees. Marcus realized, a bit belatedly, that a gentleman should turn his head away. And he did so. But he took with him the image of shapely legs, white in the starlight. He heard fabric rip and tear. And when she told him he could turn around, she held up two long strips. She wrapped Marcus's hands herself, apologizing profusely for the fact that the cloth was travel-stained and frayed. That feels better already, he said, as she was carefully winding the cloth around and around his blistered palms. I'll have my mother's seamstresses make you a new chemise when we reach my home, made of the finest silk. He had only a vague idea what chemises were made of, but silk seemed safe. With a hem of lace. I would like that, Marcus, said Evelina, and her hand stroked his hand gently as she finished her bandaging. He was embarrassed by the adoration in her eyes, and he turned away. He wished she wouldn't look at him that way, when he didn't know how he felt about her. We should get started. We're going into that cave, said Evelina, and her voice was tight. It's going to be all right. Marcus drew in a deep breath, then let it out slowly. I'm going to cast a magical spell on the boat, Evelina. I'm going to make it invisible, and I'm going to make us invisible. Not to each other, he added hastily. You'll still be able to see me and to see the boat, but no one else will be able to see us. He was making a mess of this, but he'd never had to explain his magic to anyone before. I know you don't understand, he began. Understand what? That you are going to make us invisible? Of course I understand. Evelina settled herself in the stern, pulled the blanket more closely around her shoulders, and regarded him calmly. Just tell me what I need to do. He found himself almost loving her at that moment. You must keep perfectly still and not make a sound, not a sniffle, not a gasp, not a whisper, for though they cannot see us, they can still hear us. They can't see us, but they can hear us. I understand, Marcus, she said. In order to cast the magic, he would have to enter his little room, a room in his mind similar to the room where he had been locked up as a child. The danger was that whenever he entered the room, the dragons were aware of him. They would try to catch him, haul him out. And so he opened the door swiftly and ran inside and slammed the door shut behind him. Almost immediately, he could hear claws scraping and scratching outside, searching for weakness, searching for a chink, a crack. Marcus sat on the small stool in the middle of the room, shut out the clawing, and considered what he had to do. He'd never cast a spell of such magnitude before, not in cold blood. He knew how to do it. Draconis had taught him, long ago, on the bank of a river. There are two types of dragon magic, Marcus, like two types of strategy in a battle, offensive and defensive. From what I have observed watching the monks, humans can use either one or the other. The determining factor as to which they can use appears to be sex. Females can use defensive magic, males offensive. You are unique in that you can use both. Outside the door, the dragon snorted in frustration. Marcus forced himself to concentrate, to forget the dragon. He brought the image of the boat to mind, so that it was like a wet painting on a canvas, and he began to scrub it with water. 
so that the colors streamed and ran together and dribbled off the canvas in muddy droplets. He scrubbed and scrubbed until the image of the boat vanished. Looking at the painting, he saw the river, and he saw the black net of tree branches catching the stars in the sky, but no boat, no Marcus, no Evelina. He sighed deeply. He could tell by the contented warmth of pleasure that the magic had worked. The weakness and the sick feeling would come later, hopefully much later, after they'd managed to sneak through the cavern. Marcus picked up the oars and, wincing at the pain in his hands, began to row. Evelina opened her mouth. Marcus shook his head, reminding her she must be silent are we invisible now? she whispered. Marcus nodded. Evelina glanced around at the boat, which was plainly visible, and at herself, and at him. Good job, she whispered solemnly. I can't see a thing. Marcus smiled, thinking she was joking to relieve the tension. He continued to row, and the boat rounded the bend of the river. There it is, Evelina cried in a smothered voice that she remembered just in time to keep soft. She pointed. Marcus glanced over his shoulder. The river flowed into a black maw. Chill, dank air washed over them. Evelina shivered and cast him a pleading glance that said quite plainly, It's not too late to turn around and go back. He knew those words because he was hearing them inside his head. He kept on rowing. The black maw came nearer and nearer, spewing out the river, sucking them in. The rock cliff loomed above them, blotting out the stars. He listened, but heard only the soft gurgle of the river water roiling around the base of the stone walls. Grald might be in there, crouched in the darkness, waiting, or perhaps a cadre of monks, their hands tipped with fire, deadly bolts ready. Whatever eyes were watching would not be able to see him. He reminded himself of that and continued to row. The maw came closer. He was rowing as quietly as he could, but the oars made plashing noises as they entered the water, and there was nothing he could do to muffle them. The river's flow was not very strong here, and he hoped that one mighty pull would give the boat momentum enough to coast through the cavern, so that he would not have to put the oars into the water once they were inside. The entrance was coming up fast upon them. He had forgotten it was so low. Evelina took one frightened look, then hunched down and threw the blanket over her head. I can't watch, she gasped. Marcus gave a final pull at the oars and then shipped them and ducked his head. The boat skimmed over the surface and slid into the maw. He was awash in darkness so deep that it made the lambent light of stars and river seem bright by contrast. He could see nothing, and he recalled how the monks had lit lanterns on their boats when they had sailed into the cavern. Marcus stared hard in the direction of the shoreline. He could not see it. He could see nothing in the pitch dark of the cave. He couldn't hear anything either, and he began to think that the cavern was empty, that they were going to slip through unchallenged. He did not give thanks yet. The boat was starting to lose its forward momentum. He would have to row. His heart in his mouth, he picked up the oars, moving slowly and carefully to keep them from squeaking, and slowly and carefully lowered them into the water. They made a gentle splash, and he cringed as he pulled on the oars. He feared losing his way in the darkness, and he was relieved beyond measure to see the exit, a much wider aperture than the entrance, come into view. The starlit river glimmered in the opening, and he steered the boat toward it. The opening came nearer and nearer. Marcus was starting to think that they were going to escape after all. 
his heart was starting to lift, when a glimmer of light caught his attention. The light came not from the shore, but from the dark water. Marcus stared down into the river's depths. The light grew in brilliance, and then there were two lights, red gold in color, widening and expanding and drawing closer. Marcus ceased to row, his hands clenched on the oars. Two eyes, red gold with black reptilian slit pupils, gazed up at him. The dragon was in the water beneath them. Terrified, Marcus stared into the eyes that followed him, unblinking, as the boat slid over the surface. The boat moved of its own volition, for Marcus's hands had gone numb, his arms had lost their strength. He sat in his small chair in his little room and quaked at the sight of the unblinking eyes and the dragon's thoughts that clawed with sharp colors at his soul. Come out, Grawled urged. I've your doom to show you. Marcus stayed where he was, kept the door bolted. I will give you a glimpse, said Grawled. Ranks of soldiers, human soldiers, clad in armor that sparkled in the moonlight like the scales of the dragon, marched toward Marcus. The soldiers marched faster and faster, rushing up at him. Water surged around the boat, and he envisioned it capsizing, throwing him into the river where the dragon would seize him and drag him under. Marcus grabbed the oars and drove them deep into the water, propelling the boat toward the exit. Determinedly, he rowed and kept rowing, grunting at the stinging pain in his bandaged palms. What is it? I can't look! Evelina lifted her head out of the folds of the blanket. She stared, terror-stricken, around her. Marcus didn't answer her. He lacked the breath. The boat shot out of the cave. The soldiers vanished. The dragon's eyes watched Marcus row, plunging the oars into the water, pulling, lifting, plunging again and again, until the eyes were far behind him. Sweat poured off him. What's wrong? Evelina cried. Didn't you see the dragon? Evelina glanced timidly over her shoulder, then looked back at Marcus. No, she said. I didn't see anything. It was there, watching us. Or was it? Illusion. An illusion created by the dragon. An illusion meant to show Marcus that his puny magics, of which he was so proud, were the mewling of a babe compared to the magic of the dragon. Marcus slumped over the oars, his strength gone. His hands burned. His arm muscles jumped and twitched. A hint of your doom. Come inside and see the rest. See the dancing girls take off their veils, all for the price of your soul. Marcus was tempted. He would open the door just a crack. Don't be a fool, said a female voice quite clearly. You're right, Marcus smiled wearily at Evelina. That would be foolish. Maybe it would said Evelina, regarding him strangely. But I didn't say anything. 10. The moon had risen, and, though past the full, the night had shaved off only a sliver, so that its light was bright in a cloudless sky. Marcus and Evelina continued traveling the broad expanse of the river, keeping away from the shore. Not even Evelina wanted to stop for the night so near the horrible cave. She was rowing the boat now. It was either row or linger in the place that had driven her prince mad. Marcus dozed fitfully in the bow of the boat. At least when he was asleep, he wasn't talking crazy, talking about what he'd seen in the cave or hearing the voices of dragons in his head. There had been nothing in the cave, Evelina had hidden her head in the blanket so she wouldn't see anything horrible, but 
consumed by a dreadful fascination, she'd peeped out from between the folds. She'd watched the cavern slide by, dark and empty. And no one was talking to him, either. You're tired and hungry, she had told Marcus in soothing tones, and your poor hands. They could be hanging in a butcher's stall, they're so red and raw. Let me row, at least for a little while. He argued, of course, but in the end, rather to her surprise, he gave the oars to her, shifting position with her in the boat. Evelina didn't do a bad job of rowing once she got the hang of it. She could do most things she set her mind to, a characteristic that had carried her stubbornly through life. Fortunately, she didn't have far to go before she steered them out of the tributary that flowed past the cave and entered the main body of the river Asp. Here she was rowing with the current, not against it, since the river flowed south, carrying them in the direction they wanted to go. We should find a place to stop, Marcus had told her before he'd fallen asleep. It's dangerous traveling the river in the dark. Evelina was in hearty agreement. She had no intention of spoiling her hands the way Marcus had spoiled his, and she could feel them starting to blister. Her back and shoulders ached, as did her buttocks from the hard seat. When she saw lights ahead, bobbing up and down in the darkness, Evelina would have thanked God had she known him well enough to take the liberty. The lights belonged to fishermen setting out from their small village for some night fishing. They used lantern light to lure the fish to their nets, and it was these lights that Evelina saw. She woke Marcus with a kick of her foot. The fishermen were naturally quite astonished when a young woman rowed a boat into their midst, and more astonished yet to find that she had a monk with bandaged hands for a passenger. Their confusion was cleared up when Marcus explained who he was. He didn't expect them to believe him, for he had no way to prove his identity. To his astonishment, he was greeted with smiles and good cheer and enthusiasm. The king's men, it seemed, had been here only two days before, telling the people that the prince had been lost on the river during a fishing expedition and asking them to keep a watch out for him. Not only were his people pleased to see their prince, there was a handsome reward being offered for his safe return. Your Majesty, said one of the fishermen, clapping Marcus on the shoulder, you're the best catch we've made all year, begging your Majesty's pardon. The fact that he was wearing monk's robes was quickly explained by a hastily made-up tale of falling into the river and being rescued by a passing monk who gave him dry clothes. Marcus was more vague concerning Evelina, saying confusedly something to the effect that she had found him and nursed him. The fishermen received this information with straight faces. He was, after all, their prince. They were quick to abandon their fishing to help the two lost travelers, and within moments Marcus and Evelina were on dry land with half the village surrounding them. One of the fishermen sent his boy off at a run to inform the village patriarch of their good fortune. The patriarch met the boy on the way, for he'd heard the commotion and was heading down to see what was going on. He greeted the prince and the lady Marcus introduced as Mistress Evelina with calm dignity and offered them his house for the night. Thank you, sir, said Marcus gratefully. I know my parents must be worried sick. If someone could carry a message, no one in the village owns a horse, the patriarch replied, and seeing the prince's downcast expression, he added, I will send our swiftest lad to find the king's men tomorrow morning. Since that appeared to be the best Marcus could hope for, he accepted the offer with good grace. He was too exhausted and hungry to do much else. The patriarch's wife served up a hastily prepared meal of fish stew left over from their own dinner. Marcus won the good woman's heart by eating two helpings and swearing that he'd never tasted any food so delicious from the royal kitchen. 
The women of the village clucked over his injured hands and made up a poultice for him as he ate, then wrapped his hands in bandages. Marcus, well-fed, safe, and warm, felt sleep creeping over him. He must have dozed off in his chair, for the next thing he knew, the patriarch was assisting him to a mattress on a floor in the corner. The patriarch's own bed. He fell onto the mattress and closed his eyes. Thank you, kind sir, but I will stay with him, Evelina said shyly. My place is by his side. No, said Marcus, opening his eyes. I cannot allow that. You are as tired as I am. Sir, I would be grateful to you if you could find a place for Mistress Evelina to stay this night. He meant this kindly, and he was startled to see Evelina cast him an irate glance. He couldn't imagine what he'd done to upset her. She flounced out without a word, accompanying the patriarch and his wife. He was drifting into unconsciousness when the red eyes of the dragon bore down on him, jolting him to heart-pounding wakefulness. Marcus found himself drenched in sweat. His hands stung and burned. He was a long time going back to sleep. Evelina, on the other hand, slept quite soundly and woke early the next morning, still burning with anger over the insulting manner in which Marcus had treated her last night. A perfectly good chance for him to get her alone and seduce her, and he'd thrown it away. True, he had been exhausted, and his hands were bandaged, but any other man would have managed to overcome such minor inconveniences. She was staying with the patriarch's married daughter, and the young woman and her fisherman husband were up with the dawn. Being in awe of their guest, they both left the house as quickly as they could in order to give Evelina some privacy. The wife went to do her laundry on the river banks. The husband went to his boat. Evelina lay on the straw mattress, making plans and discarding them, mulling over what she needed to do in order to catch her own particular fish. Time was running out. She remembered suddenly that the patriarch had offered to send a message to the king's men. Already it might be too late. Evelina roused herself from her bed and walked outdoors. She found the village astir and the patriarch just leaving his house. Is his highness awake? Evelina asked. No, mistress, said the patriarch. I went to ask if he needed anything, but he sleeps like a babe. He never knew I was there. I doubt the trump of doom could awake him. His highness is exhausted. We have been through a great deal together. Both of us. Evelina laid emphasis on that. With trepidation, she asked the burning question. Have you sent the boy off to find the king's men? Yes, mistress, the patriarch answered. Young Tom left with first light. Evelina sighed deeply. And how long do you suppose the king's men will be in coming? The patriarch frowned considering. When they passed through the village, they said that if we saw or heard anything of his highness, we were to send word to Grafton, where they were camped. Now, Grafton is a day's journey on foot, longer if the weather is bad, for the roads hereabouts are in a sorry state, and I don't like the looks of the sky this morning. I'm thinking we'll have rain before noon." Evelina clenched her fists to control the urge to slap the man. How long, sir, before the king's men? Oh, he said, pondering. Tomorrow, but not before. Evelina smiled to herself and prayed for torrential downpours and footpads and snakes and every other mishap that could possibly happen to a traveler to happen to young Tom. I hope his highness won't be too disappointed, added the patriarch. His highness can use the rest, said Evelina, and she smiled sweetly, for at that moment the heavens opened up and poured rainy blessings down on her. 
11. Draconis, Lycera, can you talk? Yes, only for a moment, though. Is Marcus safe? He is with his own kind. He and the female who accompanies him... Never mind her, said Draconis. She is irrelevant. I trust you don't consider all females irrelevant, returned Lycera, her colors bright. She was a young dragon and excited about her first venture into the world. No, Lycera, I find females extremely relevant, especially those who risk their lives to help me. This one human female, however, has nothing to do with our predicament. I was teasing, said Lycera. I know you were, said Draconis, and so Marcus is safe, at least for the moment. He almost fell victim to the dragon. I was watching him as you told me, and he very nearly let Grald into his mind. I warned him away. That is the first time I have ever spoken to a human. It was strange, but I liked it. I didn't think I would. Draconis's colors warmed. He wished beyond anything in the world that he'd met this vibrant young female in a different time, a time when he could have spent years letting his dreams twine with hers. What do you want me to do now, Draconis? Lycera asked, and he saw her colors shimmer and tremble. She must have seen what he was thinking. There's nothing you can do, not without tipping off Grald and the other dragons that you're spying on them. You are careful to keep out of sight, aren't you? I am flying at such a high altitude that I have to come down every once in a while to catch my breath. We're about to be interrupted. I must soon leave you, Lysira. Tell me quickly, have you heard anything from Honora? She has not communicated with me or with Malfiesto or the other dragons with whom I've been in contact. That is not surprising, though, Lysira added, her colors darkening, since we are the ones who spoke out against her. Do not trust Honora, Draconis warned. If she tries to talk to you, do not let her into your mind. She is an elder dragon, Draconis, said Lysira gently, and very powerful. If she wants to speak to me, there's not much I can do to stop her. You know that. Draconis did know. He'd been holding Honora at bay thus far by keeping his colors to himself as much as possible. Just... Be careful, Lysira. I will, she promised, and her colors were lovely and lingered in his mind. Draca? A gentle hand touched his shoulder. Stretching, Dracona sighed and blinked up drowsily at the motherly woman bending over him. Draca, said Rosa, I'm sorry to wake you, but it is noontime. You've slept the morning through. Anton is home for his meal, and I thought you might be hungry. The illusory body of the girl that Draconis had assumed sat up in the bed and sniffed at the good smells wafting through the small house. Draconis had used this illusion before, and he was quite pleased with it. Being a human child, he'd discovered, gave him a great deal of freedom. Human adults take a tolerant view of their offspring. As a child, Draconis could be as curious and inquisitive as he liked, poke and pry and snoop, and adults would sigh and shake their heads, and the worst they might do would be to send him to bed without his supper. He had learned that many humans, who might otherwise keep their mouths shut tighter than a clamshell when in the presence of an adult, tended to blab freely in the presence of a child. How are you feeling? asked Rosa anxiously. Much better, said Draconis in the girl's high and piping voice. I am hungry. What have you got to eat? He threw off the blankets and sat up in bed. Not too quickly, Rosa cautioned. You'll make yourself dizzy. I'm fine, really, Draconis assured her. He reached out his little girl's hand. Thank you for helping me, ma'am, and thank you for not telling. 
I promised I wouldn't, Rosa said gently. But you will have to go back to the Abbey some day soon, child. Draconis let his face fall and his shoulders droop. He ducked his head and made a swipe at his eyes with his hand. I don't want to, he mumbled. I want to stay with you. There, there, child, said Rosa, soothing him. Don't cry. You can stay with us a little while. Now come and eat something. You are much too thin. You need some meat on those bones. Draconis accompanied Rosa to the table. Anton was already eating, digging his spoon into a bowl of mutton stew. He welcomed the little girl with a broad smile and shoved a chair out with his foot. Draconis picked up the spoon and was about to eat when colors exploded inside his head. Draconis, Malfiesto barked, what's this nonsense Honora has been spreading about her army preparing to attack a human kingdom? Is this true? Draconis dropped his spoon and put his hands to his temples. Child, what's the matter? Anton asked, alarmed. Look at her, wife. She's gone white as sheep's wool. Army, Draconis repeated inwardly. What are you talking about? What's this about an army? That's what I'm asking you, Malfiesto raged in ear-splitting colors. Look, Malfiesto, this is not a good time. I can't talk now. I'll contact you later. If you don't, I will, the dragon threatened. Keep me informed. I'm taking charge now that Honora has lost her senses. You are the walker. You report to me. Draconis sighed. He'd been pleased at first to find that Malfiesto was on his side. Now he wasn't so certain. The irascible old dragon was likely to prove more hindrance than help. What's the matter, Draca? Rosa hovered over him. Nothing, ma'am. Just a pain in the head, said Draconis. I'm fine now. This stew is really good. He shoveled food into his mouth, and Rosa sat back, reassured. Adults, be they human or dragon, are always pleased to see children eat. This was my daughter's favorite meal, said Rosa, and she gave a little sigh. Where is your daughter? I'd like to meet her, mumbled Draconis. Don't talk with your mouth full, dear. Our daughter is one of the dragons chosen. She lives in the palace, Anton added proudly. What does she do there? She serves the dragon, of course. Draconis looked at them, puzzled. Huh? Rosa and Anton exchanged glances. The holy sisters must have told you about the dragon's chosen, Draca, Anton said. Draconis shook his head. No, sir, not a word. Don't lie, child, said Rosa. Lying is a sin. The dragon won't like it. The dragon's not here, said Draconis impudently. Anton choked on a mouthful of ale. Rising swiftly to his feet, he went to look out the window. Rosa put her hand over Draconis's, squeezed it tightly. You should not speak of the dragon that way, she said loudly. It is disrespectful. She looked at Anton, and Draconis saw fear in her eyes. Anton sat back down. No one's about. Perhaps it's not so surprising, he said to his wife. The girl is young yet, after all. Maybe they don't tell them until they are old enough to be considered. Old enough to be considered to do what? Draconis asked. His child's wide-eyed, innocent gaze went from one to the other. Oh, dear. Maybe I shouldn't have said anything. Rosa's hands plucked at her dress, twisting the fabric. I won't tell. Draconis promised. Is it a secret? I'm good at keeping secrets. No, it's not a secret, Anton said slowly after a moment's pause. Everyone in Dragon Keep knows about the Palace of the Dragon. Being selected as one of the dragons chosen is an honor, after all. 
when a girl is eighteen, she becomes eligible to be one of the chosen. Our girl was selected almost immediately, Rosa said, flushing with pride. The dragon picks only those who can demonstrate that they are strong in the magic. The chosen leave their homes and move into the palace with the dragon. They serve him, and in return, they are given everything they want. What's it like inside the palace? Draconis asked eagerly. My goodness, child, we don't know, Rosa said, smiling. We've never been inside. But you've seen your daughter since she moved in, Draconis persisted. No, not in many years, Anton replied, and his face was shadowed. Once a woman enters the palace, she's not allowed to leave. That's one of the rules, and not a very good one, if you ask me. But we get letters from her, Rosa said hastily, with a worried glance at her husband. Twice a year, she writes to us about how happy she is and how much she enjoys serving the dragon. As strong as you are in the blood bane, Draca, I'm sure you'll be chosen to serve the dragon. Maybe, Draconis was cautious. Where is the palace? Now, Draca, don't be a tease, said Rosa. Everyone knows where the palace is. And everyone knows that we are forbidden to go near it, Anton said sternly. That includes children. Draconis gave them a mischievous grin and held out the bowl. Could I have some more to eat, please? It's really, really good. Rosa, gratified, ladled out more stew. Anton rose from the table. I have to get back to the forge, wife. I may be late for supper. We have a deal of work to do all of a sudden. A large order came in this morning, an order for weapons. Rosa set down the bowl in front of Draconis who watched and listened, all the while pretending to be absorbed in his meal. Weapons, Rosa repeated. What sort of weapons? Throwing darts, mostly. As many as I can turn out, as fast as I can turn them out. One of the blessed came by the shop this morning to tell me. And it's not just me. Every blacksmith in the city has been told to drop all other work and turn his hand to this. And what are you to do with these weapons? Hand them over to the blessed. And what do they do with them? They take them to the palace. That is what I hear. The weapons are being stored there. The palace? Rosa wrinkled her forehead. Maybe the rumors are true. Maybe, Anton grunted. Rosa sighed, her hands squeezed together tightly. Anton kissed her cheek. Don't fret, wife. It's nothing to do with us, whatever may be brewing, except that it brings me more work, and that will mean extra rations. What are you doing this afternoon? I should go to the market. I meant to go this morning, but I didn't want to leave Draca home alone. I'm fine. Truly I am, Draconis piped up. You can go, Rosa. I don't mind being alone. I like it. We are out of meat, said Rosa and she gave Anton a meaningful look. I was thinking of going to the butcher. Dimitri, perhaps. There'll be nothing for your supper otherwise. The child will be well enough on her own, said Anton. And he added, in a whisper not meant for Draca to hear, See what you can find out. If Dimitri's not around, go visit the Chandler, Carlo. Tell him about the weapons. You can have the Widow Meadows look in on the girl. Draconis's dragon ears caught every word. He picked up his bowl and went to wash it out, along with his spoon. Then he returned to his bed and crawled under the blanket. I'm still feeling tired, Rosa. I think I'll take a nap. Don't worry about me. Rosa kissed the girl on the forehead. The Widow will check on you, and I'll be back in time to cook your supper. Sweet dreams, Draca. Draconis closed his eyes and nestled beneath the covers. Anton departed. Rosa washed up the dishes and left shortly after, taking her marketing basket with her.
Draconis waited until he was certain that neither was coming back, and then he slipped out of bed. Cautiously, he opened the door and peered out into the street. The forge was adjacent to the house. He could smell the acrid scent of molten iron and see Anton's broad back and shoulders silhouetted against the glare of the forge fire. The ringing sounds of Anton's hammer echoed up and down the street, which was crowded with people heading back to work after their dinner break. Draconis dashed out the door and quickly lost himself in the crowd. Behind him, an illusion of a little girl slumbered peacefully in the bed. 12. Draconis roamed the streets of Dragonkeep, mulling over in his mind the conversation with Anton and Rosa, and that pain in the backside Malfiesto. Honora talking about armies, orders given to the blacksmith to produce large quantities of darts in a hurry. Draconis had been in human cities on the verge of war, and he remembered clearly the forge fires of the blacksmiths burning far into the night, and the furious din of hammers pounding like war drums, turning out armor and swords, arrows and shields. Yet he'd seen no soldiers in Dragon Keep. The darts were to go to the palace. Only the monks were permitted to enter the palace. Was the army composed of mad, dart-flinging monks? Draconis was familiar with the darts Anton was making. One such dart had felled Bellona. Humans had long played dart-throwing games. Draconis had watched them and even participated in a few. He'd known humans who could throw darts with remarkable accuracy, but he'd never known one who could throw a small metal dart no bigger than his index finger, with such force that it could kill a person a furlong away. The impetus behind the dart was dragon magic. The monk used his magic to increase the force of his throw. Perhaps the monk had even been able to use the magic to assist the dart in finding its target. Yet, Draconis considered, most of the monks he'd seen were mentally unstable, bordering on the insane. The dragon magic in the blood did strange things to the brains of human males. An army of insane men was not an army any rational general would want to lead. Impossible to discipline, they could not be counted upon to obey the simplest command. Turn them loose on a battlefield, and they could conceivably do more damage to themselves than to an enemy. Unless Grald discovered how to cure the madness, just as I did, Draconis muttered. Marcus was insane, until I taught him how to master the magic, not succumb to it. If I could find a way, so could Grald. And he's had far longer to experiment. Maybe there are soldiers and monks in Dragonkeep. Maybe the monks are the failures. That opened up new and extremely disquieting possibilities. Obviously, the answer lay in the palace that no one was supposed to enter. Draconis continued his wanderings until he found what he was looking for, other children like himself. The children of Dragonkeep were expected to make their contribution to society, and in this they were no different from the children of Idlewild or New Bromfells or Weinmauer or countless other human communities. Those children who lacked the dragon magic were apprenticed to craftsmen or worked in the fields. They milked goats, tended sheep, fed the chickens. Those with dragon magic lived with the monks and the holy sisters. Still, children were children the world over, and Draconis hoped to find some like himself who had sneaked out of the shop when the master went home for his dinner or had left the chickens to go off in search of fun. Draconis knew where to look for such rascals, and he soon came upon a group of youngsters skulking in an alley playing at Mumblety Peg. Can I have a toss? Draconis asked, joining them. No girls, said one of the boys. You're just afraid I'll beat you, 
Draconis sneered. Several of the boys snickered. The speaker cast little Draca an angry glance. Oh, yeah? Let's see you. He handed over the knife. Draconis had been playing Mumblety Peg for several hundred years. He could have beaten his rival handily at the game, but that would have alienated the children, and he wanted them to accept him. Draca demonstrated her skill, and the match was considered a tie, with the result that she was pronounced an expert Mumblety Peg player and accepted into the ranks of boydom. Draconis and his newfound friends played at Mumblety Peg until they grew bored, at which point they began to look about for other forms of amusement. The boys, six of them, ranged in age from nine to fourteen. One was an apprentice to a disreputable shoemaker, who had a taste for ale and generally took a nap about this time of day, leaving the boy to his own devices. Two were supposed to be working in the fields, but had thought better of it. Another was meant to be running errands for his mistress, an herbalist, and another was supposed to be homesick in bed. The sixth was vague as to where he came from. The others indicated with winks and nods, whispers and nudges, that he was a runaway, one of those children with the dragon magic in their blood. Draconis kept a wary eye on this boy, who was constantly mumbling to himself, and who, when given the knife from Mumblety Peg, made a wild swipe at Draca. When the other boys told the runaway that stabbing fellow playmates was against the rules, the boy then sliced open his own forearm. Not the least bothered by this bizarre behavior, the boys simply took the knife away and told their friend to go wash off the blood at the public fountain, or the blessed will nab you for sure. This done, the boys suggested various means of passing the time. Some wanted to steal apples from the market. Others wanted to ogle the women who were doing their laundry in the creek. And still others wanted to go look at the destruction caused by the explosion, on the off chance that they might find a dead body. The majority was leaning in this direction when Draconis said, Pooh, there aren't any more dead bodies. I heard my father say everyone had been found. Faces fell. The boy with the dragon magic slammed his fist into the stone wall in disgust and drew back bleeding knuckles. I know, Draconis said, edging away from the boy who was looking at her oddly. Let's go see the palace. Dead silence fell. The boys stared at her, some with awe, others nervously. Why? What's the matter? Draconis asked. We're not allowed, said one. We're not allowed to skip out of work, and we're doing it, Draconis reminded them. This is different, said another. If he catches us, the dragon will eat us, said the youngest boy in a whisper. The others scoffed and knocked him around playfully and mussed his hair, but no one made a move to go. The boy with the dragon magic had quit talking to himself and was staring at Draca with narrowed eyes. I think you're all afraid, said Draconis loftily. I dare you to come to the palace with me. The boys looked uncertainly at each other. Double dare, said Draconis, upping the stakes. I'll go, said the boy with the dragon magic. He had an eager look on his thin and blood-smeared face, and he couldn't seem to take his eyes off her. Good for you, said Draconis. She held out her hand to him and pretended not to notice when he recoiled and backed away from her. You and I'll go. The rest are too scared. There was no question for the others now. Their honor had been challenged. We'll just go look at the palace, said the eldest, clarifying the rules. Of course, said Draconis scornfully. You don't think I mean to go inside, do you? Who's the leader? Her gaze went to the eldest, and she smiled sweetly. I guess you must be. I am, he affirmed, flattered. Then you lead the way. Draconis flashed a glance around at the others. We'll follow, won't we, boys? 
All agreed, though with mixed levels of enthusiasm. The eldest boy, his head held high, started off down the alley. The rest fell in behind. Draconis was slightly disconcerted to find the boy with the dragon magic dogging his footsteps, his mad gaze fixed on Draco with rapt attention. Some males with dragon magic had the ability to see through Draconis's illusion, see the dragon that he was, not the little girl he was pretending to be. He wondered uneasily if this boy was seeing Draca or the dragon. The children wended their way through streets that twisted and turned, rambled into alleys, wandered uphill and down, and meandered around buildings that were all jumbled together in seemingly senseless order, judging by human standards. Grald had laid out the city, and Draconis saw the dragon's instinctive need to surround and defend himself with mazes and labyrinths in every twist and turn. Draconis's dragon brain being accustomed to mazes, he was able to keep track of the route they were taking. He now had a pretty good notion of where the dragon must have located his palace, somewhere near the mountain where Grald would have his lair. The gray stone walls of the abbey rose up in front of them. Beyond the abbey was a broad expanse of meadowland where sheep and cattle grazed. The eldest said that they should avoid the abbey, because that's where the blessed hang out. The boy with dragon magic nodded his head emphatically at this. The dragon's son lives there, he said, his voice low and reverent. He repeated this several times. Dragon's son, said one and rolled his eyes. It's true, claimed the youngest. I saw him. He has the legs of a dragon and claws instead of toes. And a tail, too, I'll bet, the eldest sneered. I didn't see a tail, said the nine-year-old. Who, you didn't see anything? I did so, did not. Careful, there's one of the blessed, Draconis warned. And the quarrel ended abruptly. The boys darted off down a side street. Now that they had made up their minds to this adventure, they were giving it their all. Draconis glanced back at the abbey. He now knew where to find Ven. The children made a wide circle around the abbey and were about a half mile past it when they entered a part of the city that had the look of being very old. It was also very empty. The stone buildings had not been kept in repair and were in various stages of tumbling down. The streets were deserted. I don't like this. We're not supposed to be here, said one of the boys, the shoemaker's apprentice, and he came to a halt. Shut up, said the eldest, or maybe you want to run home to your mama. The boy looked defiantly at his leader, then looked around at the others. You can all get eaten by the dragon if you want to. Not me. He took to his heels and went racing back the way they'd come. Piss yellow, shouted the nine-year-old after him. Emboldened by this show of cowardice and caught up in the daring of their actions, the others forged ahead, picking their way through streets littered with debris. The rows of buildings came to an abrupt end at the edge of a deep ravine. The street continued on, leading to a bridge that spanned the ravine. Stop here, ordered the leader, and he raised his hand. The others clustered behind him, careful to keep to the shadows. There it is, he said, awed. The bridge was crude, built out of piles of boulders that had been dumped into the ravine and then fire-blasted smooth on top. On the other side, at least two miles distant, stood the Palace of the Dragon. The palace was far different from the crudely constructed buildings of Dragon Keep. Smooth marble pillars decorated an elaborate marble portico. Marble steps flowed outward in graceful curves from immense double bronze doors adorned with the heads of dragons. Marble walls were topped by countless marble spires and battlements and turrets. 
The palace was very beautiful, and it was all very false. The palace was an illusion, and not a very good one. The illusion of the forest that surrounded the city of Dragon Keep, hiding it from the eyes of both humans and dragons, was a supreme illusion, and close to perfect. Draconis had not been able to penetrate it until Grald had lifted the spell, and he still had trouble seeing through it, though he knew it was there. Perhaps Grald had worn himself out casting that illusion, which, even after it was cast, required a certain amount of energy to keep in place. The palace was an ordinary dragon illusion, meant to fool human eyes alone, and it was doing a good job of that, judging by the gape-jawed wonder of the youngsters. Draconis glanced at the boy with the dragon magic and saw that he was as wide-eyed as the rest. Draconis saw no pillars or spires or marble stairs. What he saw when he looked across that bridge was the side of the mountain pierced by the dark opening at its base. Draconis crept nearer. Don't let them see you, said the leader, and he reached out and dragged Draca back into the shadows. A cadre of monks guarded the bridge on the city side of the ravine. Draconis noted, as a point of interest, that there were no guards posted on the palace side of the bridge. Apparently, the dragon was concerned about people from the city entering the palace, not about those in the palace leaving to enter the city. The blessed did not make very good guards. They wandered about in a desultory manner, gazing with their mad, unfocused eyes at the sky or the clouds, or staring blankly into the empty city streets, or peering over the edge of the bridge into the ravine. Why? What would happen if they did see me? Draconis asked. Would the dragon really eat me? No, at least I don't think so. But the blessed wouldn't like it. They don't like anyone getting too curious about the palace. I wonder what's inside, said Draconis. A whole nother city, replied the leader. So my father says. Truly? Draca regarded him with admiration. Tell me about it. No one knows, the leader admitted. But the people who live there send letters that say how beautiful everything is. Someone must have gone in there and come back out again. Don't the blessed go inside? They go in, said the boy with the dragon magic. He stood staring at the illusion with a wistful hunger in his eyes. He was biting his fingernails. The blessed go in, and they come back out, too. Some of them, but they don't talk about it. One of the boys pointed at the lengthening shadows. Hey, fellas, it's almost supper time. We better be getting back. My mistress will be hopping mad. Having found what he sought, Draconis was more than willing to leave. He and the others started to retrace their steps when he suddenly realized that one of them was missing. Hey, where's that kid? He asked. The runaway. Don't worry about him. The others shrugged. The blessed'll find him and take him home. Either that or he'll throw himself off the cliff said the leader, and the rest snickered. Draconis looked back and saw the boy still standing in the shadows, leaning up against the building. Draconis wondered how many of the blessed children had flung themselves off that cliff onto the sharp rocks far below. Come on, said the leader, race you home. Draconis proved remarkably fast for a girl. Thirteen. When Anton and Rosa returned from work, they found Draca puttering about the small house, doing chores. The widow dropped by to tell them that when she had checked on the child, Draca had been fast asleep. Rosa was pleased with Draca's unlooked-for help around the house, and invited her to assist with their supper. As the two chatted and laughed while preparing the simple meal, Anton sat at the table, waiting to eat, and thought about their daughter, who had been gone so many years. 
It was good to see Rosa with a child again, good to hear her laugh. He sighed deeply. Rosa seemed to have put all thought of sending Draca back to the blessed out of her mind. After supper, Anton rose and headed for the door. Husband, where are you going? Rosa asked in astonishment. There will be moonlight tonight, Anton returned. Between that and the light of the forge, I can work a little longer. He paused, then said heavily, The blessed were not pleased by my output. They expected more. You are exhausted, Rosa protested. You cannot work this night. Come, sit and rest. You will go to work with the first light tomorrow. Anton smiled ruefully. I will be doing that as well. Probably for the next few days. Draca, said Rosa casually, catching her husband's eye. We need more water. Would you run to the well for me? Draca obediently picked up the bucket and went out the door. She ran to the well, which was close by, and then ran back. She did not enter, but leaned near the open window, looking and listening. This war is being undertaken for our own good, wife, our own defense. Do the blessed think we are going to be attacked? Rosa asked, alarmed. They hint as much, though they don't say outright. But who would attack us, and why? We've done nothing to anyone. I don't know. Anton shook his head. There is no doubt that the blessed are preparing for war. And who will fight? Will they? Will you? Our people? We know nothing about such things. Rosa's cheeks reddened, her eyes flashed. Two hundred years this city has been in existence, and all those years we've lived in peace. Why now? What has changed? We've seen no sign of any enemy. I can't say, wife. Anton raised his hands defensively, retreating from the barrage. I don't like this. First there's an explosion and people die, and no one will say what blew up. Then people start disappearing. Dimitri has not returned to his home, and his family has had no word of him. I tell you, husband, I don't like it. Don't be angry at me, wife. I am not the one responsible. You must ask the blessed if you want answers. Or the dragon. Where is Draca? He asked suddenly. She's been gone long enough to fetch five buckets of water. Sorry, said Draca, bursting through the door. She was dripping wet. I spilled the first bucket all over me. Sit by the fire and dry out, Rosa said, fussing over her. I'm going to the forge with Anton. I won't be gone long. Draca dragged her stool close to the fire, gave them both a grin, and waved. I don't want to scare her with talk of war, Rosa said, shutting the door. Anton realized there was something more here. He thought he knew what it was, and he braced himself. Husband, began Rosa. Rosa, he said gently, we must take her back. Why? Rosa demanded. She is a help to me around the house. She brings a light to your eyes that I have not seen in years. Just what Anton had been thinking to himself about his wife. She laid her hand on his arm. What if there is a war? The girl will need a safe home. Please, husband, no one has been asking around for her. I made inquiries when I was at the market. There are no reports of a child missing. The blessed are not making the rounds, searching for her. Maybe you were wrong about her. Maybe she does not have the blood bane. I saw what I saw, wife. Her magic saved her life, said Anton. That's the only explanation. No, it's not, Rosa returned briskly. Her husband was weakening, and she was quick to see it. There are quirks of fate, happy accidents, coincidences. Wife, I am behind enough as it is. I must go to work. We will speak of this in the morning. I will make a bargain with you, Rosa continued, pretending not to hear. If the blessed announce publicly that they are looking for a lost girl, I will take her to them myself. If not, 
We will give her a home. We will speak in the morning, Anton repeated. But he knew by the set of his wife's shoulders as she walked back into the house that he had already lost the argument. Draconis finished the washing up, swept the floor, and laid the table ready for tomorrow's breakfast. He gave no sign that his dragon ears had overheard every word between husband and wife. He stayed up to keep Rosa company until Anton returned. The smith came home early. The moonlight he'd expected had not materialized, for the sky clouded over and rain began to fall. All three went to bed. Draconis lay awake, listening for Rosa and Anton to fall into slumber, which both did very shortly, for the day had been long and hard for both of them. Creeping out of his bed, he went to stand over the couple, who slept in each other's arms. The house was dark, but his dragon eyes could see the lines of care and fatigue etched on each face, and he thought how he, the little girl, helped ease those lines, at least for a little while. Some day, maybe some day soon, he would sneak away and not come back and they would never know why. He would leave them, as he had left other humans in his past, others who had cared about him, cared about him deeply, others who had never known why he had walked into their lives only to walk right back out. He tried to avoid saying goodbye. That always called for explanations. Easier on all parties if he just simply disappeared. As he cast the enchantment over Anton and Rosa that would ensure that they sleep throughout the night, he told himself that if he could bring them news of their daughter, such news would help ease the pain of his disappearance. It was a nice thought to carry with him. The night was dark, for the sky was cloud-covered and drizzling. The streets were empty. The Blessed imposed a curfew on all citizens and the monks walked the streets at night, their fell presence presumably warding off whatever temptation anyone might feel to break the law. The monks roamed the streets wherever whim or madness took them. Draconis would sometimes travel for blocks and never see one, and then run into groups of them skulking about in an alley. Avoiding them proved easy, for they carried lanterns, and he could see them coming long before they could see him. Sighting other shadows flitting past in the night, he guessed that he wasn't the only person in Dragon Keep out on some furtive mission. Two such shadows stood in a doorway, locked in an embrace. Draconis had dropped the image of Draca the minute he left the house and shifted his illusory form to become one of the monks, borrowing the features of a monk who had attacked Marcus when he first entered the city. If Draconis did run into one of the blessed, they would find his face familiar. At the sight of the cowled figure of Draconis, the two shadows in the doorway fled. Draconis retraced his steps of the morning. He walked past the abbey, wondering which room belonged to Venn, perhaps the single room on the second floor where the light burned bright. Draconis stared hard at the light, as if it could answer his many questions concerning Venn, not the least of which was why he had lured Marcus here to be given as a present to the dragon, then turned around and helped his brother to escape. The rain came down harder. Draconis pulled his cowl over his head. The only way to answer that question, and others, was to talk to Venn, either face to face or mind to mind. Both those options were dangerous. The monks guarded Venn's body. Grald guarded Venn's mind. Draconis passed other monks on the street. None spoke to him. Some gave him brief nods. Others went by without even noticing him, walking with a shuffling gait, muttering to themselves. Draconis tried to imagine an army made up of these wretched creatures, and failed. The dragons were smarter than that. They must have something else planned. 
which was why Draconis was on his way to the palace. Reaching the bridge, he halted in the shadows and settled down to watch. He wanted to see monks cross the bridge, wanted to see if they were accosted by the guard, and, if so, what they said and did. The number of the blessed on duty at the bridge was considerably reduced by night. Only three were posted on the city side of the bridge, and there were still no guards on the palace side. Draconis pondered what this might mean, but could arrive at no satisfactory answer. The only obvious one was that there was no one in the palace to guard. A grim thought, especially for the daughter of Anton and Rosa. He waited and waited, but no one made any attempt to cross. After almost an hour, Draconis began to realize that no one was going to try to cross. When they said no one entered the palace, they meant it. The blessed roved about aimlessly, occasionally coming together to talk, then wandering off. Draconis considered using his magic to make himself invisible. The illusion would work with ordinary humans, but he could not count on that with these monks. Whereas another of their own trying to cross the bridge, Draconis made up his mind. He set forth, walking briskly, as with purpose. The monks guarding the bridge were apparently not accustomed to dealing with interlopers in the night, for they were startled beyond measure when Draconis materialized out of the darkness. Indeed, he was almost on top of them before they even noticed him, and then all three stared at him in such amazement that they seemed to wonder if he was real or an apparition. Greetings, brethren, said Draconis pleasantly. Sweeping past them, his robes flapping around his ankles, he glanced skyward. At least it has stopped raining for the moment. I trust I will be finished with my business and back safely in my bed before another storm breaks. He kept walking as he spoke, as if crossing the bridge in the night was an everyday occurrence. None of the monks said a word or made a move, and he thought he was going to make it. He took another step. Then one of them glided sideways to take up a position directly in front of Draconis. None may pass, said the monk. He was polite, not threatening, merely stating a fact. The monk's eyes were neither unfocused nor wandering. His eyes looked quite sane. All too sane. I have the dragon's sanction, Draconis affected surprise. I was told to inspect the shipment of weapons that was brought into the palace this day. It seems that the dragon is concerned about their quality. He may decide to take the smith to task on the morrow. You need not concern yourself with this, brother. The matter will be dealt with by those within, said the monk calmly. But I was told to handle this myself, protested Draconis. Then whoever told you that? was mistaken. The monk was calm, imperturbable, and immovable as the mountain. Less movable, maybe, for an earthquake might shake the mountain, but it seemed that nothing would shift this monk. Draconis glanced past the man to the other end of the bridge. He could always make a run for it, and with his dragon's strength and speed, he could easily outdistance the human. He was turning back to the monk, when his eye caught a faint shimmer of light like a fine spray of water sparkling in the sunshine, except that there was no water and no sun. He looked hard at the end of the bridge, and the shimmer vanished. When he looked away, the shimmer reappeared. Draconis was thwarted. He'd been in enough dragon lairs to recognize a magical barrier when he saw it, a barrier that was undoubtedly so sensitive it would detect a rat's whisker. Draconis could use his magic against the monk, and then against the barrier. But he had the feeling, looking into those all-too-sane eyes, that this monk knew a few magic tricks of his own. And the last thing Draconis wanted was the eruption of a magical firestorm in front of Grald's living quarters.
Draconis could think of no other persuasive arguments. Muttering that he was going to get into trouble with his superiors, he stomped angrily off the bridge and retreated up the street. Halting in an alleyway, he eyed the bridge and the stanchion-like guardian and the unseen barrier. No one may pass, he repeated, except by invitation, and only those women who are strong in the dragon magic. No one else is admitted, not even the blessed. What is in that palace that no one is meant to see? No one may pass, at least not across the bridge, and that was the only way inside the mountain. The only way for humans, not for dragons. Draconis glanced up in frustration at the buildings that towered over him and pressed in around him. He thought of the abbey and the broad, open expanses of grassy meadows that surrounded it, and he headed in that direction at a run. Then rose from his sickbed shortly after supper, and over the protests of the monks, he announced his intention of going for a walk in the cool night air. He needed to get out, to walk off his trouble, as Bologna termed it. The mind worked better when the body was active. Then needed exercise, needed fresh air, not the stale, monk-breathed air of the sick room. He started for the door, but at this the monks did more than protest. They told him firmly that he was not to venture out. Grald's orders. Then argued and even threatened. The monks were careful to keep their distance, for they feared him, but they apparently feared Grald more, for Ven was not able to shake their resolve. When he saw sparks dance on their fingertips and heard the crackle and sizzle of magic in the air, he was forced to back down. It is not personal to you, dragon's son, one of the monks told him in tones meant to be mollifying. No one walks the streets of Dragon Keep after the slumber hour. Take your rest this night, and I will ask Grald if you may be permitted to go forth on the morrow. Ven was left with nothing more than the small satisfaction of ordering the monks out of his room. Alone, he paced and paced, his claws clicking loudly on the wood floor, back and forth, back and forth. An irritating sound that he hoped was annoying the hell out of the monks. He had much to think about, not the least of which was how he would fulfill the promise of his name, vengeance. He had sworn an oath to the spirit of Bellona that he would avenge his mother's death. How he was to fight a dragon, when he couldn't even stand up to a half-starved, half-mad monk, was more than Ven could fathom. He thought again of trying to learn the magic, and rejected the idea. He wanted no part of the dragon within him. The human part of him would kill the father who had made him. And it was then, in his pacing and his thinking, that Ven realized a truth about himself. He was not just avenging his mother's death. He was avenging his own accursed birth. He dreamed about the battle with his father in all its bloody glory, but that was all it was, a dream. In reality, the only blood likely to be spilled was Ven's. He could wield a sword, Bologna had seen to that, but he did not possess a sword and with the blasted monks dogging his footsteps, there seemed no way to acquire one. Add to that the fact that he'd have to kill Grald twice. First, he'd have to slay the huge and hulking human body, a task that might daunt even the most skilled human warrior, something Ven was not. Then, he'd have to kill the dragon. Growing increasingly frustrated, Ven paced, and kept on pacing. His route took him near the small hole that passed for a window in the crudely constructed building. He looked out this window every time he passed, longing for the freedom of the grassy sward that lay beyond it, and he vowed that tomorrow he was getting out of this room even if he had to tear down the walls to do it. On his hundred and umpteenth time past the window, Ven looked outside and caught sight of movement, 
Even a deer bounding across the hillside would be a welcome distraction to his own dismal ponderings. And he halted his pacing to stare out into the field, his dragon eyesight easily penetrating the rain-drenched darkness. He saw a man standing on the hillside lift up his arms, and the arms became enormous wings. A huge reptilian head gazed up into the night. Powerful hind legs and a massive tail drove into the ground, propelling the body upward. The dragon's claws grabbed at the clouds and caught them, seeming to drag them down to earth as the wings carried the massive body into heaven. Then was a child again, watching with vivid clarity a man take wing, take flight, soar into the sky, leaving behind a grief-stricken half-human, half-dragon who wanted to be all human, no dragon. Ven sprang at the window with a bound, sprang at it as though he might spring out of it, Gripping the ledge with his hands, he stared into the night and sucked in a breath and let it out in a hiss that was also a name. Draconus! He watched the dragon wheel in the sky. Draconus was fleeing Dragon Keep, escaping, leaving Ven behind. Ven was tempted to call out to Draconis, to splatter the white emptiness of his cave with the red-gold stain of Draconis's name. Ven stopped himself, however. He had only once in his life cried out for help, a cry that had been answered by Grald. He would not beg for help ever again. The dragon flew into a cloud bank, and Ven lost sight of him. He continued to watch, his gaze roving rapidly over every portion of the sky. He was frustrated in his search, for the clouds gathered thickly overhead. Spatters of rain started to fall. He leaned precariously out the window, twisting his body to peer upward, but saw nothing. The rain fell harder, drops plashing on his bare head. He pulled himself back inside and continued to watch. His patience was rewarded. A gap opened in the clouds, and Ven had a clear view of the dragon. The creature spiraled down from the sky to land on a rock ledge at a point about halfway up the mountainside. The dragon was there an instant, and then disappeared from view as the clouds caught the mountain in their grasp and smothered it. Ven drew back from the window. He no longer paced, he had worn himself out. He had a lot to think about, but he could think in his bed. The last Ven had seen of Draconis, the dragon stood silhouetted against a lightning flash. Ducking his head and folding his wings close to his body, Draconis had entered the mountain. 14. Draconis had no difficulty finding the back door into the dragon's lair. He spotted the gaping gash in the cliffs on the southern side of the mountain the moment he flew over it. No effort had been made to disguise the opening or conceal it. Grald was either a very lazy dragon or a very arrogant one. Or very calculating. Such an obvious door might be a trap. Conceding that possibility, Draconis entered the cave using extreme caution. The aperture was narrow. He had to flatten his body and keep his wings pressed against his flanks in order to squeeze into it. And then his shoulders rubbed against the cavern walls. He was forced to maneuver carefully to keep from tearing a wing. He peered intently at the walls as he entered. If Grald had passed this way in dragon form... Draconis would see some sign of it, scraped off scales clinging to the walls, claw marks in the rock. No sign of either. Draconis doubted that any dragon had walked this cavern for years, perhaps not since it was formed. From the heaps of guano on the floor, the cavern appeared to have been taken over by bats. Draconis assumed that he had probably tripped some sort of alarm upon entering, no dragon with a brain would leave a back door unguarded. The dragon would weave some sort of magic across it that would alert him to intruders. 
Draconis knew this was a risk the moment he entered the cavern. He deemed it acceptable. There was always the possibility, the hope, that Grald was not in his lair. He and his human body might be somewhere else. The cavern narrowed into a tube-like corridor that ran for some distance straight into the mountain, then opened up into a large chamber where Draconis was able to lift his head and release his wings. He shook himself all over, scales clicking, and drew in a breath of air that reeked of bat. The creatures were out with the night, but this was evidently the chamber where they roosted. Despite the stench, Draconis breathed well and deeply. He always felt better when he was in his true form, his dragon body, and he felt better in his natural habitat, a cave. Though his human form was just illusion, unlike Grald and Maristara and Honora, who had all seized the bodies of real humans, the illusion was so real that Draconis sometimes felt as if he were trapped in that human body, a body that was fragile, soft, and unprotected, all part of the magic of the supreme illusion. The walker had to feel human as well as look human. He had to come to believe the lie, so to speak, for otherwise he would not be able to understand what it was to be human, and so be able to pass for human. Draconis thought what it would be like to walk inside this cavern as a human, terrified of the bats, for one thing, unable to see in the darkness, blundering into stone walls and falling over unseen obstacles, losing himself in the tangled maze of corridors, and always fearful of puncturing the vulnerable flesh or breaking one of the slender bones, knocking a hole in the skull, or poking out an unprotected eye. In his dragon form, Draconis was armored in scales that were harder than any steel man had yet created. His eyes could spot a rodent in the pitch darkness fifty feet away. He had a massive tail that could fell a tree with one swipe, razor-sharp claws and sword-sharp teeth, and the fire of magic blazed in his blood. He was invincible to every creature in this world, with the exception of his own kind. Or, at least, he had been. King Edward's cannons. Not a threat now. But there was one thing to be said for humans. They never stood still. They were always surging forward, bashing their headstrong way through their brief lives, making progress, as they liked to call it. Dragons had watched humans advance from the point where their brutish ancestors were flinging stones to bring down small animals to the firing of cannonballs. He conceded that Honora was right. It was not difficult to predict that the crude iron ball that now flew a few hundred feet to land with a thud in a field of millet would some day be armed with such destructive force that it could blow apart this mountain. Safe in their caves, deep beneath the earth, dreaming their wondrous dreams, the dragons and their young would, for the first time in human history, be at the mercy of humans. Dragons could never rest safe again. Like humans, they would always live in fear. In that moment, Draconis came very near to turning and walking out the back door. He came very near to going back to his own lair, saying, The hell with it. The hell with them. And then his own words to Lycera came back to him. Fine words about freedom and doing what was right. Dragons will have to adapt to this new world, he said to himself. We will have to change. Something will be lost. Something is always lost when change comes. But something will be gained, for that too is a given. At least, I hope so. Wondering if the alarm had gone off, and if someone was there to hear it, Draconis sent a penetrating gaze through the darkness, seeking out the tunnels that branched off from this chamber and led deeper into the dragon's lair. He found three, 
Draconis sniffed the air of each of them, smelling and tasting with nose and tongue. He poked his head down each of the tunnels, listening for the smallest noises. He stared deep into each of them, studying them, searching for the tiniest hint. He could not smell dragon in any of them, and that further confirmed his belief that Grald had not been near this part of his mountain in a long time. No reason he should be, of course. His interests lay in the world of humans. But it was an indication that the dragon had grown lazy. Even though Draconis returned to his lair only a couple of times every hundred years, he always checked it over from top to bottom. Magic spells needed to be reinforced or rewoven. Traps needed to be reset. Animal squatters driven out. And it was always good to know if any stranger had been prying about. He began to wonder if there had been an alarm at the entrance or not. Given the hundreds of bats coming and going on their nightly runs, the alarm, unless specifically designed to detect only dragons, would have been going off constantly. Bats in a dragon's lair. Draconis's lip curled in disgust as he waded through their droppings, which were knee-deep. He headed down the middle corridor. The other two were quiet and smelled bad. The middle one had an intriguing odor and, more important, intriguing noises. He was able to detect, echoing up through the halls and tunnels of the dragon's lair, the sounds and smell of humans. The babble of human voices increased markedly as Draconis walked the corridors of Grald's palace. To judge by the sound, the humans were engaging in some sort of celebration, for the voices would often rise in unison, making what humans termed music, something that was for Draconis a cacophony of ear-jarring screechings and wails. The music was followed by bursts of applause or laughter that thundered through the cavern chambers. If the noise they were making was any indication, Draconis guessed that, like the bats, there must be hundreds of humans inside the cavern. Yet no one crossed the bridge. He continued to advance, his wonder and his concern growing. He saw no sign of the dragon anywhere. He came upon no traps. He did not wander into any illusory passages designed to lead an intruder to grief. The lair might have belonged to an enterprising bear. And Draconis suddenly understood the reason why. As a mother with a toddler will remove all sharp objects from the child's reach, the dragon had been forced to make his lair safe for human occupants. Draconis calculated that he must be drawing near the base of the mountain by now. The tunnel he walked twisted and turned, yet always sloped steadily downward. Rounding a corner, he saw a glow of warm yellow-orange light. The voices were close, the human smell overpowering. He halted where he was to reform the illusion to become human once more. He did not choose the monk's form. He had the impression, from what he'd seen and heard on the bridge, that few of the blessed were allowed in the cavern. Hearing among the voices raised in song the high-pitched cries and giggles of children, he went back to being Draca. As always, he let go of his dragon form with deep reluctance, sighing his way back inside the fragile, frail human skin. The corridor that had seemed small and narrow to the dragon was suddenly enormous to the human girl. His eyes could see better than those of most humans, but not as well as a dragon, and his hearing was so reduced that it seemed his ears were stuffed with wax. He had to allow himself several moments to adjust to the change. Then, keeping near the wall, he edged his way forward. He very nearly stepped off the edge of a cliff. His human stomach gave a lurch, and he took a hasty step backward, 
painfully mindful of the fact that in this body he had no wings to save himself from what would have been a hundred-foot plunge straight down. The tunnel opened into an enormous chamber. Draconis had seen something like this only once before, the Hall of Parliament, where the dragons met. The entire center of the mountain had been scooped out, like the insides of a pumpkin. The ceiling, far, far above him, was supported by huge columns of rock that jutted up from the smooth floor. The cavern's walls were a veritable honeycomb of small caves, built in neat, even rows around the inside of the chamber. Stairs carved out of the rock led up to the caves, opening out into walkways that were like streets. The chamber was brightly lit. A bonfire burned in the center of what would have been a plaza in a human city. Draconis wondered at the lack of smoke from the blaze, the cavern should have filled with it. Then he saw that the fire did not feed off wood. The flames fed off stone and magic. The child, Draca, sat down on the stone floor of the tunnel, and, letting her feet dangle over the edge, gazed down in wonder at the sight beneath her. Humans, men and women and children, clustered about the magical blaze, he listened to their songs, to the words of the songs. He watched them dance their dances, and his wonder devolved into grim dismay. Their stories were those of fighting and battle. Their songs were songs of war. He had found the dragon's army. His roving eye took note of a group of people who held themselves apart from the others, kept their distance, stood aloof and proud. He stared at them, and his dismay turned to shock. What have we done? Draconis asked the question of himself and all of his kind. What have we done? He asked again. And can we ever be forgiven? Draconis now knew the truth about Anton and Rosa's daughter, why she had been chosen, and what for. And he was pretty certain now that he knew her terrible fate. Fifteen. Ven slept fitfully that night, and woke the next day, resolved to leave the room that had become a prison. He spurned the monks, who urged him to continue to remain in bed. He ate breakfast with a hearty appetite, and then sent the monks into a panic when he stated that he was going out for a walk. They attempted to dissuade him by murmuring that he was not well. All he had to do was point to the wound that had already closed and scabbed over. He was still a little weak from loss of blood, but he would never admit to that. If he stayed cooped up in that room with only the mad monks for company, he'd go as mad as the maddest among them. Then had another reason, though it was one he did not readily admit to himself. He needed to talk to Draconis. The need was grudging, for it implied weakness on Ven's part. He'd determined that he would never again ask for help from anyone. With the long night to think things over, and the vision of Draconis slipping into Grald's mountain lair before his eyes, Ven had come to the conclusion that exchanging a modicum of pride for Draconis's assistance in carrying out his plot against Grald was not such a bad trade-off. I won't ask him to help me fight Grald, Ven resolved. I just need information about fighting dragons. Ven didn't dare leave the white-shielded cave of his mind to go in mental search of Draconis. Such a move would place them both in danger. But he could leave his room. Flinging open the door, Ven found two monks standing guard outside. One of the monks jumped nearly out of his skin as the door banged against the wall. The other regarded him with a wary look. I'm going for a walk, Ven announced and shoved past the two of them. You can come if you want. The monk, who was not quivering, frowned. Your father... Ven rounded on him. 
I have heard rumors that the people of Dragon Keep think I am dead, killed in the explosion. If I am to be the leader of these people, then they should see me, see that I am alive and strong and well. Either this inspired argument carried the day, or the monk saw that he had no hope of stopping Ven from leaving, and so he gave in, though not without a whispered conversation with his fellow, who immediately darted off, presumably running to Grald with the report. Accompanied by three monks, Ven left the abbey for the first time since he'd gone out that fateful morning to meet his brother. He emerged into morning air washed fresh by last night's rain, and paused to gulp in great draughts. He set out to walk the streets of Dragon Keep with no particular destination in mind, just the need to get the blood flowing, and perhaps find Draconus. Ven could not forbid the monks from escorting him. They were far more terrified of Grald than they were of Grald's son. But he could make it difficult for them, and he did. The dragon blood gave him extra human strength, and even weakened, he was stronger than any of the monks. His dragon legs carried him at an easy lope through the city streets. The monks kept up as best they could, the image of Grald's fury acting as a spur, but none was accustomed to exertion of any kind, and soon they were gasping and winded. Then saw them falling behind, and magnanimously halted to wait for them to catch up. A group of people gathered around the dragon's son, not approaching him or speaking to him, just watching him. Several grinned when they saw the monks come limping around the corner. One monk almost doubled over from the pain of a stitch in his side, and the other two were sweating and out of breath. "'Who's guarding who?' shouted a little girl with a laugh. Some of the adults looked stern and frowned at her. A few chuckled, though they hastily rearranged their faces as the monks drew near. By the time the monks reached Ven's side, the crowd had melted away, all except the little girl who stood staring at Ven with frank and unabashed curiosity. Be gone, child, one of the monks scolded her. Leave the dragon's son alone. The little girl stuck out her tongue. The monk made an angry swipe at her, but she skipped away and ran off down the street. The monks paid her no more attention. They had their charge to consider. You walk very fast, dragon's son, said the monk, scowling. I plan to go on at this pace. I just wanted to let you know that, Ven returned. You would do well to slow down, dragon son. You are not well. Ven looked pointedly at the monks, one unable to straighten up, and the other two scarcely able to walk. I thank you for your concern and for your care of me. Ven's lip curled. I feel so much safer knowing I am under your protection. Ditch them, came a voice, its colors flitting about like butterflies in Ven's head. Ven knew that voice, and he could barely contain his elation. He had been right. Draconus was here. As fast as the dragon's colors darted into Ven's mind, they vanished. Ven could see them still, see the afterimages, as when one stares at the sun, but he dared not answer. Grald lurked outside his cave, waiting for him to emerge. The monks were staring at him expectantly, and Ven realized that he'd lost track of the conversation. You can either keep up with me or go back to the abbey, he stated. I need no guards. What does my father think I will do? Try to escape from Dragon Keep? The world outside is a dangerous place for me. He knows that better than anyone. Why would I want to return to it? The spokesman for the three monks cast Ven a churlish look. He and his two cohorts conferred in low voices. Then, bowing, they turned and walked off. Surprised and a little suspicious at the ease with which he'd accomplished his task, Ven watched the monks until they were out of sight. He kept watch for Draconus, too, but saw no sign of him. No one was about except the little girl, 
who was loitering in the shadows of a building. Ven lingered in the street, searching for the man he remembered from childhood, a human male with long black hair, piercing dark eyes, carrying a staff. Several men passed by him, but they did not answer that description. He began to grow impatient, and when the little girl came dancing up to him, he tried to ignore her, hoping she'd go away. He detested children. The sight of them brought back his own painful childhood. Adults were unkind, with their averted eyes or looks of pity or crude remarks. Children were cruel, taunting and teasing and tormenting the little boy who walked with a beast's gait. I wish my legs had scales like yours, dragon's son, the child said, except that my scales would be red gold. Run along home, Ven told her, scowling, and he tried to shoo her away with a wave of his hand. To his astonishment, the girl grabbed hold of his hand. She held fast when he tried to shake her loose. She was a sharp-eyed little minx with long black hair and a spare bony frame on which her ragged clothes hung like new-washed laundry. She looked up at Ven and grinned. Her comment about the red-gold scales suddenly struck him, as did the long black hair. Long ago, Ven had seen a dragon take to the air. He had seen moonlight glitter on scales that were red gold. He'd seen the same last night. Draconis? Ven asked softly, staring at the child in astonishment. Start walking, the little girl ordered, tugging him along. No, don't look back. Keep moving. Is that you, Draconis? Ven persisted. My name's Draca said the girl in a loud, shrill voice. I know you. You're Ven, the dragon's son. Act naturally, they're watching you. The monks? Ven glanced over his shoulder. No, they're not. I sent them back to the abbey. Not those monks. Others. Why do you think your guards gave way so easily? Look there, in the alley, and there, in the doorway of the baker's shop. Ven cast a glance in the directions indicated. The monk in the alley blended into the shadows, but not before Ven had spotted him. The monk in the doorway of the baker's shop did not even bother to try to hide himself. How do you know I won't hand you over to Grald? asked Ven, trying unsuccessfully to free his hand from the girl's grasp. He still was not certain this was Draconis. Because you helped Marcus escape, the child replied calmly. He did escape safely, by the way. He and the young woman. They're on their way back to his kingdom by now. The child cocked her bright eye at him. Aren't you pleased? Ven shrugged. To his surprise, he was pleased. He didn't plan on showing it, however. Good for them, was all he said. You don't care what happens to your brother or to Evelina? Not particularly. Ven replied. I treated her badly, and I made amends. My brother took her safely away from here. That's all that matters. So that is why you lured him here, Draconis nodded in understanding, to rescue the young woman. You never planned to betray Marcus to Grald, did you? No, said Ven shortly. He's my brother. A brother you never knew you had? I knew, said Ven, remembering the small hand that had reached out to him when he was a boy, alone and crying in a cave. Draconis was silent. Ven could almost see him rearranging impressions in his mind. Why didn't you take the young woman away yourself? Draconis asked. Why don't you leave now? You can see through the illusion. You know where to find the gate in the wall. Ven continued walking. The girl trotted along at his side. She was forced to take two and a half steps for his one to match his long strides. They'd left the watchful monks far behind. Ven could not see any others, though he had no doubt they were there, keeping an eye on him. 
Now was the time to reveal his plan and ask for aid. The words stuck in his craw. Fortunately, Draconis was able to answer his own question. Your name, said Draconis. Vengeance. That's the reason you stay. You're here to kill Grald. Avenge your mother. Or maybe that's not quite right. The girl cast him a bright, sharp glance. Maybe you're here to avenge yourself. Take out your wrath on the father who made you what you are. What do you want with me, Draconis? Ven demanded. Are you going to lecture me on the folly of trying to slay the dragon by myself? If so, don't waste your breath. You're not telling me anything I don't already know. I'm here because you wanted to talk to me, Draconis told him pertly. I never... Oh, not in words, or even in colors, Draconis assured him. Good thing, too, for if Graal discovered your plan, he would have your entrails for lunch. We don't have much time, and there's something you need to see. Then drew in a deep breath. Let it out. Look. Draconis. Draca, the girl corrected. Don't say or even think my name if you can help it. Look, Dracon Draca, I don't want to see anything or hear anything except what you can tell me that will help me kill the dragon. To help you kill the dragon? You need your brother. Ven snorted. I'm serious said Draconis. The sons of Melisande, both the sons of Melisande, should come together to avenge their mother. That's not going to happen, Ven said, adding with a burst of impatience, just tell me what I need to know, damn it, then you can leave. That's why you've been hanging around here, isn't it? Nursemaiding me, like those idiot monks. Well, you don't have to anymore, I can take care of myself. You have a strange way of asking for help, dragon son, Draconis said. Don't call me that, said Ven. What? Dragon son? You are, you know. Ven was silent. You can't keep denying it forever, Draconis said quietly. You can kill your father, but you can't kill the truth. He paused, then said, I'll make you a deal, Ven. I will give you what help I can, which isn't much. There's no time to teach you how to use the magic, and that is what you truly need to fight Grald. Nevertheless, I will do what I can to aid you. In exchange for my help, you must agree to come with me. Come with you where? To the palace of Grald. It's going to be a bit of a climb to reach the entrance. Are you strong enough? Palace? His lair, you mean? Ven was suddenly eager. Yes, I'm well enough. Is Grald there? Perhaps you and I together? The child shook her head. I would like very much to have it out with Grald, but I have to forego that particular pleasure. He is strong and powerful, and he might get lucky and kill me. And though it may be egotistical of me to say this, I can't afford to die right now. Events have been set in motion that must be stopped, and I'm the only one in a position to do that. Besides, Grald is not in his palace. I made certain of that before I came looking for you. Just tell me what's going on, will you? Ven said, frustrated. He jerked his hand free of the child's. I don't like all this goose chase runabout. I can't simply tell you, Draca said with somber gravity. You have to see for yourself. Then, otherwise, you would not believe me. 16. On leaving the mountain fastness, Draconis had searched for an easier way into the dragon's lair than the one he'd used last night. Ven's strong scaled legs and clawed feet made him an excellent climber, but the dragon's son could not scale sheer rock walls. Draconis had not remained in the palace long last night. He'd seen what he'd come to see, plus much more, and there was no use risking discovery by hanging about. 
he'd followed a different route out of the dragon's lair, and that led him to the discovery of a back door, about a half mile lower than the one into which he'd flown. The climb was still arduous. Both Ven and the child, Draca, with her lithe and agile body and her dragon's strength, managed it easily. Ven actually enjoyed the climb. The strenuous physical exertion took his mind off his troubles. He had to concentrate on where to put his feet and hands. He had to think about what he was doing. He had no fear of high places. His dragon blood took care of that. He reveled in the idea that he was rising far above the world with its stink and its staring eyes and cruel laughter. When he and Draconis entered the cave that was Grald's back door, they entered the calm darkness and silent emptiness of Ven's childhood. Those times he was able to slip away from Bologna and his trap lines and his chores and hide himself in his own lair. This feels like home, he said without thinking. So it would, to one who has dragon blood in him, Draconis responded. The blood burned beneath the surface of Ven's skin. He had not meant to share his inner thought aloud. He'd spoken his heart, however, and he could not very well unsay it. Which way do we go to see this sight of yours? he demanded, regarding with a grim frown two tunnels that led from the main chamber deeper into the dragon's lair. The child motioned with her hand toward a tunnel that slanted off to the left. She put her finger to her lips, cautioning silence, and walked into the shadows, her human feet padding softly. Ven followed, his claws making scraping sounds on the rock. They advanced deeper into the massive cave, always rising. This tunnel wound round and round in a broad spiral, sometimes leveling out for a short distance, then spiraling around again, still slanting upward. The darkness was complete. Ven's dragon sight could scarcely penetrate it. He had the dragon's instinct for moving in dark places beneath the earth, however, and he followed Draconis with relative ease. The darkness grew lighter, as if sunlight had found its way below ground. He smelled fresh air, and other smells that were distinctly human, some good and some bad, and he was reminded forcibly of the city they had just left. Sounds reached Ven's ears, sounds of a great many feet moving in unison, with rhythmic march and stamp, sounds of shouted orders and unified responses. The sounds were loudest and the smells strongest at a four-way intersection of tunnels that formed a crossroads. Here Draconis halted and raised his hand. Wait, he whispered, and he peered down the tunnel that smelled strongly of men. Good, he added after a moment. No one's around. We can cross. The child darted across the intersection and into the other tunnel. Ven did the same. Then he looked back, puzzled. It sounds like there's an army down there. No need for silence. The noise of the stamping and shouting echoed throughout the corridors. There is, said Draconis. Impossible, Ven was scoffing, dismissive. This is another dragon illusion. I wish it were said Draconis. Unfortunately, it's all too real. Take a look. They had reached the same tunnel Draconis had walked the night before, coming upon it from a different angle. Motioning Ven to accompany him, Draconis led him to the ledge that overlooked the vast chamber. Ven gazed down in astonishment. Far below, drawn up in row upon shining row, was an army of humans except that this army was like no human army Ven had ever seen. Sunlight, filtering down through shafts carved into the cavern walls, gleamed on armor that had a strange and beautiful iridescent quality. At first, Ven took the armor for some sort of chain mail. The soldiers moved in the armor with far more ease than soldiers could move in chain mail, however, no matter how expensive or finely made. 
the male coats that covered them from head to toe seemed to weigh almost nothing, for the soldiers wheeled and shifted and lunged with as much ease as if they were wearing homespun wool cloth. Then looked from the armor down at his own scale-covered legs, and he thought he understood. You have judged right, Draconis said, seeing the direction of his gaze. The armor these soldiers wear is made of dragon scales. It is lightweight and strong, so strong that I doubt if any weapon forged by human hands can penetrate it. Such armor will turn the sharpest sword. Then watched the soldiers drill, watched them wheel and turn in unison, and he was puzzled. What sort of weapons are they using? And why do they fight in pairs? That is the genius of it. Think of what you know of the dragon magic. Not much, Ven muttered. They fight in pairs because each pair is made up of one male, one female. Fully half the army is composed of female warriors. Not like Bellona. These women do not fight with weapons. They fight with magic. Like the holy sisters of Seth, these women use magic to defend themselves and their partners. The men use the magic to fight. In other words, the women are the shield, the men are the sword. The weapons they are using are darts. They do not look very lethal, but they can be thrown by the hand with the force of the magic behind it. One of those darts killed Bellona. The man throws the dart from behind the cover of the defensive magic cast by the woman beside him. Both of them remain invulnerable to attack. And the dart is not their only weapon, I'll wager. But the magic drives males insane, like the mad monks. Those men don't look mad, Ven remarked. No, they're quite sane, said Draconis, like your brother Marcus. I thought I had done something special with him. Apparently, I was wrong. Over the years, Grald culled out the lunatics and placed them in the Brotherhood of the Blessed. Not a bad plan. The Blessed keep watch over the population of Dragon Keep. And if the ordinary people know that they are crazed and unpredictable, they fear them all the more. Grald put the sane males into his army. He's had hundreds of years of selective breeding, and he was able to pick and choose and train only the best. This may be the second or third generation of soldiers we're looking at. Draconis paused, then said quietly, No human army has a chance against them. Then glanced at the girl sharply. Human army? What human army do you mean? These soldiers are preparing to march to war. The dragons are going to use them to launch an attack against Idlewild. Below them, the male warriors threw darts, while the women chanted and sang, making circular motions with their hands, as though smoothing out the empty space in front of them. The magic of the women shaped the air into concentric circles, so the bodies behind it became shapeless blurs of purple and blue radiance, dazzling and ghastly. Other soldiers, ranged at intervals around the pairs, played at being the enemy. They fired arrows, real arrows, not illusion, into their ranks. Other soldiers drew swords and ran in to attack on foot. The arrows struck the dazzling, whirling, magical shields and bounced off. Swords hit the shields and were either turned aside or the blades shattered in the hands of those who wielded them. The leader called a halt to the exercise and congratulated his troops and dismissed them. For, said their leader, his voice ringing through the chamber, the days of conquest are near at hand. The day we have worked for our entire lives will shortly be upon us. When do we march? Someone cried out. Soon, was the answer. The troops dispersed, laughing and talking. The child looked very grim. What are you going to do? Ven asked. Warn Marcus? Go fight alongside him? It's not that simple, 
said Draconis, and the child's eyes were dark and troubled. He glanced at Ven. For me? Or for you, dragon's son? Draconis rose to his feet. Come with me. There's something else you need to see. They wended their way back down through the tunnels. Ven found that he had a sense of where he was, and that he could choose which branching corridor to take nine times out of ten. He liked being here. He could walk tall and straight in these dark corridors. He liked the feeling of isolation, the comfort of the silence. He thought he would like to remain here, maybe forever. They did not leave the cavern, as Ven half expected them to do. Draca took him on a new route, one that led deeper into the mountain's heart, deeper underground. Now the silence was heavy with the weight of the mountain pressing down upon them. Ven added these new corridors to his mental map, and it was like a corkscrew spiraling ever downward. They were far from civilization, far from the world. So far that when Ven heard the sound of human voices, he was severely disappointed. Hush! The child caught hold of his hand and squeezed it. Her words were little more than a disturbance of the still air. We are close! The child tugged him gently forward down a tunnel that grew lighter with every footfall. The voices were clearer now. Ven could distinguish words, and they were obviously human. What is all this? he asked, mouthing the words. The child shook her head and urged him on. The light was quite bright now. It was not the light of sun. This light had a pure white quality to it that Ven recognized. The white light was his light, the light of the emptiness that hid him from the dragon. The voices were only a few feet away. The child stopped and looked up at him. He could see her quite clearly. He could see the child. And in the stark white light, he could see the shadow of the red-gold dragon standing behind the child, wings spread protectively. Go on ahead, said Draconis. He paused, then added, regarding Ven intensely, If you want to make yourself known, that is up to you. Grald will almost certainly be informed that you were here, and I have no idea how he will react. You might be putting yourself in danger. The choice is yours, dragon's son. Ven glowered, not liking the reference. He did not like all this skulking about and mystery either. He wanted to ask questions, but he felt that to do so would be to play into Draconis's game, of which Ven was growing weary. He would not give the dragon the satisfaction. He'd go see whatever this was he was supposed to see, and then maybe they could discuss killing Grald. With a final grim glance, Ven turned and left the child standing in the tunnel. He glided forward, as quietly as his scraping claws would permit, to the tunnel's entrance. He looked into a brightly lit chamber, a largish chamber, in which about twenty people had gathered to hear another person speak. Here was the source of the human voices. But Ven had been mistaken. The voices were not human. Not entirely. Here were humans who had dragon legs, like himself. Here were humans who had human legs and dragon wings, and dragon-scaled arms, ending in clawed hands. There were males and females. Some were more dragon than others. One young female, the speaker, had a human head and breasts. The rest of her body was that of a dragon, though molded in a softer human form. Delicate wings hung from her shoulders. A little boy standing beside her was almost completely human, except for a glittering scaled tail that twitched and thumped the ground as he listened. The conversation was lively. The other half-dragons were not at all shy about questioning or challenging the speaker, who gave back as good as she got. Ven listened to them talk, but he had no sense of what they were discussing. He was too shaken. 
he sensed more than saw the child Draca come up to stand beside him. They are the dragon's sons, said Draconis softly, and the dragon's daughters. Ven was mute, struck dumb. He stood motionless, paralyzed by shock. He could only stare, his heart and his gut twisting together, so that one was wrung and the other was wrenched. They are your siblings, Ven, Draconis continued, your younger brothers and sisters. They are monsters, Ven stated harshly. He felt his gorge rising. Monsters, like me. No wonder they keep them hidden down here. The dragon's children had their own exceptional hearing. Though Ven had spoken in a whisper, they all heard, and they all turned to stare. A spy, hissed one. Wait, called out the young woman. Wait, she called again, and this time she was speaking to Ven. Do not run off. Didn't you hear us? We were talking about you. At this, a sigh rippled through the other half-dragons. The dragon's son, the dragon's son. The whisper went around, and they moved forward, not threatening, but eager and curious. Ven had been about to flee. He had his back turned, ready to run, ready to leave this horrible image behind. He told himself that to flee would be cowardly. He braced himself and turned around, faced them head on. He swallowed the bitter bile in his mouth, felt it burn down his throat into his stomach. The young half-dragon female advanced. Her human face was lovely. Her brown eyes were large and wide open to the world. The bone structure of her face and body was delicate, yet strong. Her long, glistening hair fell to the small of her back and stirred about her like a shimmering curtain when she walked. She moved with grace and elegance that was fluid and sinuous like a reptile and proud like a human, her human shoulders back and squared. Her iridescent wings quivered. The hand she held out to him was covered in scales that sparkled blue, like his own. Her hand ended in five small talons. She wore no clothes, as did some of the half-dragons, those who were more human than dragon. Her scales covered her body, which had a human torso and thighs and slender dragon legs with clawed feet, like Venn's. The scales ran up her stomach to cup around her bare human breasts. Ven saw all this in a single swift glance. Then he kept his eyes fixed on her face, because his stomach turned when he looked at the rest of her. He tried to keep his face rigid, to keep the disgust he felt from showing. But the young woman must have seen it, for she stopped walking. The hand she held out to him dropped to her side. I'm not a spy, he said the only thing he could think of to say. The young female's eyes softened. No, of course you are not a spy. You are our brother, the eldest among us. We were told you had arrived in the city, and we were hoping that our father would introduce us. We were just discussing the ceremony we were planning to welcome you. As it is, she blushed slightly, smiling, you caught us unprepared. We apologize, brother. We have looked forward to this meeting for a long, long time. You are welcome among us, very welcome. Twenty pairs of eyes, of every color known to humankind, stared out from faces, some of which were human, some dragon. They regarded him with admiration, with respect. They don't see a monster, Ven realized. Looking into the eyes of the young female half-dragon, he saw pride, pride in herself. I'm the only one who sees monsters. He was suddenly ashamed, 
for she was seeing in his eyes what he saw in the eyes of other humans when they looked at him. Fear. Disgust. He couldn't help it. They were monsters, all of them. Ven felt sick at the sight of them. He started to shake. His limbs trembled. His scaled legs grew too weak to support him, and he fell to his knees on the stone floor. He wanted to say something, but he couldn't. His throat was thick with tears he refused to let himself shed. He clasped his arms around himself and curled in on himself. He bowed his head and bowed his back, bowed himself before his siblings with a moaning cry that was not human. They gathered around him, surrounding him, supporting him. Arms that were strong and scaled and cool clasped him and held him. His sister's arms, his sister's voice, soft in his ear. You will not be alone any more, brother. From now on, you will never be alone. Seventeen. The children of the dragon, they were called, the half-human, half-dragon creatures that were Ven's half-brothers and sisters. Ven spent a long time among them that day, and listened and watched and wondered. He thought he should be pleased to know that, as his sister assured him, he was not alone in the world, that there were others of his kind. He wasn't. He was repulsed whenever he looked at the grotesque monstrosities, bits and parts of human and dragon bodies joined together without rhyme or reason. He tried not to stare at them, for he hated it when people stared at him, yet he couldn't help himself. He tried averting his eyes, but that was worse, for he too knew how terrible that felt. When a little boy came running up, his dragon's claws scraping the ground and his dragon's tail thumping the floor behind him, Ven felt his stomach heave, and he had to look away or retch. Fortunately, the child didn't notice. He sniffed at Ven, much as a dog sniffs, and said cheerfully, Pew, you stink. It's the human smell, said his sister, as she might have said, it's the garbage. Their stench clings to everything. The little boy ran off to play with other children of the dragon, some older, some younger, some with tails, some with wings and tails, some with clawed hands and no tails. If I held up a looking glass, I would see the same expression of shock and revulsion in my eyes that I saw in the eyes of my own brother, Marcus, when Marcus first looked on me. I despised Marcus for that look, but the truth is, I understood how he felt. I feel the same way when I look at myself. What is strange, what I can't understand, is that they don't feel that way about themselves. They are proud of what they are. They are not ashamed. He simply couldn't fathom it. He might have supposed it was because they had not been exposed to ordinary humans, but he was disabused of that notion when his sister, whose name was Sorrow, took him on a tour of their lair, my mother named me, Sorrow explained, seeing Ven's startled look when she told him, before she died. They say that our father, the dragon, was angry when he heard what my mother called me, for I was the firstborn, after you, of course, and he was vastly pleased with me. But my name was the last word my mother spoke and the silly human who was my wet nurse was very superstitious and said my mother's unhappy spirit would linger with me if my name was changed, and she refused to nurse me unless my mother's wishes were honored. Our father said I was to keep the name, Sorrow, but he added to it, so that now it is Bringer of Sorrow, and so I will be known to those humans we conquer— You've seen our human army? Ven could only nod. He didn't know what to say, feared saying too much, and did what he was naturally inclined to do, kept silent. You've seen other human armies in the part of Dragonvarld in which you grew up. How does ours compare? 
Sorrow asked eagerly. What did you call it? Ven interrupted. Call what? Sorrow's thoughts were on the army. The world, you had a name for it. Dragonvarld. Dragon world in the human language. Have you never heard that? It is what the dragons have called this world for centuries. I understand that the humans have some other name for it. They term it dirt or something like that. But then they don't know the truth, at least not yet. So I don't suppose we can really blame them. What truth? That the dragons are the true rulers of this world and always have been. Our father tells us that the humans fancy themselves the rulers. Sorrow laughed, rippling laughter that caused the scales on her torso to glitter and sparkle in the patches of dusty sunlight filtering down through the air shafts. All that will soon change. Then could have asked more. He could have found out all about the army, and when they were going to attack, and where. But he didn't want to know. It was easier not knowing. He didn't want to think about it, for that would require him to make decisions. Sorrow wanted to talk about it, however. She persisted in her questions. So we were speaking of our army and comparing them to the armies of other humans. Tell me what you think. There is no comparison, said Ven flatly, hoping to end the conversation. Human armies do not have magic. They will think they are being attacked by demons from hell. They will run like rabbits or die of sheer terror. That is what our father says. Sorrow was pleased to have her information confirmed. Our humans do very well for humans. Of course, they have dragon blood in them, so that is what accounts for it. Ven's thoughts went to his mother, Melisande, and to Bellona, the woman who had raised him. His mother had dragon blood in her. That was why she'd given birth to the monstrosity that was himself. Bellona had not at least so he guessed. Yet she'd been raised with those like his mother who could work the dragon magic. There is one human army who would not be afraid, then found himself saying. He was immediately sorry he brought it up, but oddly he felt as if he needed to defend his race. What army is that? Not the army of Idlewild? No, the army of a place called Seth. Ah, yes, true. We will not have to fight them, however. They are ruled by a dragon, and so will be our allies in the upcoming War of Conquest. They don't know they are ruled by a dragon, said Ven. Of course they do, Sorrow returned, amused. No, they don't. My mother came from there, as did the woman who raised me after my mother's death. Bellona told me that the people of Seth think that dragons are their enemies. They have been taught to hate and fear them. But every month, the people of Seth send us their strongest male children to be raised here. The babies are smuggled out in the dead of night. No one in Seth knows the truth, except for one, the mistress of dragons. And that's because she is the dragon. Like Grald, she has stolen the body of a human and uses that body to keep the humans in ignorance. Stolen? A human body? What are you talking about? Grald, our father, the dragon, stole a human body, that hulking piece of excrement known as Grald. The dragon uses that body when he walks among humans. He used that body to rape my mother and bring me into the world. I don't believe you, Sorrow cried angrily. Our father would never inhabit a human body. Our father is above such things. Grald is a human who serves the dragon. A human, she said, laying emphasis on the word. Vane shrugged. He couldn't prove what he'd said. He thought it interesting that Grald hadn't told his children the truth. Difficult to proclaim yourself human when you've taught your children to despise and look down on that race. Ven wondered what the people of Seth would do when they found out the truth. 
He'd once asked Bellona why she didn't return to Seth and tell the people what she knew. I will never go back there, Bellona had told him harshly. I would see your mother everywhere. And then she had looked at him, something she rarely did, for she couldn't stand the sight of him, and she had brushed back the hair from his forehead. That will be your task, then. Then. Vengeance. He had forgotten her words about his task until now. Even dead, she added to his burden. Brother and sister walked through the palace in silence. He could tell by the flush on her face and the tight line of her lips that Sorrow was still angry with him. The high color on her cheeks faded after time, when he didn't say anything more, and she smiled at him. Are you teasing me? she asked. About Grald? I've heard it's something humans do to each other. Teasing? Ven might have been accused of many failings in his life, but teasing people was not one of them. He didn't know how to answer, and so he kept silent. Sorrow took his silence for acquiescence. Just don't say anything to the little ones, will you? I don't want them confused. I won't, Ven agreed. He had no intention of getting that well acquainted with the little ones anyway. All this time, he and his sister had been walking through the palace, traveling up and down corridors and tunnels that crossed and crisscrossed, sometimes opening into chambers that were small and cozy, and sometimes opening into vast, cavernous halls. They saw many of the human soldiers as these men and women traversed the lair. When they passed these soldiers, the humans would bow to sorrow, as ordinary humans might bow to Prince Marcus, treating her with marked respect and reverence. She received their obeisance and murmured greetings with careless dignity, making it clear that this was her due and she expected nothing less. The same respect and reverence extended to Ven, but he was as uncomfortable with it down here as he was in the world outside. He saw, too, that the children of the dragon did not mingle with their distant cousins, the humans who had the dragon blood in their veins but no scales on their bodies. The children of the dragon had their own living quarters that were set apart from those of the human soldiers. If the two met, the children held themselves aloof. Once on their tour, Sorrow came upon one of the dragon children playing with a human. She grabbed hold of the arm of the dragon child and hauled him off to a dark corner and scolded him roundly, then sent him off to play with his own kind. The only humans allowed in our part of the palace are the mothers, those who bear us. I want to see them, said Ven, the first words he'd spoken almost since they started. Why ever for? Sorrow was astonished. They are humans who are strong in the dragon magic, but apart from that, they are like any other humans, except that they have been honored by our father. I just do, said Ven. He could not tell his sister. She would not understand. He wasn't sure he understood himself. Sorrow shrugged and led him to where the women who were due to give birth to the half-dragon children were kept in isolation. There were about ten of them. Sometimes there were more, Sorrow said, sometimes less. All of them were near the end of their time, their bellies distended and swollen, their faces haggard and pale, their bodies thin and wasted, for the dragon child inside each was literally sucking the life out of its mother. Ven looked at them, and he saw his own mother, Melisande, she had also been honored by Grald. Do any survive the birth? he asked. Not many, said Sorrow in matter-of-fact tones. Those who do are sickly and die soon after. Why do you look at them like that? They are to be envied, not pitied. The women of Dragon Keep vie for this honor. Only the very best are chosen, and they consider themselves extremely fortunate. Do these women look like they consider themselves fortunate? Ven demanded. They are human, said Sorrow disparagingly, 
I don't look at them at all if I can help it. The dragon lies to them, Sorrow, Ven said, repeating what Draconis had told him. The dragon tells the girls they are coming to live in luxury in this palace. Instead, he brings them here and impregnates them, and in essence, murders them. Sorrow was silent a moment, the flush of anger creeping back to her face. Then she said quite calmly, You think I should be shocked to hear that the dragon lies to them? I am not. Humans have no capacity to understand the dragon mind. You have lived among them. Do they understand you? Sorrow's eyes softened. I know your story, Ven. The human growled, told us. He said that they put you in a cage that they mocked you and ridiculed you. He said that even your own foster mother told you that you are the devil's spawn and that you believe her. Ven regarded her in grim silence. I am sorry, brother. I did not mean to bring up these hurtful things. Grald told us that it might make you sad. Sorrow's fingers touched his arm lightly. Her flesh was warm, the long talons cool by contrast. Is he wrong in what he says of you? No, Ven answered after a moment. He is not wrong. Grald was not right either, but Ven couldn't explain that. His feelings were a jumble, his world turned topsy-turvy, so that black was white and white was black, good was evil and evil had been made good, or maybe it was all just a muddy shade of gray. He envied his sister, envied her pride in herself. He envied her clear, sharply delineated view of life. He envied sorrow, her ideas about the dragon, far different from his. She had been raised to honor her father and disparage her mother. He'd been taught just the opposite. Which was right? Both? Neither? It was all such a tangled, twisted mess. He couldn't sort it out. Life would be much easier, simpler, if he took his sister's view of it. Yet something about her life wasn't quite right. Just as something about his own life wasn't right. Fumbling for the answer, he spoke his thoughts aloud. If we are taught to believe that we are better than humans because we are half dragon, then doesn't it follow that we are viewed by dragons as being less worthy than one of their own kind? Who knows but that among themselves they mock us and ridicule us the same as humans. We are neither, you see, and despised by both. No, of course not, Sorrow retorted. Our father is proud of us. We are his greatest achievement. Ven shook his head. Sorrow seemed about to add more, but she clamped her lips and even managed a wry smile. It seems we are brother and sister. We have been together only a few hours, and already we are quarreling. I'm sorry, said Ven, and he meant it. I'm trying to understand, that's all. I'm just trying to understand. Have you talked to our father about your feelings? Sorrow asked him. Ven wondered what she would say if he told her he was determined to kill the father she so revered. Sorrow clasped his hand, squeezed it tightly. Do so. Our father wants the chance to try to explain. He says that the humans have mistreated you so that you are all twisted up inside. Maybe that's true, Ven said to himself. Maybe I should hear my father's side of the story. I will, he said suddenly. I will talk to him this night. Thank you, sister. He spoke the word awkwardly, but found it felt good. It warmed a place inside him that had been cold almost forever. He basked in the warmth, until one of the mothers gave a cry of agony, her back arching with the pain. The skirts of her dress were suddenly stained red with blood. It is her time, said Sorrow, pleased. Another brother or sister will soon be with us. The woman was moaning and writhing with the birth pangs. 
Her face had gone deathly pale, her eyes wide and staring. Women dressed as holy sisters came swiftly to her aid, and lifting her gently, they bore her away. The other mothers-to-be looked after her, their faces strained, and they placed their hands on their own monstrously swollen wombs. One looked at sorrow and at Ven. Tears began to stream down her cheeks. Her crying was soundless, and it was all the more terrible for being silent. Ven turned and walked away, his clawed feet scraping against the stone. The sound was loud in his ears. Even Sorrow, who joined him, seemed subdued. Even human babies are born in pain, she said, as much to herself as to him, and sometimes they kill the mother who bears them. I need to get back, Ven said. He did not add that he wasn't supposed to be here. Sorrow so clearly thought that her revered father had sent him. I would urge you to stay with us, she said, but you need to talk with our father. Tomorrow you will return to us and be one of us, always. I would like that, Ven said, and part of him meant it. Another part of him said it only because he didn't want to hurt his sister. 18. On the morning of the day Ven entered the mountain, Evelina was taking a stroll over to the beach area where the boats were moored. Most of the fishermen were already at their work. She could see the shadowy forms of their boats slipping in and out of the mists rising from the river. One man remained on shore, however, doing something with a net, mending it perhaps, he wasn't looking at the work in his hands. He had his eyes fixed on her. He'd had his eyes on her ever since she'd walked into view. Evelina remembered him immediately. He had carried her from the boat, lifting her up in his strong arms and ferrying her to shore so that her feet didn't get wet. He desired her. That was obvious. He took no trouble to hide his lust. Rather, he flaunted it. Evelina guessed that he had stayed away from his fishing on the off chance that he might run into her. Evelina was glad to make use of any man who offered himself, especially a man so strong and good-looking, with his dark hair and eyes and sun-browned skin. Feigning not to notice him, she walked closer, looking at the sky, the river, and the crudely built but snug little dwellings. "'Good morning, mistress,' he said. Evelina gave an affected start. Oh, you startled me, sir. I didn't see you. Good morning, she returned, adopting a tone that was frost-rhymed, with just a hint that she might possibly thaw if the sun were warm enough. His hands were busy with the net, feeling their way over the rope, his eyes busy with her, feeling their way over her body. What brings you out so early on this fine morning, mistress, he asked. I need a potion for his highness's wounds that he took on our journey. Perhaps you have a wise woman here who brews up such healing liquors? Aye, mistress, we do, the man answered. The widow Huspeth lives in the woods. Strange woman, but she knows what she's about, I guess. You'll find a trail leads to her dwelling, though I would be glad to show you the way myself. No, thank you, my good man, said Evelina with a grateful glance from beneath her lashes. I will find the way. I bid you good day. Perhaps I'll see you tonight, said the fisherman with a smile. His teeth were white against his black beard that was cut short so that it outlined his firm jaw. I don't know why you should, said Evelina. She had plans for this night. She turned to go. My house is close by, he told her as she departed. It will be the one with the candle in the window. If you feel the need of company, come knock on my door. My name is George. Evelina did not reply. She walked away, 
her head held high, yet she was pleased to know that she could still charm a man. What with the way Marcus had been acting around her, she'd been starting to have her doubts. She found the trail through the wilderness and soon came upon the house of the herbalist. Evelina was expecting the usual half-mad crone, toothless and gray-haired, crouched over a bubbling cauldron, and she was considerably disconcerted to find a woman of no more than thirty years, clad in man's breeches and a man's shirt, down on her hands and knees, grubbing among the plants in a large garden. Evelina approached quietly, wanting to see before she was seen. The woman was instantly aware of the unfamiliar presence in her woods. She turned her head and rose to her feet, all in one fluid motion. Keep to the trail, the woman said, her voice husky as if not much used. I don't want my plants trampled. Evelina glanced about. She saw no signs of the woman's house and guessed that it was hidden deeper in the wilderness. The woman wiped dirt from her hands and crossed over to where Evelina stood waiting. I'm looking for the widow Husbeth, said Evelina. You're a stranger, said the woman, not from the village. I am, Evelina began. It doesn't matter, said the woman coldly. I just want to be clear where we stand. What do you want? I want the widow, said Evelina, starting to grow annoyed. The woman's eyes were hard and bright and went through Evelina like a skewer. They call me Widow Huspeth hereabouts, though my name is just Huspeth. What do you want? she repeated. Evelina found it difficult to talk to those shrewd eyes. She gazed at some red flowers as she spoke. I want a fertility potion and the liquor they call absinthe. Husbeth smiled. Your man won't marry you, is that it? So you're going to force the issue. Evelina's cheeks flushed, though not with maidenly confusion. I am already married. We want a child, that is all. The woman brushed her indignation aside and came back to the practical. I have what you want, but it works only at certain times of the month. When did you last bleed? Evelina was startled and suspicious. She'd had no mother to explain such things, and basically all she knew about childbearing was that when the monthly bleeding and cramps stopped, you had a baby nine months later. She was not all that clear on why this should be, however, or what one had to do with the other. Why does that matter? she demanded, thinking this was becoming a bit too personal. There is a scientific explanation, but you wouldn't understand, and I don't care to try to explain it, said Huspeth dryly. Let us leave it at this. A woman who wants to conceive has a better chance of doing so in the middle of her cycle. Evelina thought back. A fortnight... Maybe a little longer. The woman grunted and shook her head. The potion still has a chance of working, but you must lie with him this night. Already it may be too late. As for the other you asked for, what did you call it? Evelina was accustomed to doing her business with city apothecaries. Absinthe. It's also known as wormwood. You distill, I know it never heard it by that other name. What have you brought in payment? I don't do this for charity. I have no money. I have no use for money, Huspeth said, her lip curling. Evelina unwrapped a bundle to reveal some fish she'd stolen from the rack where they'd been left to dry in the sun. The woman eyed the fish, then gave a curt nod. Wait here, and don't go trampling my plants. Husbeth took the fish and stalked off, disappearing into the forest. Mad as a hornet, Evelina muttered. She stood on the trail, looking about her in bored fashion. Bees and butterflies clustered among bright red flowers in one part of the garden. The air was warm and still, and she could smell more rain coming. She fidgeted, wishing the woman would hurry, 
She'd passed a stream on the way, and she wanted time to bathe and scrub those telltale stains from her clothes. Just when she thought that the widow had abandoned her, Huspeth appeared, walking down the trail. She handed Evelina two small containers made of baked clay, stoppered with cheesecloth tied neatly around the top. This, the woman pointed to one of the clay vials, is the liquor for him. I'm thinking you know how it works. Evelina smiled. She had never made use of absinthe herself. She was accustomed to fending lovers off, not working to seduce them. Her father had been known to resort to the use of the green aphrodisiac on occasion, either drinking it himself to heighten his own pleasure, or slipping it into the drink of some unsuspecting girl. And this is for you, Huspeth continued, to help with the baby. Drink it now, so that it has a chance to work. Evelina sniffed at it. She didn't detect anything wrong about it, and so she lifted it to her lips and drank. The taste was sweet. It had been laced with honey. She felt it slide down her, warm and soothing. You must lie with him tonight, Huspeth emphasized, and no guarantees. Evelina understood. She took the clay vial containing the aphrodisiac and tucked it into her bosom. Turning on her heel, the woman walked back through the garden. Mind you don't trample my plants, Huspeth added, tossing the warning over her shoulder. Smiling to herself in anticipation of the evening's pleasures, Evelina went off to a secluded spot on the riverbank to take her bath. She did not know that George was discreetly following her and was watching her from the trees. And that was a pity, for the knowledge would have heightened her enjoyment of her bath immensely. 19. Grald roamed about the cavernous hall of the abbey, waiting for news, his scowling face and clenched fists a terror to the blessed, who, when they were forced to speak to him, cringed and blanched at the spark of fury in his eyes. The monks had lost Ven, and Grald had made it plain that unless the dragon's son was found, some of them would pay for their folly with their lives. At last, one monk came striding across the grassy field that surrounded the abbey, walking with the long and purposeful gait of one who bears important news. By the expression on his face, when he threw back his cowl, the news was rather good than otherwise. Seeing who it was, Grald immediately dismissed the other monks to speak to this one in private. He was the monk of the bridge, the monk Draconus had encountered, whose eyes were not as mad as the eyes of most. He was, in fact, not a monk at all, but a high-ranking officer in the army of the dragons and one of Grald's most trusted agents. Commander Leopold, Grald exclaimed in satisfaction. You have news, I see. His hulking body hunched over that of the soldier, who, though he was tall for a human, was head and shoulders shorter than Grald. Have you found him? I have, Lord, the soldier replied. He is in the palace. Leopold paused to let this information sink in, then added, He is with the children. Grald sucked in a breath through his teeth and let it hiss out in a name. Draconis. The walker found a way inside. Despite our best efforts, Lord, I am afraid he did. As I told you, I am certain it was Draconis who tried to talk his way past me on the bridge that night, although then he was disguised as a monk. My shield mate was the one who saw Ven inside the palace, and she told me that he was accompanied by a child, a little girl. Of course, a very clever, Grald muttered. What idiots we have been searching for the man, Draconis, when naturally he would take on another form. What is Ven doing? Is he still there? What did he tell the children? I do not know, Lord, Leopold was forced to admit. My shield mate feared to come too near the children. They do not react well to humans spying on them. You recall what they did the last time. Grald smiled, proud of his children's ferocity. They had not actually slain the man, 
who had mistakenly wandered into their part of the cave. Their attack had, however, left him a gibbering idiot, and a one-armed idiot at that. Thinking of the children brought to mind the yearly ritual when he would invite another group of young women, chosen because they were strong in the magic, into his palace. Grald rubbed his hands in anticipation. This year would be momentous. He planned to impregnate the women using Ven's body. He hoped that the seed of that half-dragon body, mingled with the magic of himself, the dragon, would produce far better children, more dragon and less human. It is fitting, Grald thought, that Ven should be the one to take over this task. He proved that I was right in my theory that we could breed more like him. All I require are women like his mother, who are strong in the magic. What else did Vin see inside the palace? Grald asked. The army, replied the commander. Grald ground his teeth in ire. He will alert the humans if he can, warn his brother. What does it matter? asked Leopold imperturbably. I've seen human armies. There's nothing they can do against us. Whatever Ven tells them of us will only plant terror in their hearts. Fear is a fast-growing tree that bears noxious fruit. That may be true, but I don't trust the walker. He must not leave Dragon Keep. I want him dead. The commander was dubious. Pardon me if I point out, Lord, that one of your own kind attempted to kill the walker and failed. Anora bungled it said Grald bluntly. She foolishly alerted Draconis instead of taking him by surprise. Or perhaps her action was not so foolish, perhaps. It was deliberate. The Walker and Honora have been friends for many centuries. His eyes narrowed so that they nearly disappeared in the shadows of his overhanging brow. Draconis is cunning, but I am more so. This time, we will catch the walker off guard. Then we'll kill Draconis. Ven is hardly strong enough. Not the old Ven, Grald interrupted with a grin. The new Ven. Once I have taken over my son's body, I will go to Draconis on some pretext or other, and I will slay him. As simple as that. Ah said the soldier in understanding. We must move faster than we've anticipated, however. When my son leaves the palace, apprehend him. Make no mention of the fact that you know where he has been. Let him think he has fooled us. Bring him here to me tonight, at the hour past slumber when all is quiet. And the walker? Grald thought this over. He must not be allowed to interfere with my plans. Keep him occupied. Leopold bowed. As you command, Lord. I have one more question. Ask it, said Grald. When may I return to my company? My shield mate and I do not want to miss out on the battle. Do not worry, Commander. You will march with your comrades. You are too valuable a warrior to remain disguised as a monk forever. Leopold bowed at the compliment and took his departure. Ven left the cavern by the way he'd entered. The sun was sinking into the west, and the shadows were long by the time he descended from the mountain and found his way back to the city. That part wasn't difficult. He simply followed the smell, the stench of humanity. He'd never noticed it before. Now he knew he would never get it out of his nostrils. The blessed pounced on him almost immediately. They said nothing, but he knew they knew where he'd been without a word being spoken. Their eyes flitted to him and flitted away. Like Bellona, they never looked at him long if they could help it. I want to see Grald, Ven demanded as they wound their way through the maze of streets. Grald wants to see you, dragon's son replied one of the monks, one who had a saner look than the others. He actually met and held Ven's gaze. Good, said Ven, rather nonplussed. 
then take me to him. Not yet, the blessed said. Graud is busy with the plans for war. He says that you should dine first and rest yourself after the exertions of the day. Graud bids you come to him after the hour of slumber. Very well. Venn did not like being bid to do anything, but he was ravenously hungry. He had been too distracted by his inner turmoil to eat anything beneath the mountain. And he was exhausted, not so much physically as mentally. He had a lot to think over before meeting with his father. As for slaying Grald, his death might not be necessary. That was one of the things Venn had to think over. He was intrigued by the new way of viewing himself offered to him by his siblings. He had seen himself reflected only in the eyes of humans, and that was like looking into water stirred by the wind, so that his reflection was always distorted and warped. He'd seen himself in the eyes of Bellona, who had been ashamed of him and loathed him. He'd seen himself in the eyes of Evelina, who'd seen a freak, a beast. His siblings had lifted up before him a mirror of pure crystal, without flaw, touched by no emotion, and he'd seen himself honored, revered, a miracle of creation that combined the best parts of two separate entities to create a new kind of person, someone who was not unnatural, but had his or her own place in the world. That this miracle came at the cost of a human's life was regrettable, but then, as Sorrow had said, many human children walking the earth this very day had come into the world at the mother's expense. Perhaps I don't need to take revenge against the dragon. Perhaps instead I should thank and honor him. Ven went to his supper and ate with a good appetite. Then he lay down on his bed, not to sleep, but to consider all the questions he would ask his father, the dragon. Grald sniffed about the vast hall in the abbey. Once he was certain by both sight and smell that he was alone, he walked over to a portion of the wall that was solid stone to the eyes of humans, empty air to his dragon eyes. The illusion concealed a tomb made of granite, with a heavy granite lid that now rested on the floor. Inside was the body of Grald, the body the dragon inhabited. Tonight, the human would finally receive his release in death. Grald would tear out Ven's heart and place it in the golden locket. He would seize the young, strong body, and when that was done, he would take what was left of Ven and place him inside the tomb. The dragon would lift the heavy lid of the coffin in his claws and seal Ven inside. There the young man would continue to live, buried alive, his still-beating heart fueling the body the dragon had usurped. Ven might live for thirty or forty years, Grald calculated. The dragon would get thirty or forty years of good use from the young man's body, maybe longer. And when that body eventually aged and died, the dragon would have many more bodies of his own children from which to choose. My offspring will be a force in this world, he said proudly placing his hands on the lid of the tomb and gazing at it with satisfaction. My armies will conquer human nations. My children will rule them. We dragons will bring order to this world of humans, teach them to obey and respect their masters. I almost wish Ven could be at my side to see it. Grald imagined what it would be like to be trapped, suffering inside this coffin. Trapped for years without end, the minutes dropping so slowly, like the blood of the ravaged heart. A noble sacrifice, Ven, said the dragon softly, one that will be long remembered. Grald made certain that the illusion was still in place, that the tomb remained hidden to all eyes but his. Then, his thoughts going on to other matters, the dragon left, to apprise Maristara and Honora that their plans had changed, 
that Draconis had been discovered alive, and that of necessity the war must go forward sooner than anticipated. He did not expect the elder females to be happy about the situation, and he was right. They weren't. The conversation between the three dragons was an explosion of color, blobs of anger hurled onto a mental canvas. Grald and Honora, in particular, went at each other, accusations sharp as claws tearing and ripping until the canvas was in shreds and came perilously close to being destroyed. Stop it, ordered Maristara, her colors black as hoarfrost. You both stink of fear. The battling dragons went silent, their colors subdued, though still smoldering. Not fear, Grald returned our own damnable reluctance to act. He's right, Honora conceded grudgingly. Her colors were gray with fatigue. We dragons will find any excuse to keep from taking that first step off the ledge. The first step has been taken, Maristara reminded them. We must now either flap our wings or fall to our doom into the pit below. You, Honora, you have said that you walk among the humans. I am with them now. The takeover of the latest body went smoothly, no one suspects. I find I am starting to hate this, though, Honora returned bitterly, this killing of humans in order to use their bodies. I found this murder particularly reprehensible. Honora is weakening, was the alarmed thought that flashed from Maristara to Grald. None of us likes it, said Grald, lying, for he enjoyed the killing. I am going to be forced to slay my own son. You don't see me whining over it. And when will you kill him, Maristara demanded. We cannot make a move until you have taken over the half-dragon's body. Tonight said Grald. The arrangements are made. And the walker? Slaying him will be my first course of action, once I am in my new body. I will take care of that tonight as well. Maristara and Grald waited for Honora to object, but her colors were hidden. Good, said Grald. Then if all goes according to plan... The army of Dragon Keep will make ready to march against the humans tomorrow. So soon, Honora murmured. Is this a problem? Maristara asked irritably. No, I am prepared to act. Not too precipitously, I hope, Maristara said. The timing must be right. The humans must be made to think that this cannon of theirs brought about the catastrophe. You have no cause to worry, Honora returned, her colors taking on a fiery glow. I know what I am about. Very good, said Maristara. Then we will each keep the other apprised. Good fortune to us all. Tomorrow will be a momentous day for all of dragonkind. A day too long coming, if you ask me, Grald muttered. No one did, said Honora, and her colors disappeared with a snap. Twenty. Draconis hurried through the streets of Dragonkeep, hoping to reach home by supper time so as not to worry Rosa. The hour was sunset, and the streets were crowded with other homeward-bound people. Draconis had to dodge and weave his way along the narrow streets. His disguise as a hoyden aided him in this, for he bumped, shoved, jostled, or pushed people as needed, and received in turn nothing more than a muttered scolding or a threat to box his ears, whereas an adult behaving in a similar rude manner would have ended up in a fistfight. Worrying about someone worrying about you is not a dragon trait. Independent, solitary beings, dragons enjoy the freedom of doing what they please, when they please, without thought or care for any other. Humans, on the other hand, need to care and be cared for in return. 
that Rosa and Anton were coming to care deeply for the young girl who had intruded into their lives was becoming increasingly apparent to Draconis. Their caring was an added and unexpected burden, a burden he did not need right now. No good telling himself he should have foreseen it. In the split second he'd had to make his decision, he'd been thinking only of his own survival, not looking ahead to see how that survival might impact the lives of humans. As a walker, he was supposed to have as little effect on human lives as possible, a rule he'd effectively scuttled years ago when he had started on this disastrous enterprise. Since then, he'd ended up entangled in more human lives than he wanted to think about. It's like one of their blasted round dances, Draconis grumbled to himself as he ran down the street, his long braids flying out behind him. You start out with one human, and things are going fine. Then suddenly the music changes, and you're handed off to another human. Then another after that. And before you know it, you find yourself a long way from where you want to be. As if fate were determined to prove him right, Draconis's need to race home caused him to burst into the house without first doing what he would have normally done, taken a careful inspection of his surroundings. If Draconis had been paying attention, he would have seen the monk loitering in the street, and he would have known immediately that this night he should not go home. He should have let the humans worry. As it was, Draconis was in too much haste to notice. He arrived to find that Rosa was out, and he had time to chop the carrots and the onions, ready to add to the meat that was already in the stew pot, when Rosa opened the door. It's good to come home to a warm house and supper already started, said Rosa, taking off her scarf and giving the girl a hug. She gazed at Draca and added with a frown, what have you been up to? You look as though you've spent the day crawling about in a cave. I trust you washed your hands before you started the cooking. Yes, ma'am, said Draconis, exhibiting hands and arms that were clean to the elbow, if not much beyond that. Your face is filthy, and you've even got dirt in your hair, said Rosa, scandalized. You had best go wash up before Anton comes home. Though, poor man she sighed. I think it likely he'll be late again this night. Draconis thought so too, since Anton was helping to make the weapons of war that the dragon army would carry into human lands. As he poured water into the crockery bowl the family used for washing, he thought of the daughter that Rosa and Anton would never see again. And he thought of the hideous grandchild that she had borne them a grandchild that resembled the daughter they loved, except with clawed feet, or perhaps wings and a tail. He would never tell them, of course. In this dance, the music would not change. The partners would not shift. The dancers would keep dancing until the final beat of the drum. There came a knock at the door. Strange time for visitors, said Rosa, turning from the bubbling stew pot over which she had been hovering to peer out the window. She gave a little gasp. It's one of the blessed. Draconis knew in that instant that he'd made a mistake. He should not have come back to this house. He'd been discovered. Perhaps Ven had given him away, although Draconis didn't think that likely. Ven was one to keep himself to himself, Draconis considered it far more likely that someone in the palace had seen through his illusion and tracked him down. Rosa opened the door, and there was the exact monk of the bridge, sane eyes and all. Good evening, brother, said Rosa nervously with a strained smile. Good evening, mistress, said the monk. He was relaxed, his tone natural. His gaze, as he glanced about the house, was casual. If he saw Draca standing at the back of the room, he took no special notice of her. This is the home of Master Anton, the blacksmith, is it not? Yes, brother... Rosa hesitated. Brother Leopold. Is your good man about? The monk asked politely. 
No, Brother Leopold, he is working late this night, Rosa replied. You will find him in the smithy. I can show you if you will come. As she started out the door, she was closing it behind her. Bless you, Draconis said to her softly. Unfortunately, the monk stopped her. Thank you, mistress, he said, smiling affably. I would not think of interrupting his work. I will wait for him here, if my presence is not an inconvenience. Rosa murmured something, and with a frightened glance at Draca, she opened the door to allow the monk to enter. The monk walked into the house and stood politely until Rosa offered him a chair. He sat down, and his gaze went over the house again. Rosa remained standing, twisting her skirt in her hands. Whatever you are cooking smells delicious, Brother Leopold said, glancing at the stew pot, from which a fragrant aroma of onions and meat and spices was rising. You wait until your good man comes home to dine, I take it. Rosa murmured something unintelligible, and then did not know what to do with herself. She continued to stand near the door, twisting the cloth. A tense silence fell, tense on the part of Draconis and Rosa. The monk appeared to be quite at home. Smiling, he settled comfortably in his chair and continued to look about, apparently quite taken with what he saw. You are a good housekeeper, Mistress Rosa, he said, and his gaze went at last to Draca and remained on her. Your daughter must be a great help to you. Rosa gulped, unable to answer. What is your name, child? Brother Leopold asked. Draca, answered Draconis. He forced himself to meet the monk's gaze with the frank and unabashed stare of a curious child. Come closer, Draca, said the monk, reaching out his hand. You are not afraid of me? Good. So many children are, he added sadly to Rosa. It's too bad, really. Draconis walked over to the monk. He could not figure out what was going on. One minute he thought the monk knew exactly who and what he was. The next he thought he didn't. Perhaps this was just business with Anton. You are very pretty, Draca. The monk took hold of her hand. Smart, too, I'll wager. Are you smart, Draca? I hope so, brother, Draconis answered. And you like to walk, don't you, Draca? said Brother Leopold. He patted her hand. I've seen you walking about town, haven't I? Quite the walker. Draconis stared hard at the monk. Still smiling, still affable, still patting Draca's hand, the monk gazed intently at him. Quite the walker, the monk repeated. There was no doubt now in Draconis's mind that the monk knew who and what he was, and that he was telling Draconis he knew. Draconis tensed, waiting for the attack, waiting to be arrested, waiting for who knew what, the monk released the girl's hand with a final pat and turned back to Rosa. Do you mind if I invite myself to dinner, my good woman? Truly, the food smells wonderful. We get no such meals in the monastery, I assure you. It would be a treat for me. Of course, Brother Leopold, Rosa stammered. We, we would be honored. Draca, run and fetch Anton. Tell him we have a guest. Oh, do not make Drake a walk over there, protested the monk. His gaze fixed on Draconis. The monk's eyes were focused and intense and alert and in no way mad. Draca has walked such a lot this day. She should rest. I am in no hurry. I have been working at the sight of the blast, he added, continuing to look at Draca. A terrible thing. So many buildings and lives destroyed. Fortunately, that part of the city was only sparsely inhabited. We are indeed lucky that the blast did not occur in this neighborhood. Many more would have died, hundreds upon hundreds, including Anton and Rosa. 
and our little Draca here, and other children just like her. The monk smiled at Draconis, then added, There are those who believe that human life is cheap, that the life of a human is not worth that of, say, a dragon, for example. What do you think, Draca? Such a great walker as yourself must have an opinion. Some believe that, Draconis replied, meeting the monk's gaze. But not you said Brother Leopold. Draconis paused, then said steadily, Once I did, but not any more. I would not want anything bad to happen to the people of this neighborhood. Good for you, child, said the monk with a nod. We may all look forward to a quiet evening at home this night. Rosa stood staring from one to the other in confusion. Ah! said Brother Leopold, rising. Here is our good blacksmith now. Greetings, Master Anton. Anton, considerably astonished, stood stock still in the door. Rosa sidled up to him and nudged him, and he came to himself. Mumbling his greetings, he entered the house. When the monk resumed his seat, Anton took the opportunity to flash an alarmed and questioning glance at his wife. Rosa shook her head and shrugged helplessly. Both of them looked at Draca. Draconis knew more than they did. He knew why the monk had come. The monk had made that plain. Draconis was to spend a quiet evening at home this night. If he did not, something bad would happen, not only to Rosa and Anton, but to every human living in this part of the city. Draconis offered to go lay the table for supper. The monk sat at his ease, talking with a bemused Anton about how his work was coming. Rosa followed Draca into the kitchen to look distractedly at the stew. Draconis spread the well-worn cloth and set out the crockery bowls and the horn spoons. As he placed the human utensils on the table and prepared to eat the human food, he realized that he had just made his decision. He had declared where he stood in this war between humans and dragons. He sided with humans, against his own kind. He felt a deep and abiding sorrow at this, but he did not regret his decision. His own kind were wrong. The four of them sat down to the simple meal. Rosa ladled out the stew into the bowls. Draconis dipped his spoon into the broth, he was shoving aside a detested carrot to get at the meat, when Ven came hurtling out of the cave in which he'd hidden himself for all the years of his life. Ven came running straight at Draconis. Grald chased him. The dragon's claw reached out for Ven, for his heart. Draconis dropped the spoon in the bowl, splashing hot broth all over the table and startling everyone. Draca? asked Rosa anxiously. What's wrong? Are you ill? Draconis looked up to find the monk's sane eyes fixed on him. Nothing is wrong, Rosa, said Draconis after a pause. I'm sorry. I'll clean up the mess I made. The irony of the words struck him. All along it was what he'd been trying to do. Clean up the mess. He left the table to get a cloth. He could not help Ven. He could not save him. Melisande's son would have to save himself. Or rather, Melisande's sons. Perhaps he could do something after all. Demurely keeping his eyes lowered, Draconis went back to the table and began mopping up the spill. The monk could stop his dragon body from leaving this house. The monk could not stop his dragon mind. Draconis's colors flared. Purple? and gold. Lysira, are you there? He cried silently as he kept an eye on the monk. Yes, Draconis, said the young female immediately. The monk was rising to his feet. He had quit smiling. You seem to be deep in thought, little girl, said the monk. Lysira, said Draconis, knowing he did not have much time, find Marcus. Enter his mind. 
enter his mind? The mind of a human? Draconis, I'm not sure you can do it. You must. Tell him. Brother Leopold reached out his hand, placed it on Draconis's head. You do not look well. I think now is time for rest. Draconis squeezed out one burst of color before darkness overtook him, and he sagged to the floor. She's had such a busy day, said the monk solicitously. Lifting Draca in his arms, he carried the unconscious girl to bed. 21. Draconis's plan to alert Marcus to his brother's danger was an excellent one. Sadly, Draconis forgot his own mantra. Humans are unpredictable. Even after hundreds of years among humans, Draconis could have never predicted Evelina. Marcus woke about mid-afternoon from a deep sleep that left him feeling sluggish and thick-headed. Alarmed to find the day so far advanced, he hastened out to ask if young Tom had been sent for the king's men. The patriarch assured Marcus that the young man had left that morning. Due to the rain, however, the earliest the king's men might be expected was sometime tomorrow. Marcus didn't like this news, and he was short with the patriarch, who was humbly apologetic. Young Tom did not have a horse, nor did he have wings. The road was as long as God made it, and the king's men would be here when they were here. Marcus knew he was being unreasonable, but he longed for home. Since the patriarch expected all royalty to be unreasonable, no harm was done. The good old man hinted that a swim in the river might clear Marcus's head and lift his spirits, and he offered to provide a change of clothes, although certainly not the sort of clothes to which the prince was accustomed. Grateful and ashamed of his bad temper, Marcus accepted. The swim did clear his head and left him feeling refreshed. He was glad to discard the monk's robes, which had become hateful to him, and put on homespun breeches and a much-patched woolen shirt. After that, he idled away the afternoon, refusing to let himself think about anything. He watched the fishermen return with the day's catch, and further distracted himself by talking with them about their livelihood. He asked some guarded questions about the sunken cave, wondering if these men had any idea that they were living in such close proximity to a vast city hidden inside an enchanted forest. He found that none of the fishermen ventured past the fork in the river. The fishing was bad, he was told, and the waters treacherous. They fished the waters their fathers and grandfathers had fished before them and saw no reason to go anywhere else. Their lives were good, with the exception of the occasional flood, and when that happened, they buried their dead and shoveled the mud out of their dwellings and went back to plying the river when it had returned to its banks. Marcus also wondered what had become of Evelina. He asked around for her, and one of the women told him that Evelina had gone to the river, to an area where the women did their laundry, and that they were taking good care of her. He was not to worry about her. Marcus didn't. He'd find a private moment to speak to her tonight. He had to explain to her, as delicately as possible, that he was not in love with her. Manlike, he assumed they'd have a logical, rational discussion, and that would end the matter. The village held a feast in his honor that night, serving up fish and onions and potatoes all boiled together in an enormous kettle hung over a roaring fire. He saw Evelina, but did not have a chance to talk to her, for the men and women ate separately, the women after they had served the men. Evelina had apparently won favor with the women of the village, for they were making much of her. Someone had given her a change of clothing, like his own, worn and patched but clean and comfortable. She looked fresh scrubbed and wholesome in her homespun garb, and when she caught him looking at her, she blushed and smiled. Marcus felt a pang of uneasiness. The thought came to him suddenly that Evelina might not be all that logical. He tried to signal to her that he wanted to talk, 
but he could never catch her eye. She seemed to be willfully ignoring him. The next thing he knew, the sun was sinking into the river, and the fisher folk were heading to their beds. Evelina walked off with the patriarch's daughter. Marcus did not want to make a show of running after her, especially in view of the men who were drinking and swapping stories around the fire. Marcus bid everyone good night and returned alone to the house. Having slept most of the day, he was not ready for his bed. He sat by the fire, brooding over Evelina, Ven, Draconis, the dragon, his father, everything he'd refused to let himself think about all day. He made up his mind to the fact that he would never see Ven again, nor could he even dare contact him, for the dragon was always lurking about, trying to find a way inside. Draconis was dead. Marcus was certain of that. Dragon Keep would remain hidden beneath its blanket of illusion as its army marched on to conquer his people. Yet, if I told these fishermen that there is a city of living souls not twenty miles from where they ply their nets, they would bind my arms with rope and take away all sharp objects, Marcus muttered. I'm not even sure my own father will believe me. It's all so fantastic. A gentle knock sounded at the door. It's Evelina, said her voice, speaking softly. Marcus breathed a sigh. He didn't want to have this conversation, but he needed to set things straight. Let her down gently. He opened the door. No one saw me, she assured him, slipping in past him. She wore a cloak with the hood cast over her head, and she carried a basket on her arm. Placing the basket on the table, she removed her cloak and hood and tossed them aside. You should close the door, Marcus. Someone will see the light. He hadn't realized until she said something that he'd been standing there with the door wide open. Feeling uncomfortable, he did as she bade him and shut the door. He turned back to find her removing a stone jar and a mug from the basket. I brought you some wine, she said. Evelina, I want to talk, and I want to talk to you, your highness, she said. She poured wine into the mug and carried it over to him. She stood before him, holding the wine in her hands. She had washed her hair. Its blonde curls fell around her shoulders. Her eyes were soft and warm in the flickering light. I'm sorry I was so familiar with you last night, your highness, she said. I realize that I behaved unseemly, and I ask you to forgive me. I know that you were under a terrible strain when you said all those wonderful words to me, when we were running for our lives from that dreadful place, and that you really didn't mean them. How could you love me? I'm nobody, not a princess or a duke's daughter. Evelina, he began, feeling wretched. It's not... Please, drink the wine, your highness, she continued, holding it out to him. Tears glimmered on her lashes. The patriarch's daughter made this wine, and she would be offended if you did not. I promised her I would tell her how you liked it. You can lie if you want. After all, you are a prince, and you can do with people what you like. Evelina, he tried a third time. She thrust the wine into his hands and then ran to a corner of the room and sobbed as though her heart would break. Marcus gulped some wine. He was completely out of his depth, floundering in water that had been ankle deep when he waded in, but which was now up to his chin and rising. Evelina had said the very words to him that he'd been going to say to her, about how it had all been different when they were in Dragon Keep and he'd been under a strain, and so on and so forth. When he'd said it, it seemed reasonable and logical. When she said it, she made him feel like a worm. He didn't know what to do now. Anything he said now would only make matters worse. Yet he couldn't leave her weeping in a corner. He drank more wine. It had a peculiar taste to it, 
not at all like the wine to which he was accustomed. And it was far more potent. The warmth spread from his throat to his belly and his limbs, sweet and pleasant and relaxing. He drank more wine, and then lowered the half-empty mug to the table and walked over to Evelina. The water was no longer closing over his head. He was floating on top of it. He had wronged her. He would apologize. She had been brave and loyal. Evelina, he said for the fourth time, and she turned around and looked up at him with her blue, shimmering eyes. He floated on top of those eyes, floated gently along like thistledown. I meant every word, he gasped. I love you. I adore you. The warmth of the wine suffused him. He ached and throbbed with it, and he could find relief only by drowning in the blue water of the river of her eyes. She was in his arms, her soft flesh in his hands, and her sweetness on his tongue, and he was tearing off his clothes and her clothes, and they were lying on the mattress, panting and heaving, and his need was hot and pain-filled, and she was willing and yielding. And then he had to stop to scratch his leg. He went back to her, but then his arm itched uncontrollably, and he scratched at it, and then suddenly he was itchy all over. He tried to ignore the itching, but he couldn't, and he had to stop what he was about to do to scratch at himself. Evelina moaned and nuzzled him, running her hands over his body, and he tried again, but the itching was a terrible distraction. She opened her eyes and looked at him, and suddenly pulled away. You, you've gone all blotchy, she gasped in dismay. He scratched at his head and neck, and looked down at his naked body, and saw that she spoke truly. He was covered in large red blotches, about the size of a coin of the realm, growing larger and spreading rapidly. The blotches burned like fire, and itched like the devil, and he could do nothing now but scratch at them. He could swear he could feel them on the inside of his mouth. It's not the plague, is it? Evelina cried. Covering herself with a blanket, she crawled off the bed. Marcus groaned. No, I think it must have been the wine. I break out in these blotches sometimes if I eat certain spices or herbs, but it's never happened with wine. Spices, murmured Evelina. Oh, my God, you wretched man, you stupid, wretched man. Why can't you be normal? Suddenly, strangely, Evelina turned into a dragon. The dragon's eyes stared into his. The dragon seemed nervous, afraid. I don't know how to talk to you. The dragon's colors were tenuous and wispy. I, this is so alien. Your mind is too small. I feel squeezed in. Human, can you hear me? I am a friend of Draconus. My name is Lycera. He sent me. And then all the colors in Marcus's mind exploded. Evelina scrambled backward off the mattress and crouched on the floor, staring in horror at the prince. Marcus lay on his back. His eyes, gleaming wild in the firelight, rolled and roved as if he were following the erratic flight of an invisible flock of birds. His eyes darted back and forth, up and down, back and forth. His body began to twitch. His hands curled. She'd seen the effects of wormwood on people before, and she'd never seen anything like this. He's having some sort of fit, Evelina wailed. First blotches, then fits. Why can't you be normal? She shook him by the shoulder and dug her nails into his flesh. No response. He was gasping, as though he was finding it difficult to breathe, and watching the invisible birds not paying any attention to her, not getting her with child. You're a freak, Evelina cried, as bad as your brother, even if you don't have the legs of a lizard. 
she punched him a couple of times, and then sat back on her heels and stared at him. She didn't know what to do. He was growing worse. He began to thrash about. Men died of fits like this. And if he died, what would become of her? I should get help. Evelina feverishly threw on some clothes, and flinging open the door, she ran out into the night, straight into the arms of George. I heard a cry, he said, and his voice was calm, and his arms were strong and comforting. Quivering, Evelina pressed against him. The prince, she gasped. He's, there's something wrong. He's having a fit. The wine. I have to find the patriarch. No, you do not, said George. You found me. Come back in sight. Keep quiet. You don't understand. He might die. Evelina struggled to free herself. You are the one who doesn't understand, said George coolly, his grip on her firm. If his highness dies, they'll discover that you put the wormwood in his wine. Evelina went cold all over. Poison? They'll think I poisoned him. They'll hang me. She felt faint. George put his arm around her and half carried her back into the house. Shutting the door, he bolted it. Maybe someone else saw me go to the widow's, she whimpered. Only me, he said, reassuring. She looked over at Marcus. Oh, holy mother of God. Evelina whispered, shrinking back against the wall. He's dead. Marcus's head lolled on the pillow. His arms hung over the sides of the mattress, hands dangling limply. George knelt swiftly beside the prince and felt for a pulse. He put his head close to Marcus's open mouth. He examined the blotches on his body and then looked at Evelina and smiled. What? she asked shivering so that her teeth chattered. She could already feel the noose closing around her neck. He is not dead, said George. He is breathing easily. His pulse is strong. The blotches are already starting to fade. They will probably be gone by morning. He is asleep. Evelina heaved a shuddering sigh and closed her eyes. Thank you, God, she breathed. Thank you. He's very deep in sleep, George added. I doubt if a cannon shot would waken him. Evelina opened her eyes. She heard Huspeth's words, You must lie with him this night. With him, with some man. Evelina was suddenly all business. How much will he remember when he wakes up? Very little, I should think, George said, shrugging. He moved near her, put his hands around her waist, and jerked her close to him so that her breasts pressed against his chest. Or, let's say, he'll remember what you tell him to remember. He sat down in the chair. Hiking up her skirt, he pulled her onto his lap and ran his hands up her bare thighs. Evelina's mouth closed over his, and she moaned as his tongue flicked against hers. Relaxing, her worries over, she gave herself to pleasure. Pleasure with a normal man, not a freak. This was all working out for the best. At least now, a freak wouldn't be the father of her child. Marcus would only think he was the father. 22. The abbey was dark at this hour of the night, the deepest hour, the end of one day and the start of the next. At first, when Ven entered, he could not see Grald, not even with his dragon vision. He knew Grald was here. He could hear the man's heavy breathing, but he could not locate him. Ven was not about to call out to him, like a lost child afraid of the dark, 
He assumed Grald was hiding deliberately to try to intimidate him, then followed the sounds of the breathing and came to the throne-like chair that Grald used for his audiences. The chair was empty. The sounds of the breathing came from the back, behind the chair. Light flared suddenly, a torch ignited. Ven was momentarily blinded, and he squinted into the brilliance. The dragon crouched outside the cavern of his mind, and for once, Grald was not trying to scrabble or claw his way inside. I understand that you paid a visit to your siblings, his father said. Grald was a monstrous mound of flesh and shadow in the torchlight, a grotesque figure. Splendid, aren't they? Like you, my son. You are the oldest, you know, Grald continued, the eyes beneath the overhanging brow consumed in shadow. Not even a glint or gleam was visible. There were others before you, but you were the first to survive. Finally, I came upon the right combination. This might surprise you, but I'd never used a woman like your mother in our previous breeding trials. I deemed such human females, who were strong in the dragon magic, too valuable. They protected Seth from invasion, and here in Dragon Keep, they help maintain the illusion that hides this city and bear those children who have grown up to become my soldiers. You saw the army as well, I think. Draconis was most thorough. Ven remained silent. No need to speak when all his questions were being answered. Draconis was the one who gave Anora the idea. Ironic, isn't it? I decided to experiment on Melisande, and you were the result, turning out far better than my expectations. I decided to see if I could emulate my success, and I mated with several females who were strong in the magic, one child out of that first group of ten survived to adulthood. Your sister, Sorrow. The next year, several more survived, as the Holy Sisters learned how to care for the infants. They are magnificent, aren't they? Your brothers and sisters? For monsters, Ven returned. He hadn't meant to say that. The words slipped out before he was aware of them. He was ashamed the moment he'd spoken. He didn't want to feel that way. He didn't want to hate them as he hated himself. Grawl took a step nearer, moving into the light, so that his eyes seemed to kindle and catch fire. Ven didn't like anyone coming that close to him, and he almost took a step backward. He then realized that this would look like weakness, and he held his ground. Grawl's mouth twisted. He glowered down at Ven. I raised your siblings to be proud of who and what they are. They are the future of mankind, the future of dragonkind. How can they be the future of both when they are neither? Ven asked, and neither dragons nor men will have anything to do with them. He couldn't understand why he was saying such things. He had not come here intending to insult his father. He'd come here to talk to him. The reason was growled. Something about the man made Ven nervous. Perhaps it was the way the dragon lay so still outside Ven's cave, no longer trying to force his way in, almost as if he knew it was just a matter of time. You should know the answer to that, growled stated. You are stronger, smarter than any human born. What's more, you have the ability to live in the human world and in the dragon world. You can communicate mind to mind, a feat no human can perform. You have the ability to wield the dragon magic. No, I don't, said Ven perversely. You do, Grald reiterated. The eyes in the shadow of the brow were laughing at him. Grald was baiting him, and that further irritated Ven. You choose not to, but that will change. I don't see how we are going to be the future of dragonkind, Ven said, ignoring the lure. Dragons must be as repulsed by us half-dragons as humans, maybe more. 
Some are, Grawled admitted. But they will come to see the logic behind your creation. By ruling humans, you will ensure that our future is safe and secure. Because of you and those like you, ordinary humans will come to worship us, hold us in reverence and awe. They will abandon the god of their imagination, a god they cannot see, and turn to dragons. Your kind will be the true rulers, then, not us. Grald made a dismissive gesture. Only in the larger matters. We dragons care nothing for the day-to-day -day life of these worms. We might go for years without intervening. So long as the humans remain harmless, and you and your kind, we'll see to that. I see. Your plan to conquer humans starts with my brother's kingdom. And you will lead the army against him, said Grald. I will? Ven was incredulous. He gave a dismissive laugh. I want no part of this part. I know, said Grald, and he sighed deeply, his voice laden with sorrow and regret. I know. Draconis did you no favors by hiding you from me, continued. He should have let me raise you, as I raised the others, to be proud of what you are. If he had, then I might not have been forced to... Growled raised his heavy shoulders and let them drop. I could have trusted you, but your mind is tainted. You have turned against me. You have turned against your own family. Ven's unease was growing. He was alone with a dragon, who even in human form was a formidable opponent. There are none to help you, Ven, said Grald quietly, reading his son's thoughts. Not Draconis, who has his own problems. Not your precious magic-wielding brother. Ven, short for vengeance. Yes, I know. I have known for a long time. You should have killed me before now. You might have been able to do it, taken me by surprise, caught me unawares. Fear held you back, fear that is inherent in the human part of you. If I had raised you, you would not know fear. As it is, I will have to work hard to eradicate that weak part of you when... Growled paused. When, what? Ven was having trouble breathing. His chest was tight, his mouth dry, his throat constricting. Growled was right. Fear's poison coursed through Ven's veins, debilitating, weakening. Look behind me, said Growled. See through the illusion. Others cannot, but your eyes can penetrate the magical veil, can't they, dragon son? just like they penetrated the wall so that you could help your brother escape. There will be no such escape for you. Ven saw a tomb. He had no need for the dragon to tell him whose tomb it was. Vague and horrifying memories came to him, memories of Bologna telling him about his mother, and a tomb, and a bleeding body sealed inside darkness, and agony for years on end. Ven bolted. His dragon legs were strong. He could easily outrun Grald. Ven made a dash for it, digging the clawed toes into the floor and leaping off them, the powerful thigh muscles propelling him across the vast hall toward the door. He could outrun the lumbering human, but he could not outrun the dragon. Grald had begun to shed his human body even as he shifted Ven's attention away from him and to the tomb. Short human arms, with their soft and flabby flesh and grasping stubby fingers, began to elongate and grow strong and powerful. Scales ran over the flesh like gleaming quicksilver, hardening and protecting. Sharp claws replaced puny nails. The dragon's clawed hand reached out and caught hold of Ven's foot and tripped him up, sent him crashing heavily onto his stomach. Confident he was free, Ven had not expected to be grabbed from behind. 
and the shock when he felt himself yanked off his feet was paralyzing. He had no time to break his fall, and he slammed into the floor hard. The impact knocked the breath from his body. His chin hit the floor with brain-jarring force that drove his lower jaw into his upper. His mouth filled with blood, either from biting his tongue or from teeth knocked loose or both. His head throbbed with pain, and there was a buzzing in his ears. His vision blurred. Tears sprang to his eyes. Dazed, Ven tried to scramble to his feet, only to be slammed down once more. The dragon held his prey pinned to the floor, pressing him to the stone, as Grald continued to undergo his transformation, crawling and squirming his way out of the human body like a maggot crawling out of diseased flesh. The emergence from the human form required time, but Grald had time. As he had told Ven, no one could hear him. No one could help him. Except his magic-wielding brother. And he was far away. Twenty-three. Evelina clung to her lover. She had never known pleasure like this, and even as they relaxed after their lovemaking, she kissed his neck and bit at his earlobe, when a shout cracked like thunder over them both. Marcus stood naked by the side of the bed. His torso and arms were still covered with fading red blotches. His eyes were wide and wild, his face pale and blotchy, and terrible. He stared straight at Evelina and her lover. George shoved Evelina off him and leapt to his feet in the same motion, dumping her onto the floor. He grabbed at his trousers, which were down around his thighs. Yanking them up, he hastily began to stuff himself and his shirt back into them. Fight, Marcus cried, his fists clenched. You have to fight. I'll not fight you, your highness, George gasped. Oh, sweet blessed saints, you're a prince. I'll be drawn and quartered and my head hung up on spikes. Turning to flee, George tripped over Evelina, who was huddled on her hands and knees, trying frantically to figure some way out of this disaster. George pitched headlong over her and landed on the floor. Rolling onto his back, he began to crawl, crabwise, toward the door. Marcus advanced on him. Fight, Ven! Stand and fight him! The magic! Use the magic! Evelina's head jerked up. She stared intently at Marcus. I'll not fight you, your highness, George babbled. He was sweating and shivering and crawling for all he was worth. Ven, Evelina murmured, what is he talking about? Ven's not here, unless... She scrambled to her feet. Running over to George, she pulled him up and shoved him bodily toward the door. Get out! she cried. Get out! Hurry up! George didn't need telling. He flung open the door and bolted out, holding his unlaced breeches up with one hand as he dashed into the night. Evelina slammed shut the door and put her back to it and faced Marcus, who was staring straight at her and, apparently, not seeing her. Evelina waved her hand in front of his face. His eyes darted back and forth, and his breath came short and fast, as though watching some harrowing contest. Fight, he cried again. Then he suddenly clutched at his head and reeled backward, staggering halfway across the room. I was right. He's possessed. He's fighting a 
demon, Evelina breathed. Evelina knew something about demons. She'd been in a tavern once, when one of her father's companions had been seized by a demon. The man had fallen to the floor, writhing and twitching and foaming at the mouth. Someone had wanted to call a priest, but his woman said that wasn't necessary. Her man fought with demons on a regular basis, and he always came out the winner. She told all his friends to pin him down, and she gave him a stick to bite on so that he wouldn't choke to death. He wrestled with the demon for a short time. Then, victorious, he fell asleep. When he came back to consciousness, and this Evelina remembered quite clearly, he had no recollection of anything that had happened. Marcus gave another cry and made a swipe and a lunge at the air, as though he were holding a sword, though his hand was empty. Evelina watched for her chance, and when he moved near the mattress, she rushed at him and struck him hard in the chest, knocking him down. Evelina pounced, straddling him and holding his arms. He did not resist her, but lay there, staring up at whatever it was he was seeing, which wasn't her. His face contorted, his hands twitched, and he gasped or cried out. Fearing someone would hear him yelling like a madman and interfere, she stuffed a rag into his mouth to stifle his shouts, and she swaddled his arms against his sides with the blanket. Now it was up to Marcus. Either he won or the demon did. At this point, Evelina was almost too exhausted to care which. She left Marcus to his fight and went back to pour herself a cup of the strong red wine. She gulped it down, and poured out another cup, drank half of it, then carried it to the bed, and splashed a bit of wine onto the mattress. She examined the red stain, and was pleased. It resembled blood, if one didn't look too closely. Evelina finished the rest of the wine, then stripped off all her clothes, and lay down beside Marcus. He stirred, and gave a muffled cry. His arms bulged against the bindings. His body twisted and heaved. Freak, Evelina muttered, shoving him over to make room for herself. Just like his monster of a brother. I'm glad Marcus isn't going to be the father of my child. He'll just think he is. And he will marry me. Oh, yes, he will. I deserve nothing less after all I've put up with. Closing her eyes, she gave a contented belch and let the wine fumes carry her pleasantly into slumber. Beside her, on the bed, Marcus fought the dragon.